Section one of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Lives of the Queens of England, Volume six by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Elizabeth, Second Queen Regnant of England and Ireland chapter one part one we now come to the most distinguished name in the annals of female royalty that of the great elizabeth second queen regnant of england the romantic circumstances of her birth the vicissitudes of her childhood and the lofty spirit with which she bore herself amidst the storms and perils that darkened over her during her sister's reign invested her with almost poetic interest as a royal heroine before her title to the regal succession was ratified by the voice of a generous people and the brilliant success of her government during a long reign surrounded her maiden diadem with a blaze of glory which has rendered her the most popular of our monarchs and blinded succeeding generations to her faults it is not perhaps the most gracious office in the world to perform with strict impartiality the duty of a faithful biographer to a princess so endeared to national pride as elizabeth and to examine by the cold calm light of truth the flaws which mar the bright ideal of spencer's gloriana and shakespeare's fair vestal throne by the west like the wise and popular augustus caesar elizabeth understood the importance of acquiring the good will of that class whose friendship or enmity goes far to decide the fortunes of princes the might of her throne was supported by the pens of the master spirits of the age very different might have been the records of her reign if the reasoning powers of bacon the eloquence of sidney the poetic talents of spencer the wit of harrington and the genius of shakespeare had been arrayed against her instead of combining to represent her as the impersonification of all earthly perfection scarcely indeed short of divinity it has truly been said however that no man is a hero to his valet de chambre and it is impossible to enter into the personal history of england's elizabeth without showing that she occasionally forgot the dignity of the heroine among her ladies-in-waiting and indulged in follies which the youngest of her maids of honour would have blushed to imitate the web of her life was a glittering tissue in which good and evil were strangely mingled and as the evidences of friend and foe are woven together without reference to the prejudices of either or any object than to show her as she was the lights and shades must sometimes appear in strong and even painful opposition to each other for such are the inconsistencies of human nature such the littlenesses of human greatness queen elizabeth first saw the light at greenwich palace the favorite abode of her royal parents henry the eighth and anne boleyn her birth was thus quaintly but prettily recorded by the contemporary historian hall on the seventh day of september being sunday between three and four o'clock in the afternoon the queen was delivered of a fair lady on which day the duke of norfolk came home to the christening the apartment in which she was born was hung with tapestry representing the history of holy virgins and was from that circumstance called the chamber of the virgins when the queen her mother who had eagerly anticipated a son was told that she had given birth to a daughter she endeavored with ready tact to attach adventitious importance to her infant by saying to the ladies in attendance they may now with reason call this room the chamber of virgins for a virgin is now born in it on the vigil of that auspicious day on which the church commemorates the nativity of the virgin mary haywood though a zealous eulogist of the protestant principles of elizabeth intimates that she was under the especial patronage of the blessed virgin from the hour of her birth and for that cause devoted to a maiden life the lady elizabeth says he was born on the eve of the virgin's nativity and died on the eve of the virgin's annunciation even that she is now in heaven with all those blessed virgins that had oil in their lamps notwithstanding the bitter disappointment felt by king henry at the sex of the infant a solemn te deum was sung in honor of her birth 
and the preparations for her christening were made with no less magnificence than if his hopes had been gratified by the birth of a male heir to the crown the solemnization of that sacred rite was appointed to take place on wednesday the tenth of september the fourth day after the birth of the infant princess on that day the lord mayor with the aldermen and the council of the city of london dined together at one o'clock and then in obedience to their summons took boat in their chains and robes and rode to greenwich where many lords knights and gentlemen were assembled to witness the royal ceremonial all the walls between greenwich palace and the convent of the grey friars were hung with arras and the way strewn with green rushes the church was likewise hung with arras gentlemen with aprons and towels about their necks guarded the font which stood in the middle of the church it was of silver and raised to the height of three steps and over it was a square canopy of crimson satin fringed with gold about it a space railed in covered with red say between the choir and the chancel a closet with a fire had been prepared lest the infant should take cold in being disrobed for the font when all these things were ready the child was brought into the hall of the palace and the procession set out to the neighboring church of the grey friars of which building no vestige now remains at greenwich the procession began with the lowest ranks the citizens two and two led the way then gentlemen esquires and chaplains a gradation of precedence rather decidedly marked of the three first ranks whose distinction is by no means definite in the present times after them the aldermen and the lord mayor by himself then the privy council in robes then the peers and prelates followed by the earl of essex who bore the gilt-covered basins then the marquis of exeter with the taper of virgin wax next the marquis of dorset bearing the salt and the lady mary of norfolk the betrothed of the young duke of richmond carrying the chrism which was very rich with pearls and gems lastly came the royal infant in the arms of her great-grandmother the dowager duchess of norfolk under a stately canopy which was supported by the uncle of the babe george boleyn lord rockford the lords william and thomas howard the maternal kindred of the mother and lord hussey a newly made lord of the boleyn blood the babe was wrapped in a mantle of purple velvet with a train of regal length furred with ermine which was duly supported by the countess of kent assisted by the earl of wiltshire the grandfather of the little princess and the earl of derby on the right of the infant marched its great uncle the duke of norfolk with his martial staff on the other the duke of suffolk the bishop of london who performed the ceremony received the infant at the church door of the grey friars assisted by a great company of bishops and mitred abbots and with all the rites of the church of rome this future great protestant queen received the name of her grandmother elizabeth of york cranmer archbishop of canterbury was her godfather and the duchess of norfolk and marchioness of dorset her godmothers after elizabeth had received her name garter king at arms cried aloud god of his infinite goodness send a prosperous life and long to the high and mighty princess of england elizabeth then a flourish of trumpets sounded and the royal child was borne to the altar the gospel was read over her and she was confirmed by cramner who with the other sponsors presented the christening gifts he gave her a standing cup of gold the duchess of norfolk a cup of gold fretted with pearls being completely unconscious of the chemical antipathy between the acidity of wine and the misplaced pearls the marchioness of dorset gave three gilt bowls pounced with a cover and the marchioness of exeter three standing bowls graven and gilt with covers then were brought in wafers confits and hippocras in such abundance that the company had as much as could be desired the homeward procession was lighted on its way to the palace with five hundred staff torches which were carried by the yeomen of the guard and the king's servants but the infant herself was surrounded by gentlemen bearing wax flambeaux the procession returned in the same order that it went out save that four noble gentlemen carried the sponsor's gifts before the child with trumpets flourishing all the way preceding them till they came to the door of the queen's chamber the king commanded the duke of norfolk to thank the lord mayor and citizens heartily in his name for their attendance 
and after they had powerfully refreshed themselves in the royal cellar, they betook themselves to their barges. The queen was desirous of nourishing her infant daughter from her own bosom, but Henry, with his characteristic selfishness, forbade it, lest the frequent presence of the little princess in the chamber of her royal mother should be attended with inconvenience to himself. He appointed for Elizabeth's nurse the wife of a gentleman named Hocart, whom he afterwards ennobled, and he invested the Duchess Dowager of Norfolk with the office of state governess to the newborn babe, giving her for a residence the fair mansion and all the rich furniture which he had bestowed on Anne Boleyn when he created her Marchioness of Pembroke with a salary of six thousand crowns. The Lady Margaret Bryan, whose husband, Sir Thomas Bryan, was a kinsman of Queen Anne Boleyn, was preferred to the office of governess in ordinary to Elizabeth, as she had formerly been to the Princess Mary. She was called the Lady Mistress. Elizabeth passed the first two months of her life at Greenwich Palace, with the Queen her mother, and during that period, she was frequently taken for an airing to Eltham, for the benefit of her health. On the 2nd of December, she was the subject of the following order in council. The King's Highness hath appointed that the Lady Princess Elizabeth, almost three months old, shall be taken from hence towards Hatfield upon Wednesday next week, that on Wednesday night she is to lie and repose at the house of the Earl of Rutland at Enfield, and the next day to be conveyed to Hatfield, and there to remain with such household as the King's Highness has established for the same. Hertford Castle was first named, but scratched through and changed to Hatfield. A few weeks afterwards she became, in virtue of the Act of Parliament, which settled the succession, in default of heirs male to Henry the Eighth, on the female issue of that monarch by Anne Boleyn, the heiress presumptive to the throne, and her disinherited sister, the Princess Mary, was compelled to yield precedency to her. Soon after this change in the prospects of the unconscious babe, she was removed to the palace of the Bishop of Winchester at Chelsea, on whom the charge of herself and her extensive nursery appointments were thrust. When she was thirteen months old, she was weaned, and the preliminaries for this important business were arranged between the officers of her household and the cabinet ministers of her august sire, with as much solemnity as if the fate of empires had been involved in the matter. The following passages are extracted from a letter from Sir William Pollitt to Cromwell on this subject. The King's Grace, well considering the letter directed to you from my Lady Brian and other my Lady Princess's officers, His Grace, with the assent of the Queen's Grace, hath fully determined the weaning of my Lady Princess to be done with all diligence. He proceeds to state that the little princess is to have the whole of any one of the royal residences thought best for her, and that consequently he has given orders for Langley to be put in order for her and her suite, which orders, he adds, This messenger hath withal a letter from the Queen's Grace to my Lady Brian, and that his grace and the Queen's Grace doth well and be merry, and all theirs, thanks be to God. From Sarum, October ninth. Scarcely was this nursery affair of state accomplished, before Henry exerted his paternal care, in seeking to provide the royal weanling with a suitable consort by entering into a negotiation with Francis I of France, for a union between this infant princess and the Duke of Angoulême, the third son of that monarch. Henry proposed that the young Duke should be educated in England, and stipulated that he should hold the Duchy of Angoulême, independently of the French crown, in the event of his coming to the crown of England, through his marriage with Elizabeth. The project of educating the young French prince, who was selected for the husband of the presumptive heiress of England, according to the manners and customs of the realm, of which she might hereafter become the sovereign, was a sagacious idea, but Henry clogged the matrimonial treaty with conditions, which it was out of the power of the King of France to ratify, and it proved abortive. The tragic events which rendered Elizabeth motherless in her third year, and degraded her from the lofty position in which she had been placed, by the unjust and short-lived paternal fondness of her capricious father, have been fully detailed in the memoir of her unhappy mother, Anne Boleyn. By the sentence which Cramner had passed on the marriage of her parents and her own birth, 
elizabeth was branded with the stigma of illegitimacy and that she was for a time exposed to the sort of neglect and contempt which is too often the lot of children to whom that reproach applies is evidenced by the following letter from lady bryan to cromwell imploring for a supply of necessary raiment for the innocent babe who had been so cruelly involved in her mother's fall my lord after my most bounden duty i recommend me to your good lordship beseeching you to be good lord to me now in the greatest need that ever was for it hath pleased god to take them from me that was my greatest comfort in this world to my great heaviness Yesu, have mercy on my soul and now i am succorless and as a redless or without redress creature but only from the great trust which i have in the king's grace and your good lordship for now in you i put all my whole trust of comfort in this world beseeching you to blank me that i do so my lord when your lordship was last here it pleased you to say that i should not mistrust the king's grace nor your lordship which word was more comfort to me than i can write as god knoweth and now it boldeth or emboldens me to show you my poor mind my lord when my lady mary's grace was born it pleased the king's grace to appoint me lady mistress and made me a baroness and so i have been governess to the children his grace have had since now it is so my lady elizabeth is put from that degree she was afore and what degree she is at of now i know not but by hearsay therefore i know not how to order her nor myself nor none of hers that i have the rule of that as her women and grooms i beseech you to be good lord to my lady and to all hers and that she may have some raiment here stripe has interpolated a query for mourning there is nothing of the kind implied in the original if stripe had consulted any female on the articles enumerated he would have found that few indeed of them indeed were requisite for mourning the list shows the utter destitution the young princess had been suffered to fall into in regard to clothes either by the neglect of her mother or because anne boleyn's power of aiding her child had been circumscribed long before her fall let any lady used to the nursery read over the list of the poor child's wants represented by her faithful governess and consider that a twelvemonth must have elapsed since she had a new supply she continues lady bryan hath neither gown nor kirtle or slip nor petticoat nor no manner of linen nor four smocks or day chemises nor kerchiefs nor rails or night dresses nor body stitchets or corsets nor handkerchiefs nor sleeves nor mufflers or mob caps nor biggins or nightcaps all these her grace must take i have driven off as long as i can that by my troth i can drive it off no longer beseeching you my lord that ye will see that her grace may have that which is needful for her as my trust is that you will do beseeching ye mine own good lord that i may know from you by writing how i shall order myself and what is the king's grace's pleasure and yours and that i shall do in everything and whatsoever it shall please the king's grace or your lordship to command me at all times i shall fulfil it to the best of my power my lord mr shelton a kinsman of anne boleyn said he be master of this house what fashion that may be i cannot tell for i have not seen it afore my lord ye be so honourable yourself and every man reporteth that your lordship loveth honour that i trust you will see the house honourably ordered as it ever hath been aforetime and if it please you that i may know what your order is and if it be not performed i shall certify your lordship of it for i fear me it will be hardly enough performed but if the head evidently shelton knew what your honour meaneth it will be the better ordered if not it will be hard to bring to pass my lord mr shelton would have my lady elizabeth to dine and sup every day at the board of estate alas my lord it is not meet for a child of her age to keep such rule yet i promise you my lord i dare not take it upon me to keep her grace in health and she keep that rule for there she shall see divers meats and fruits and wine which it would be hard for me to restrain her grace from ye know my lord there is no place of correction there 
and she is yet too young to correct greatly. I know well, and she be there, I shall neither bring her up to the king's grace's honour, nor hers, nor to her health, nor to my poor honesty. Wherefore I shall show your lordship this my desire, beseeching you, my lord, that my lady may have a mess of meat at her own lodging, with a good dish or two that is meat, or fit, for her grace to eat of, and the reversion of the mess shall satisfy all her women, a gentleman usher, and a groom, which be eleven persons on her side. Sure am I it will be as great profit to the king's grace this way, namely, to the economy of the arrangement, as the other way. For if all this should be set abroad, they must have three or four messes of meat, whereas this one mess shall suffice them all, with bread and drink, according as my lady Mary's grace had afore, and to be ordered in all things as her grace was afore. God knoweth my lady Elizabeth, hath great pain with her great teeth, and they come very slowly forth, which causeth me to suffer her grace to have her will more than I would. I trust to God and her teeth were well graft, to have her grace after another fashion than she is yet, so as I trust the king's grace shall have great comfort in her grace. For she is as toward a child, and as gentle of conditions, as ever I knew any in my life. Yea, so preserve her grace. As for a day or two, at a high time, meaning a high festival, or whensoever it shall please the king's grace, to have her set abroad, or shown in public, I trust so to endeavor me, that she shall so do as shall be to the king's honor and hers, and then after to take her ease again. That is, notwithstanding, the sufferings of the young Elizabeth with her teeth, if the king wishes to exhibit her for a short time in public. Lady Bryan will answer for her discreet behavior, but after the drilling requisite for such ceremonial, it will be necessary for her to revert to the unconstrained playfulness of childhood. Lady Bryan concludes with this remark. I think Mr. Shelton will not be content with this. He need not know it is my desire, but that it is the king's pleasure and yours that it should be so. Good, my lord, have my lady's grace, and us that be her poor servants, in your remembrance, and your lordship shall have our hearty prayers, by the grace of Yesu, who ever preserve your lordship with long life, and as much honor as your noble heart can desire. From Hunsdon, with the evil hand, or bad writing, of her who is your daily bead-woman, Margaret Bryan. I beseech you, mine own good lord, be not miscontent that I am so bold to write thus to your lordship, but I take God to my judge, I do it of true heart, and for my discharge, beseeching you, accept my good mind, endorse to the right noble and my singular good lord, my lord privy seal, be this delivered. This letter affords some insight into the domestic politics of the nursery palace of Hunsdon at this time. It shows that the infant Elizabeth proved a point of controversy between the two principal officials there, Margaret Lady Bryan and Mr. Shelton, both placed in authority by the recently immolated Queen Anne Boleyn, and both related to her family. Her aunt had married the head of the Shelton or Skelton family in Norfolk, and this officer at Hunsdon was probably a son of that lady, and consequently a near kinsman of the infant Elizabeth. He insisted that she should dine and sup at a state table where her infant importunity for wine, fruit, and high-seasoned food could not conveniently be restrained by her sensible governess, Lady Bryan. Shelton probably wished to keep regal state as long as possible round the descendant of the Boleyns, and, in that time of sudden change in royal destinies, had perhaps an eye to ingratiate himself with the infant, by appearing in her company twice every day, and indulging her by the gratification of her palate with mischievous dainties. Lady Bryan was likewise connected with the Boleyn family, not so near as the Sheltons, but near enough to possess interest with Queen Anne Boleyn, to whom she owed her office as governess or lady mistress, to the infant Elizabeth there can scarcely exist a doubt that her lamentations and invocation for the soul of the same person lately departed by whose death she was left succourless refer to the recent death of anne boleyn it is evident that if lady bryan had not conformed to king henry's version of the catholic religion she would not have been in authority at hunsdon where she was abiding not only with her immediate charge the princess elizabeth 
but with the disinherited princess mary further there may be observed a striking harmony between the expressions of this lady and those of the princess mary who appealed to her father's paternal feelings in behalf of her sister the infant elizabeth a few weeks later almost in the same words used by lady bryan in this letter a coincidence which proves unity of purpose between the governess and the princess mary regarding the motherless child much of the future greatness of elizabeth may reasonably be attributed to the judicious training of her sensible and conscientious governess combined with the salutary adversity which deprived her of the pernicious pomp and luxury that had surrounded her cradle while she was treated as the heiress of england the first public action of elizabeth's life was her carrying the chrism of her infant brother edward the sixth at the christening solemnity of that prince she was born in the arms of the earl of hertford brother of the queen her stepmother when the assistants in the ceremonial approached the font but when they left the chapel the train of her little grace just four years old was supported by lady herbert the sister of catherine parr as led by the hand of her elder sister the princess mary she walked with mimic dignity in the returning procession to the chamber of the dying queen at that period the royal ceremonials of henry the eighth's court were blended with circumstances of wonder and tragic excitement and strange and passing sad it must have been to see the child of the murdered queen anne boleyn framing her innocent lips to lisp the name of mother to her for whose sake she had been rendered motherless and branded with the stigma of illegitimacy in all probability the little elizabeth knelt to her as well as to her cruel father to claim a benediction in her turn after the royal pair had proudly bestowed their blessing on the newly baptized prince whose christening was so soon to be followed by the funeral of the queen his mother it was deemed an especial mark of the favor of her royal father that elizabeth was considered worthy of the honor of being admitted to keep company with the young prince her brother she was four years older than he and having been well trained and gently nurtured herself was better able says haywood to teach and direct him even from the first of his speech and understanding cordial and entire was the affection betwixt this brother and sister insomuch that he no sooner began to know her but he seemed to acknowledge her and she being of more maturity as deeply loved him on the second anniversary of edward's birth when the nobles of england presented gifts of silver and gold and jewels to the infant heir of the realm the lady elizabeth's grace gave the simple offering of a shirt of cambric worked by her own hands she was then six years old thus early was this illustrious lady instructed in the feminine accomplishment of needlework and directed to turn her labors in that way to a pleasing account from her cradle elizabeth was a child of the fairest promise and possessed the art of attracting the regard of others Rodesley, who visited the two princesses when they were together at hertford castle december seventeenth fifteen thirty nine was greatly impressed with the precocious understanding of the young elizabeth of whom he gives the pretty account i went then to my lady elizabeth's grace and to the same made his majesty's most hearty commendations declaring that his highness desired to hear of her health and sent his blessing she gave humble thanks inquiring after his majesty's welfare and that with as great a gravity as she had been forty years old if she be no worse educated than she now appeareth to me she will prove of no less honor than beseemeth her father's daughter whom the lord long preserve the feelings of jealous dislike which the princess mary naturally felt towards her infant rival were gradually subdued by the endearing caresses of the innocent child when they became sisters in adversity when mary again incurred the displeasure of her capricious sire and was forbidden to come within a certain distance of the court elizabeth became once more the associate of her little brother's sports and afterwards shared his studies the early predilection of these royal children for their learning was remarkable as soon as it was light they called for their books so welcome says haywood were their ore matunite that they seemed to prevent the nice repose for the entertainment of the morrow's schooling they took no less delight in the practice of their religious exercises and the study of the scriptures to which their first hours were exclusively devoted 
the rest of the forenoon continues our author breakfast alone excepted they were instructed in languages and science or moral learning collected out of such authors as did best conduce to the instruction of princes and when he was called out to his more active exercises in the open air she betook herself to her lute or viol and when wearied with that employed her time in needlework on the marriage of the king her father with anne of cleves in fifteen forty the young elizabeth expressed the most ardent desire to see the new queen and to be permitted to pay her the homage of a daughter when her governess made this request in the name of her royal pupil to the king he is said to have replied that she had had a mother so different from the queen that she ought not to wish to see her but she had his permission to write to her majesty on which the following letter probably the first ever written by elizabeth was addressed by her to her new stepmother madam i am struggling between two contending wishes one is my impatient desire to see your majesty the other that of rendering the obedience i owe to the commands of the king my father which prevent me from leaving my house till he has given me full permission to do so but i hope that i shall be able shortly to gratify both these desires in the meantime i entreat your majesty to permit me to show by this billet the zeal with which i devote my respect to you as my queen and my entire obedience to you as my mother i am too young and feeble to have power to do more than to felicitate you with all my heart in this commencement of your marriage i hope that your majesty will have as much good will for me as i have zeal for your service this letter is without date or signature and letty who rarely gives his authorities does not explain the source whence it was derived but there is no reason to dispute its authenticity he tells us that anne of cleves when she saw elizabeth was charmed with her beauty wit and endearing caresses that she conceived the most tender affection for her and when the conditions of her divorce were arranged she requested as a great favor that she might be permitted to see her sometimes adding that to have had that young princess for her daughter would have been greater happiness to her than being queen the paternal pride of henry was gratified at this avowal and he agreed that she should see elizabeth as often as she wished provided that she was only addressed by her as the lady anne of cleves elizabeth found no less favor in the eyes of her new stepmother the young and beautiful catherine howard who being cousin german of her unhappy mother anne boleyn took the young princess under her especial protection and treated her with every mark of tenderness and consideration on the day that she was publicly acknowledged by henry as his queen she directed that the princess elizabeth should be placed opposite to her at table because she was of her own blood and lineage it was also observed that at all the feats and public shows which took place in the honor of her marriage with the king queen catherine gave the lady elizabeth the place of honor nearest to her own person saying that she was her cousin it was supposed that this partial stepmother intended to use her powerful influence with the king for the repeal of the act of parliament which had pronounced elizabeth to be illegitimate and thus she would have been given a second time the preference to her elder sister in the succession notwithstanding the favor which was shown to elizabeth by the howard queen she was always entreating the king her father to allow her to remain with the lady anne of cleves for whom she ever manifested a very sincere regard the attachments formed by elizabeth in childhood and early youth were of an ardent and enduring character as will be hereafter shown after the disgrace and death of queen catherine howard elizabeth resided chiefly with her sister mary at havering bower in the summer of fifteen forty three she was present when mary gave audience to the imperial ambassadors she was then ten years old soon after king henry offered her hand to the earl of arran for his son in order to win his co-operation in his darling project of uniting the crowns of england and scotland by a marriage between the infant queen mary stuart and his son prince edward perhaps the scottish earl did not give henry credit for the sincerity of a proposal so derogatory to the dignity of the princess elizabeth for he paid little attention to this extraordinary offer and espoused the interest of the french court according to marillac 
henry had previously mentioned his intention of espousing elizabeth to the infant of portugal but all henry's matrimonial schemes for his children were doomed to remain unfulfilled and elizabeth instead of being sacrificed in her childhood in some political marriage had the good fortune to complete a most superior education under the auspices of the good and learned catherine parr henry's sixth queen and her fourth stepmother catherine parr was well acquainted with elizabeth before she became queen and greatly admired her wit and manners on her marriage with the king she induced him to send for the young princess to court and to give her an apartment in the palace of whitehall contiguous to her own and bestowed particular attention on all her comforts according to letty elizabeth expressed her acknowledgments in the following letter madam the affection that you have testified in wishing that i should be suffered to be with you in the court and requesting this of the king my father with so much earnestness is a proof of your goodness so great a mark of your tenderness for me obliges me to examine myself a little to see if i can find anything in me that can merit it but i can find nothing but a great zeal and devotion to the service of your majesty but as that zeal has not yet been called into action so as to manifest itself i see that it is only the greatness of soul in your majesty which makes you do me this honor and this redoubles my zeal towards your majesty i can assure you also that my conduct will be such that you shall never have cause to complain of having done me the honor of calling me to you at least i will make it my constant care that i do nothing but with a design to show always my obedience and respect i await with much impatience the orders of the king my father for accomplishment of the happiness for which i sigh and i remain with much submission your majesty's very dear elizabeth there is no date to this letter and as elizabeth certainly was present at the nuptials of her royal father with catherine parr it is more probable that it was written after the return of henry and catherine from their bridal progress as she addresses the latter by her regal title elizabeth at that time was a child of extraordinary acquirements to which were added some personal beauty and very graceful manners she had wit at command and sufficient discretion to understand when and where she might display it those who knew her best were accustomed to say of her that god who had endowed her with such rare gifts had certainly destined her to some distinguished employment in the world at the age of twelve she was considerably advanced in sciences which rarely indeed at that era formed part of the education of princesses she understood the principles of geography architecture the mathematics and astronomy and astonished all her instructors by the facility with which she acquired knowledge her handwriting was beautiful and her skill in languages remarkable hensner the german traveller mentions having seen a little volume in the royal library at whitehall written by queen elizabeth when a child in french on vellum it was thus inscribed à très haut et très puissant et redouté prince henri viii de ce nom roi d'angleterre de france et d'irlande défenseur de la foi elisabeth sa très humble fille rend salut et obédience among the royal manuscripts in the british museum is a small volume in an embroidered binding consisting of prayers and meditations selected from different english writers by queen catherine parr and translated and copied by the princess elizabeth in latin french and italian the volume is dedicated to queen catherine parr and her initials r k p are introduced in the binding between those of the savior wrought in blue silk and silver thread by the hand of elizabeth it is dated hertford december twentieth fifteen forty five camden also mentions a godly meditation of the soul concerning love towards christ our lord translated by elizabeth from french her master for the italian language was castiglione like her elder sister the princess mary she was an accomplished latin scholar and astonished some of the most erudite linguists of that age by the ease and grace with which she conversed in that language french italian spanish and flemish she both spoke and wrote with the same facility as her native tongue she was fond of poetry and sometimes made verses that were not devoid of merit 
but she only regarded this as the amusement of her leisure hours, bestowing more of her time and attention on the study of history than anything else. To this early predilection, she probably owed her future greatness as a sovereign. Accomplishments may well be dispensed with in the education of princes, but history is the true science for royal students, and they should early be accustomed to reflect and draw moral and philosophical deductions from the rise and fall of nations, and to trace the causes that have led to the calamities of sovereigns in every age, for neither monarchs nor statesmen can be fitted for the purposes of government, unless they have acquired the faculty of reading the future by the lamp of the past. Elizabeth was indefatigable in her pursuit of this queenly branch of knowledge, to which she devoted three hours a day, and read works in all languages, that afforded information on the subject. It was, however, in this predilection alone, that she betrayed the ambition which formed the leading trait of her character. While thus fitting herself in her childhood for the throne, which as yet she viewed through a vista far remote, she endeavored to conceal her object by the semblance of the most perfect humility, and affecting a love for the leisure and quiet of private life. End of section one. Section two of Lives of the Queens of England, volume six, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter One, Part Two. In the treaty between Henry the Eighth and the Emperor Charles in fifteen forty five, there was a proposal to unite Elizabeth in marriage to Philip of Spain, who afterwards became the consort of her elder sister Mary. The negotiation came to nothing. The name of Elizabeth was hateful to Charles V as the child of Anne Boleyn. During the last illness of the king, her father, Elizabeth chiefly resided at Hatfield House, with the young prince, her brother, whose especial darling she was. It is said she shared the instruction which he there received from his learned preceptors, Sir John Cheek, Dr. Cox, and Sir Anthony Cook. Elizabeth, after her accession to the throne, made Cox, Bishop of Ely, and bestowed great favor on Cook and his learned daughters, Lady Bacon and Lady Burley. They were the companions of her youth, and afterwards the wives of two of her most esteemed ministers of state. The tender love that endeared Edward and Elizabeth to each other, in infancy, appears to have ripened into a sweeter, holier friendship, as their kindred minds expanded. For, says Sir Robert Naughton, Besides the consideration of blood, there was between these two princes a concurrence and sympathy of their natures and affections, together with the celestial bond, conformity in religion, which made them one. In December 1546, when the brother and sister were separated, by the removal of Elizabeth to Enfield and Edward to Hertford, the prince was so much afflicted that she wrote to him entreating him to be comforted and to correspond to her he replied in these tender words the change of place most dear sister does not so much vex me as your departure from me but nothing can now occur to me more grateful than your letters i particularly feel this because you first began the correspondence and challenged me to write to you i thank you most cordially both for your kindness and the quickness of its coming, and I will struggle vigorously that if I cannot excel you, I will at least equal you in regard and attention. It is a comfort to my regret that I hope shortly to see you again if no accident intervene. The next time the royal brother and sister met was on the 30th of January, 1547, when the Earl of Hertford and Sir Anthony Brown brought young Edward privately from Hertford to Enfield, and there, in the presence of the Princess Elizabeth, declared to him and her the death of the king their father. Both of them received the intelligence with passionate tears, and they united in such lamentations as moved all present to weep. Never, says Hayward, was sorrow more sweetly set forth, their faces seeming rather to beautify their sorrow than their sorrow to cloud the beauty of their faces. The boy king was conducted the next day to London, preparatory to his inauguration. 
but neither the grief which he felt for the death of his parent nor the importance of the high vocation to which he had been thus early summoned rendered him forgetful of his sweetest sister as he ever called elizabeth and in reply to the letter of condolence which she addressed to him on the subject of their mutual bereavement he wrote there is very little need of my consoling you most dear sister because from your learning you know what you ought to do and from your prudence and piety you perform what your learning causes you to know in conclusion he compliments her on the elegance of her sentences and adds i perceive you think of our father's death with a calm mind by the conditions of her royal father's will elizabeth was placed the third in the order of the royal succession after himself provided her brother and sister died without lawful issue and neither queen catherine parr nor any future queen bore children to the king in point of fortune she was left on terms of strict equality with her elder sister that is to say with a life annuity of three thousand pounds a year and a marriage portion of ten thousand pounds provided she married with the consent of the king her brother and his council otherwise she was to forfeit that provision more than one historian has asserted that sir thomas seymour made a daring attempt to contract marriage with the youthful princess elizabeth before he renewed his addresses to his old love catherine parr he had probably commenced his addresses to the royal girl before her father's death for her governess catherine ashley positively deposed that it was her opinion that if henry the eighth had lived a little longer she would have been given to him for a wife letty tells us that the admiral offered his hand to elizabeth immediately after king henry's death she was then in her fourteenth year according to sharon turner the ambitious project of the admiral was detected and prevented by the council but letty who by his access to the aylesbury manuscripts appears to have obtained peculiar information on the private history of the reigns of henry the eighth and edward the sixth assures us that the refusal proceeded from elizabeth herself he gives us a truly frenchified version of the correspondence which passed between her and seymour exactly a month after the death of henry the eighth for seymour's letter in which he requests the young princess to consent to ally herself to him in marriage is dated February 26, 1547, and Elizabeth, in her reply, February 27, tells him, that she has neither the years nor the inclination to think of marriage at present, and that she would not have any one imagine that such a subject had ever been mentioned to her, at a time when she ought to be wholly taken up, in weeping for the death of the king, her father, to whom she owed so many obligations and that she intended to devote at least two years to wearing black for him and mourning for his loss and that even when she shall have arrived at years of discretion she wishes to retain her liberty without entering into any matrimonial engagement four days after the admiral received this negative he was the accepted lover of his former fiancee the queen dowager catherine parr elizabeth who had been on the demise of the king her father consigned by the council of the royal minor her brother to the care and tutelage of queen catherine with whom she was then residing was according to our author much displeased at the conduct of that lady not only on account of the precipitation with which she had entered into a matrimonial engagement which was considered derogatory to the honor due to the late king's memory but because she had induced her to reject the addresses of the admiral by representing to her how unsuitable such an alliance would be to her in every point of view now although the queen dowager only performed her duty as the widow of the deceased majesty of england in giving such counsel to the orphan princess to whom she had undertaken the office of a mother her own proceedings by rendering the motives of her advice questionable excited reflections little to her advantage in the mind of elizabeth and perhaps sowed the first seeds of the fatal jealousy which afterwards divided them according to letty the princess mary who was no less offended than elizabeth at the indecorous haste of their royal stepmother's marriage wrote to elizabeth offering her a residence in her house entreating her to quit that of the queen dowager and come to her 
that both might unite in testifying their disapproval of this unsuitable alliance elizabeth however young as she was had too much self-command to commit herself by putting a public affront on the best-loved uncle of the king her brother who was by no means unlikely to supersede somerset in his office of protector neither did she feel disposed to come to a rupture with the queen dowager whose influence with king edward was considerable therefore in reply to her sister she wrote a very political letter telling her that it behooved them both to submit with patience to that which could not be cured as neither of them were in a position to offer any objection to what had taken place without making their condition worse than it was observing that they had to do with a very powerful party without themselves possessing the slightest credit at court so that the only thing they could do was dissemble the pain they felt at the disrespect with which their father's memory had been treated she excuses herself from accepting mary's invitation because she says the queen had shown her so much friendship that she could not withdraw herself from her protection without appearing ungrateful and concludes in these words i shall always pay the greatest deference to the instructions you may give me and submit to whatsoever your highness shall be pleased to ordain the letter is without date or signature for a year at least after the death of her royal father elizabeth continued to pursue her studies under the able superintendence of her accomplished stepmother with whom she resided either at the dower palace at chelsea or the more sequestered shades of hanworth throckmorton the kinsman of queen catherine parr draws the following graceful portrait of the manners of the youthful princess at this era of her life elizabeth there sojourning for a time gave fruitful hope of blossom blown in prime for as this lady was a princess born so she in princely virtues did excel humble she was and no degree would scorn to talk with poorest souls she liked well the sweetest violets bend nearest to the ground the greatest states in loneliness abound if some of us that waited on the queen did aught for her she passed in thankfulness i wondered at her answers which had been so fitly placed in perfect readiness she was disposed to mirth and company yet still regarding civil modesty the princess elizabeth while residing with queen catherine parr had her own ladies and officers of state and a retinue in all respects suitable to her high rank as sister to the reigning sovereign her governess mrs catherine ashley to whom she was fondly attached was married to a relative of the unfortunate queen her mother anne boleyn and it is to be observed that elizabeth although that mother's name was to her a sealed subject bestowed to the very end of her life her chief favor and confidence on her maternal kindred the learned william grindle was elizabeth's tutor till she was placed under the still more distinguished preceptorship of roger ashcombe the following letter from that great scholar was addressed to mrs catherine ashley before he had obtained the tutelage of her royal charge and both on account of the period at which it was written and its being in english is very curious gentle mrs ashley would god my wit wist what words would express the thanks you have deserved of all true english hearts for that noble imp elizabeth of your labor and wisdom now flourishing in all goodly godliness the fruit whereof doth even now redound to her grace's high honor and profit i wish her grace to come to that end in perfectness with likelihood of her wit and painfulness in her study true trade of her teaching which your diligent overseeing doth most constantly promise and although this one thing be sufficient for me to love you yet the knot which hath knit mr ashley and you together doth so bind me also to you that if my ability would match my good will you should find no friend faster he is a man i loved for his virtue before i knew him through acquaintance whose friendship i account among my chief gains gotten at court your favor to mr grindle and gentleness towards me are matters sufficient enough to deserve more good will than my little power is able to requite my good will hath sent you this pen of silver for a token good missus i would have you in any case to labor and not to give yourself to ease 
i wish all increase of virtue and honour to that my good lady elizabeth whose wit good mrs ashley i beseech you somewhat favour blunt edges be dull and endure much pain to little profit the free edge is soon turned if it be not handled thereafter if you pour much drink at once into a goblet the most part will dash out and run over if ye pour it slowly you may fill it even to the top and so her grace i doubt not by little and little may be increased in learning that at length greater cannot be required and if you think not this gentle mrs ashley yet i trust you will take my words as spoken although not of the greatest wisdom yet not of the least good will i pray commend you to my good lady of troy and all that company of godly gentlewomen i send my lady elizabeth her pen an italian book a book of prayers send the silver pen which is broken and it shall be mended quickly i commit and commend you to all the almighty's merciful protection your ever obliged friend roger ashcombe to his very loving friend mrs ashley on the death of his friend william grindle ashcombe was appointed to the lady elizabeth then about sixteen with whom he read nearly the whole of cicero's works livy the orations of Socrates the tragedies of sophocles and the new testament in greek some disturbances in ashcombe's own family separated him from his royal pupil in 1550 sufficient account has been given in the memoir of queen catherine parr of the rude and improper conduct of the lord admiral sir thomas seymour to the fair young royal student while under the care of his consort the queen dowager at chelsea hanworth and seymour place the boisterous romping to which the queen was at first a party was repeated in her absence and when mrs ashley remonstrated with the admiral on the indecorum of his behaviour to the young princess and entreated him to desist he replied with a profane oath that he would not for he meant no harm few girls of fifteen have ever been placed in a situation of greater peril than elizabeth was at this period of her life and if she passed through it without incurring the actual stain of guilt it is certain that she did not escape scandal the queen dowager apparently terrified at the audacious terms of familiarity on which she found her husband endeavouring to establish himself with her royal stepdaughter hastened to prevent further mischief by effecting an immediate separation between them the time of elizabeth's departure from the house and protection of queen catherine parr was a week after whitsuntide 1548 she then removed with her governess mrs catherine ashley and the rest of her establishment to cheston and afterwards to hatfield and ashridge that catherine parr spoke with some degree of severity to elizabeth on the levity of her conduct there can be no doubt from the allusions made by the latter in the following letter to the expressions used by her majesty when they parted nothing however can be more meek and conciliatory than the tone in which elizabeth writes although the workings of a wounded mind are perceptible throughout the penmanship of the letter is exquisitely beautiful the princess elizabeth to catherine parr although i could not be plentiful in giving thanks for the manifold kindnesses received at your highness's hand at my departure yet i am something to be borne withal for truly i was replete with sorrow to depart from your highness especially seeing you undoubtful of health and albeit i answered little i weighed it more deeply when you said you would warn me of all evilnesses that you should hear of me for if your grace had not a good opinion of me you would not have offered friendship to me that way at all meaning the contrary but what may i more say than thank god for providing such friends for me desiring god to enrich me with their long life and me grace to be in heart no less thankful to receive it than i am now made glad in writing to show it and although i have plenty of matter here i will stay for i know you are not quick to recede from cheston this present saturday your highness's humble daughter elizabeth superscribed to the queen's highness from another letter addressed by elizabeth to her royal stepmother which has been printed in the memoir of that queen there is every reason to believe that they continue to write to each other on very friendly and affectionate terms 
Queen Catherine even sanctioned a correspondence between her husband and the princess, and the following elegant but cautious letter was written by Elizabeth in reply to an apology which he had addressed to her for not having been able to render her some little service which he had promised. The Lady Elizabeth to the Lord Admiral My Lord, you need not send an excuse to me, for I could not mistrust the not fulfilling your promise to proceed from want of good will, but only that opportunity serve not. Wherefore I shall desire you to think that a greater matter than this could not make me impute any unkindness in you, for I am a friend, not one with trifles, nor lost with the like. Thus I commit you and your affairs into God's hands, who keep you from all evil. I pray you to make my humble commendations to the Queen's Highness, your assured friend, to my little power, Elizabeth. Catherine Parr, during her last illness, wished much to see Elizabeth, and left her in her will, half her jewels and a rich chain of gold. She had often said to her, God has given you great qualities, cultivate them always, and labor to improve them, for I believe that you are destined by heaven to be Queen of England. One of the admiral's servants, named Edward, came to Cheston, or Chessent, where the Lady Elizabeth was then residing with her governess and train, and brought the news of Queen Catherine's death. He told the officers of Elizabeth's household, that his lord was a heavy, that is to say, a sorrowful man, for the loss of the queen his wife. Elizabeth did not give Seymour much credit for his grief, for when her governess, Mrs. Ashley, advised her, as he had been her friend in the lifetime of the late queen, to write a letter of condolence to comfort him in his sorrow, she replied, I will not do it, for he needs it not. Then, said Mrs. Ashley, if your grace will not, then I will. She did, and showed the letter to her royal pupil, who, without committing herself in any way, tacitly permitted it to be sent. Lady Turwit, soon after, told Mrs. Ashley, that it was the opinion of many that the Lord Admiral kept the late Queen's maidens together to wait on the Lady Elizabeth, whom he intended shortly to marry. Mrs. Ashley also talked with Mr. Turwit about the marriage, who bade her, Take heed, for it were but undoing, if it were done without the council's leave. At Christmas, the report became general that the Lady Elizabeth should marry the Admiral, but Mrs. Ashley sent word to Sir Henry Parker, when he sent his servant to ask her what truth were in this rumor, that he should in no wise credit it, for it was nay thought, nay meant. Mrs. Ashley, however, by her own account, frequently talked with Elizabeth on the subject, wishing that she and the Admiral were married. Elizabeth, who had only completed her fifteenth year, two days after the death of Queen Catherine Parr, had no maternal friend to direct and watch over her. There was not even a married lady of noble birth or alliance in her household, a household comprising upwards of 120 persons, so that she was left entirely to her own discretion. And the counsels of her intriguing governess, Mrs. Catherine Ashley, and the unprincipled cofferer or treasurer of her house, Thomas Perry, in whom, as well as in Mrs. Ashley, she reposed unbounded confidence. These persons were in the interest of the Lord Admiral, and did everything in their power to further his presumptuous designs on their royal mistress. Letty, who from his reference to the Aylesbury manuscripts, has certainly the best information on the subject, gives Elizabeth credit for acting with singular prudence under these circumstances. He tells us that very soon after the death of Queen Catherine, the Lord Admiral presented himself before Elizabeth, clad in all the external panoply of mourning, but having, as she suspected, very little grief in his heart. He came as a wooer to the royal maid, from whom he received no encouragement, but he endeavored to recommend his cause to her through her female attendants. One of her bedchamber women, of the name of Montjoy, took the liberty of speaking openly to her youthful mistress, in favor of a marriage between her and the admiral, enlarging at the same time on his qualifications in such unguarded language, that Elizabeth, after trying in vain to silence her, told her at last, that she would have her thrust out of her presence, if she did not desist. 
there can however be little doubt that a powerful impression was made on elizabeth by the addresses of seymour seconded as they were by the importunity of her governess and all who possessed her confidence the difference of nearly twenty years in their ages was probably compensated by the personal graces which had rendered him the adonis of her father's court and she was accustomed to blush when his name was mentioned and could not conceal her pleasure when she heard him commended in a word he was the first and perhaps the only man whom elizabeth loved and for whom she felt disposed to make a sacrifice she acknowledged that she would have married him provided he could have obtained the consent of the council to have contracted wedlock with him in defiance of that despotic junta by which the sovereign power of the crown was then exercised would have involved them both in ruin and even if passion had so far prevailed over elizabeth's characteristic caution and keen regard to her own interest seymour's feelings were not of that romantic nature which would have led him to sacrifice either wealth or ambition on the shrine of love my lord admiral had a prudential eye to the main chance and no modern fortune hunter could have made more particular inquiries into the actual state of any lady's finances than he did into those of the fair and young sister of his sovereign to whose hand he the younger son of a country knight presumed to aspire the sordid spirit of the man is sufficiently unveiled in the following conversation between him and thomas parry the cofferer of the princess elizabeth as deposed by the latter before the council when i went unto my lord admiral the third and fourth time says parry after he had asked me how her grace did and such things he had large communications with me of her and he questioned me of many things and of the state of her grace's house and how many servants she kept and i told him a hundred and twenty or a hundred and forty or thereabouts then he asked me what houses she had and what lands i told him where the lands lay as near as i could in northamptonshire in berkshire lincoln and elsewhere then he asked me if they were good lands or no and i told him they were out on lease for the most part and therefore the worse he asked me also whether she had the lands for term of life or how and i said i could not perfectly tell but i thought it was such as she was appointed by her father's will and testament the king's majesty that then was the admiral proceeded to inquire if she had had her letters patent out and parry replied no for there were some things in them that could not be assured to her grace yet probably till she was of age and that a friend of her grace would help her to an exchange of lands that would be more commodious to her the admiral asked what friend and parry replied morrison who would help her to have you elm for apethorpe on which the admiral proposed making an exchange with the princess himself for some of their lands and spake much of his three fair houses Bewdley, sudley and bromham and fell to comparing his housekeeping with that of the princess and that he could do it with less expense than she was at and offered his house in london for her use at last he said when her grace came to ashridge it was not far out of his way and he might come to see her in his way up and down and would be glad to see her there parry told him he could not go to see her grace till he knew what her pleasure was why said the admiral it is no matter now for there hath been a talk of late that i shall marry my lady jane adding i tell you this merrily i tell you this merrily when these communications had been made to the lady elizabeth she caused mrs ashley to write two letters to the admiral one declaring her good will but requesting him not to come without the council's permission for that purpose the other declaring her acceptation of his gentleness and that he would be welcome but if he came not she prayed god to speed his journey concluding in these words from ashley herself no more hereof until i see my lord myself for my lady is not to seek his gentleness or good will there is no absolute evidence to prove that seymour availed himself of this implied permission to visit the princess but every reason to suppose he did and that by the connivance of her governess and state officers he had clandestine interviews with the royal girl at times and places not in accordance with the restraints and reserves 
with which a maiden princess of her tender years ought to have been surrounded reports of a startling nature reached the court and the duchess of somerset severely censured catherine ashley because she had permitted my lady elizabeth's grace to go one night on the thames in a barge and for other light parts saying that she was not worthy to have the governance of the king's daughter when elizabeth was preparing to pay her christmas visit to court she was at a loss for a town residence durham house which had formerly been granted to her mother queen anne boleyn before her marriage with king henry and to which elizabeth considered she had a right having been appropriated by king edward's council to the purpose of a mint elizabeth made application by her cofferer thomas perry to the lord admiral for his assistance in this matter on which he very courteously offered to give up his own town house for her accommodation and that of her train adding that he would come and see her grace which declaration says perry she seemed to take very gladly and to accept it joyfully on which continues he casting in my mind the reports which i had heard of a marriage between them and observing that at all times when by any chance talk should be had of the lord admiral she showed such countenance that it should appear she was very glad to hear of him and especially would show countenance of gladness when he was well spoken of i took occasion to ask her whether if the council would like it she would marry with him to which she replied when that comes to pass i will do as god shall put into my mind i remember well continues perry that when i told her grace how the lord admiral would gladly she should sue out her letters patent she asked me whether he was so desirous or no indeed i said yes in earnest he was desirous of it and i told her farther how he would have had her have lands in gloucester called prisley as in parcel of exchange and in wales and she asked me what i thought he meant thereby and i said i cannot tell unless he go about to have you also for he wished your lands and would have them that way this broad hint elizabeth received as it appears in silence but when perry proceeded to inform her that the admiral wished her to go to the duchess of somerset and by that means to make suit to the protector for the exchange of the lands and for the grant of a house instead of durham house for herself and so to entertain the duchess for her good offices in this affair the spirit of the royal tutor stirred within her and she said i dare say he did not say so or would yes by my faith replied the cofferer well quoth she indignantly i will not do so and so tell him she expressed anger that she should be driven to make such suits and said in faith i will not come there nor begin to flatter now shortly after the lady elizabeth asked perry whether he had told kate ashley of the lord admiral's gentleness and kind offers and those words and things that had been told to her i told her no said perry well said elizabeth in any wise go tell it her for i will know nothing but she shall know it in faith i cannot be quiet until ye have told her of it when perry told the governess she said that she knew it well enough and perry rejoined that it seemed to him that there was good will between the lord admiral and her grace and that he gathered both by him and her grace oh said mrs ashley it is true but i had such a charge in this that i dared nothing say in it but i would wish her his wife of all men living i wis quoth she he might bring the matter to pass at the council's hand well enough the long gossiping conversation between the cofferer and the governess then followed in which mrs ashley after adverting to some passages in the early stage of the princess's acquaintance with the admiral and the jealousy queen catherine parr had conceived of her suddenly recollected herself and told perry she repented of having disclosed so many particulars to him especially of the late queen finding her husband with his arms about the young princess and besought the cofferer not to repeat it for if he did so that it got abroad her grace should be dishonoured for ever and she likewise undone perry replied that he would rather be pulled with horses than he would disclose it yet it is from his confession that this scandalous story has become matter of history 
while the admiral was proceeding with this sinister courtship of elizabeth and before his plans were sufficiently matured to permit him to become a declared suitor for her hand russell the lord privy seal surprised him by saying to him as they were riding together after the protector somerset to the parliament house my lord admiral there are certain rumours brooded of you which i am very sorry to hear when seymour demanded his meaning russell told him that he was informed that he made means to marry either the lady mary or else with the lady elizabeth adding my lord if ye go about any such thing ye seek the means to undo yourself and all those that shall come of you seymour replied that he had no thought of such an enterprise and so the conversation ended at that time a few days afterwards seymour renewed the subject in these words father russell you are very suspicious of me i pray you tell me who showed you of the marriage that i should attempt it whereof ye break with me the other day russell replied that he would not tell him the authors of that tale but that they were his very good friends and he advised him to make no suit of marriage that way though no names were mentioned seymour who well knew the allusion was to the sisters of the sovereign replied significantly it is convenient for them to marry and better it were that they were married within the realm than in any foreign place without the realm and why continued he might not i or another man raised by the king their father marry one of them then said russell my lord if either you or any other within this realm shall match himself in marriage either with my lady mary or my lady elizabeth he shall undoubtedly whatsoever he be procure unto himself the occasion of his utter undoing and you especially above all others being so near alliance to the king's majesty and after explaining to the admiral the perilous jealousies which would be excited by his marrying either of the heirs of the crown he asked this home question and pray you my lord what shall you have with either of them he who marries one of them shall have three thousand a year replied seymour my lord it is not so said russell for ye may well be assured that he shall have no more than ten thousand pounds in money plate and goods and no land and what is that to maintain his charges and estate who matches himself there they must have the three thousand pounds a year also rejoined seymour russell with a tremendous oath protested that they should not and seymour with another asserted that they should and that none should dare to say nay to it russell with a second oath swore that he would say nay to it for it was clean against the king's will and the admiral profligate as he was finding himself outsworn by the hoary-headed old statesman desisted from bandying oaths with him on the subject the most remarkable feature in this curious dialogue is however the anxiety displayed by seymour on the pecuniary prospects of his royal love he sent one of his servants about this time to lady brown celebrated by surrey under the poetic name of fair geraldine who appears to have been a very intimate friend and ally of his advising her to break up housekeeping and to take up her abode with the lady elizabeth's grace to save charges lady brown replied that she verily purposed to go to the lady elizabeth's house that next morning but she appears to have been prevented by the sickness and death of her old husband it was suspected that seymour meant to have employed her in furthering some of his intrigues the protector and his council meantime kept a jealous watch on the proceedings of the admiral not only with regard to his clandestine addresses with the lady elizabeth but his daring intrigues to overthrow the established regency and get the power into his own hands there was an attempt on the part of somerset to avert the mischief by sending the admiral on a mission to boulogne and the last interview the princess elizabeth's confidential servant perry had with him in his chamber at court where he was preparing for this unwelcome voyage the following conversation then took place the admiral asked how doth her grace and when will she be here perry replied that the lord protector had not determined on the day no said the admiral bitterly that shall be when i am gone to boulogne perry presented mrs ashley's commendations and said it was her earnest wish that the lady elizabeth should be his wife 
Oh, replied the admiral, it will not be, adding, that his brother would never consent to it. End of section two. Section three of Lives of the Queens of England, volume six, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, chapter one, part three. On the 16th of January, the Admiral was arrested on a charge of high treason, having boasted that he had 10,000 men at his command, and suborned Sherrington, the master of the mint at Bristol, to coin a large sum of false money to support him in his wild projects. He was committed to the tower, and not only his servants, but the principal persons in the household of the Princess Elizabeth, were also arrested, and subjected to very strict examination by the council, in order to ascertain the nature of the admiral's connection with the princess, and how far she was implicated in his intrigues against the government. In fact, Elizabeth herself seems to have been treated as a prisoner of state, while these momentous investigations were proceeding, for, though she made earnest supplication to be admitted to the presence of the king her brother, or even to that of the protector, in order to justify herself, she was detained at her house at Hatfield, under the especial charge of Sir Thomas Turwitt, who certainly was empowered by the council to put her and her household under restraint. Very distressing must this crisis have been, to a girl in her sixteenth year, who had no maternal friend to counsel and support her under circumstances that were the more painful because of the previous scandal in which she had been involved at the time of her separation from her royal stepmother on account of the free conduct of the admiral all the particulars of his coarse familiarity and indelicate romping with elizabeth had been cruelly tattled by her governess mrs catherine ashley to parry the cofferer and were by him disclosed to the council and confirmed by the admissions of mrs ashley the fact that notwithstanding those things elizabeth was receiving the clandestine addresses of this bold bad man almost before queen catherine was cold in her grave was injurious to her reputation and caused her to be treated with less respect and consideration from the council than ought to have been shown to a royal lady of her tender age and the sister of the sovereign sir robert turwitt first announced to her the alarming tidings that mrs ashley and her husband with perry had all been committed to the tower on her account on which he says her grace was marvellously abashed and did weep very tenderly a long time demanding whether they had confessed anything turwitt assured her that they had confessed everything and urged her to do the same elizabeth was not to be thus easily outwitted and turwitt then endeavoured to terrify her by requiring her to remember her honour and the peril that might ensue for she was but a subject an innuendo that might have been somewhat alarming to so young a girl considering her mother though a queen had died by the sword of the executioner but the lofty spirit of elizabeth was not to be thus intimidated and turwitt told somerset that he was not able to get anything from her but by gentle persuasion whereby he began to grow with her in credit for i do assure your grace continues he she hath a good wit and nothing is to be gotten from her but by great policy she was however greatly disturbed when he told her that perry and mrs ashley had both confessed and in confirmation showed her the signatures to their depositions on which she called perry false wretch Turwitt told her what sort of woman Mrs. Ashley was, and assured her that if she would open all things, that all the evil and shame should be ascribed to them, and her youth taken into consideration by his majesty, the protector, and the whole council. But in no way, continues he, will she confess any practice by Mrs. Ashley, or the cofferer, concerning my lord admiral, and yet i do see it in her face that she is guilty and yet perceive that she will abide more storms ere she will accuse mrs ashley on the twenty eighth of january turwitt informs the protector that he has in obedience to his letter of the twenty sixth 
practiced with her grace, by all means and policy, to induce her to confess more than she had already done, in a letter which she had just written to the duke, with her own hand, which contained all that she was willing to admit. And Turwitt expresses his conviction that a secret pact had been made by the princess, Mrs. Ashley, and Perry, never to confess anything to the crimination of each other. And if so, continues he, it will never be drawn from her grace, unless by the king her brother or the protector. The following is the letter written by Elizabeth to Somerset, which tallies, as Turwitt very shrewdly observes, most remarkably with the depositions of Ashley and Perry, and induces him to think that they had all three agreed in their story, in case of being questioned, or, to use his own expression, set the note before. The Lady Elizabeth to the Lord Protector. My Lord, your great gentleness and good will towards me, as well in this thing as in other things, I do understand, for the which even as I ought, so I do give you humble thanks, and whereas your lordship willeth and counseleth me, as an earnest friend, to declare what I know in this matter, and also to write what I have declared to Master Turwitt, I shall most willingly do it. I declared unto him first, that after the cofferer had declared unto me what my lord admiral answered, for Allen's matter, and for Durham Place, that it was appointed to be a mint, he told me that my lord admiral did offer me his house for my time being with the king's majesty and further said and asked me if the council did consent that i should have my lord admiral whether i would consent to it or no i answered that i would not tell him what my mind was and i further inquired of him what he meant by asking me that question or who bade him say so he answered me and said Nobody bade him say so, but that he perceived, as he thought, by my Lord Admiral inquiring whether my patent were sealed or no, and debating what he spent in his house, and inquiring what was spent in my house, that he was given that way rather than otherwise. And as concerning Cat Ashley, by which familiar name Elizabeth always speaks of her governess, she never advised me to it, but said always, when any talked of my marriage, that she would never have me marry, neither in England nor out of England, without the consent of the King's Majesty, your graces, and the councils. And after the Queen was departed, a cool way, by the by, of alluding to the death of Queen Catherine Parr, from whom Elizabeth had in her tender childhood received the most essential offices of friendship and maternal kindness. When I asked of her, what news she heard from London, she answered merrily, they say, your grace shall have my lord admiral, and that he will shortly come to woo you. And moreover, I said unto him, that the cofferer sent a letter hither, that my lord said that he would come this way as he went down into the country. Then I bade her write as she thought best, and bade her show it to me when she had done. So she wrote, that she thought it not best, that the admiral should come, for fear of suspicion. And so it went forth, that is, the letter was sent. And the Lord Admiral, after he had heard that, asked the cofferer, Why he might not come to me as well as to my sister? And then I desired Cat Ashley to write again, lest my lord might think that she knew more in it than he, that she knew nothing, but only suspected. And I also told Master Turwit that, to the effect of the matter. Here Elizabeth evidently alludes to the report of his intended courtship. I never consented to any such thing, without the council's consent thereto. And as for Cat Ashley and the cofferer, they never told me that they would practice it, for example, compass the marriage. These be the things which I declared to Master Turwitt, and also, whereof my conscience beareth me witness, which I would not for all earthly things, offend in any thing. For I know I have a soul to be saved as well as other folks have, Wherefore I will, above all things, have respect unto this same. If there be any more things which I can remember, I will either write it myself, or cause Mr. Turwitt to write it. Master Turwitt and others have told me, that there goeth rumors abroad, which be greatly both against my honor and honesty, which, above all other things, I esteem, which be these, that I am in the tower, and with child by my Lord Admiral. 
my lord these are shameful slanders for the which besides the great desire i have to see the king's majesty i shall most heartily desire your lordship that i may come to the court after your first determination that i may show myself there as i am written in haste from hatfield this twenty eighth of january your assured friend to my little power elizabeth this letter which is in the haynes edition of the burley state papers entitled the confession of the lady elizabeth's grace is one of the most interesting documents connected with her personal history there is a curious mixture of childlike simplicity and diplomatic skill in her admissions with that affectation of candor which often veils the most profound dissimulation her endeavors to screen her governess are however truly generous and the lofty spirit with which she adverts to the scandalous reports that were in circulation against her reputation is worthy of the daughter of a king and conveys a direct conviction of her innocence there is no affectation of delicacy or mock modesty in her language she comes to the point at once like an honest woman and in plain english tells the protector of what she had been accused and declares that it is a shameful slander and demands that she may be brought to court that her appearance may prove her innocence it is to be remembered that elizabeth was little turned of fifteen when this letter was penned on the seventh of february turwitt succeeded in drawing a few more particulars from elizabeth which he forwarded to the duke of somerset enclosed in the following note to his grace i do send all the articles i received from your grace and also the lady elizabeth's confession withal which is not so full of matter as i would it were nor yet so much as i did procure her too but in no way will she confess that either mrs ashley or perry willed her to any practices with my lord admiral either by messages or writing they all sing one song and so i think they would not unless they had set the note before february seventh hatfield in elizabeth's hand cat ashley told me that after the lord admiral was married to the queen if he had had his own will he would have had me afore the queen then i asked her how she knew that she said i knew it well enough both by himself and others the place where she said this i have forgotten but she spoke to me of him many times then turwitt wrote the rest of the confession but under the inspection of the princess as follows another time after the queen was dead cat ashley would have had me to have written a letter to my lord admiral to have comforted him in his sorrow because he had been my friend in the queen's lifetime and would think great kindness therein then i said i would not for he needs it not then said cat ashley if your grace will not then i will i remember i did see it for example the consolatory letter elizabeth thought so superfluous to the widower but what the effect of it was i do not remember another time i asked her what news was at london and she said the voice went there that my lord admiral seymour should marry me i smiled at this and replied it was but a london news one day she said he that fain would have had you before he married the queen will come now to woo you i answered her though peradventure he himself would have me yet i think the privy council will not consent but i think by what you said if he had had his own will he would have had me i think there was no let or hindrance of his part but only on that of the council howbeit she said another time that she did not wish me to have him because she who had him was so unfortunate elizabeth then informs the duke that perry asked her if the council consented whether she would have the lord admiral or no i asked him pursues she what he meant by that question and who bade him ask me he replied no one but he gathered by questions asked by the lord admiral before that he meant some such thing i told him it was but his foolish gathering she says perry brought a message from the lord admiral advising her first to get her patent sealed and sure and then he would apply to the council for leave to marry her likewise that the lord admiral wished her to reside at ashridge because it was in his way when he went into the country to call and see her 
elizabeth signed this confession with her own hand and very blandly concludes the paper with an assurance to somerset that if she remembered any more she would be sure to forward the items to him it was doubtless for the purpose of shaking elizabeth's confidence in mrs ashley that turwit showed her the deposition of the trusty official which revealed all the particulars of the liberties the admiral had presumed to offer to her while she was under the care of his late consort queen catherine elizabeth appeared greatly abashed and half breathless while reading the needlessly minute details which had been made before the council of scenes in which she had been only a passive actor but as mrs ashley had abstained from disclosures of any consequence touching her more recent intercourse with seymour she expressed no displeasure but when she had read to the end carefully examined the signatures both of catherine ashley and perry as if she had suspected turwit of practising an imposition though it was plain observes he that she knew both at half a glance in one of turwit's letters to somerset he says that master beverley and himself had been examining the cofferer's accounts which they find very incorrect and the books so indiscreetly kept that he appears little fit for his office that her grace's expenses are at present more than she can afford and therefore she must perforce make entrenchments she was desirous that the protector should not appoint any one to be her cofferer till she had spoken to him herself for she thought an officer of less importance would serve for that department and save in her purse a hundred pounds a year this proved to be only an excuse on the part of the young lady to keep the office open for perry whom she took the first opportunity of reinstating in his post, although she had been given full proof of his defalcations, and so far was she from resenting the nature of his disclosures, with regard to the improper confidence that had been reposed in him by her tattling governess, that she afterwards, on her accession to the throne, appointed him the comptroller of her royal household, and continued her preferment to him and his daughter to the end of their lives, conduct which naturally induces a suspicion that secrets of greater moment had been confided to him secrets that probably would have touched not only the maiden fame of his royal mistress but placed her life in jeopardy and that he had preserved these inviolate the same may be supposed with respect to mrs ashley to whom elizabeth clung with unshaken tenacity through every storm even when the council dismissed her from her office and addressed a stern note to her grace the lady elizabeth apprising her that they had in consequence of the misconduct of mrs catherine ashley removed her from her post and appointed the lady turwit to take her place as governess to her grace and requiring her to receive her as such the disdainful manner in which the young lioness of the tudor plantagenet line received the new duenna who had been contumaciously put in authority over her by her royal brother's counsel is best related in the words of sir robert turwit himself who in his twofold capacity of spy and jailer seems to have peculiar satisfaction in telling tales of the defenceless orphan of anne boleyn to the powerful brother of her murdered mother's rival jane seymour pleaseth your grace to be advertised he writes that after my wife's repair hither she declared to the lady elizabeth's grace that she was called before your grace and the council and had a rebuke that she had not taken upon herself the office to see her well governed in the lieu of mrs ashley this reproof to lady turwit must have had reference to the time when all the parties concerned were living under the roof of queen catherine parr whose lady-in-waiting lady turwit was the lady elizabeth replied that mrs ashley was her mistress and that she had not so demeaned herself that the council should now need to put any more mistresses unto her whereunto pursues turwit my wife answered seeing she did allow mrs ashley to be her mistress she need not to be ashamed to have any honest woman to be in that place she took the matter so heavily that she wept all that night and lured all the next day till she received your letter and then she sent for me and asked me whether she were best to write to you again or not i said if she would follow the effect of your letter meaning if she would comply with the injunctions contained in it i thought it best that she should write but in the end of the matter 
I perceived that she was very loath to have a governor, and to avoid the same, she said, that the world would note her to be a great offender, having so hastily a governor appointed over her. And all is no more than that she fully hopes to recover her old mistress again. The love she yet beareth her is to be wondered at. I told her, Elizabeth, that if she would consider her honor, and the sequel thereof, she would, considering her years, make suit to your grace to have one, rather than to be without one a single hour. She cannot digest such advice in no way, continues Sir Robert, dryly. But if I should say my fantasy, it were more meet she should have two than one. He then complains, that although he favoured her grace with his advice, as to the manner in which she should frame her reply to Somerset, she would in no wise follow it, but writ her own fantasy. And in the right of it too, we should say, considering the treacherous nature of the counsellor, who, serpent-like, was trying to beguile her into criminating herself, for the sake of employing her evidence against the luckless admiral, who was at that very time struggling in the toils of his foes, and vainly demanding the privilege of a fair trial. That Elizabeth did not contemplate his fall, and the plunder of his property without pain, Turwood bears witness. She beginneth now to droop a little, writes that watchful observer, by reason that she heareth, my lord admiral's houses be dispersed, and my wife telleth me now, that she cannot hear him discommended, but she is ready to make answer, which, continues Turwit, she hath not been accustomed to do, unless Mrs. Ashley were touched, whereunto she was ever ready to make answer, vehemently in her defence. The following is the letter which Elizabeth addressed to Somerset, instead of that which his creature, Turwit, had endeavoured to beguile her into writing. It is marked with all the caution that characterised her diplomatic correspondence, after the lessons of worldcraft, in which she finally became an adept, were grown familiar to her. She, however, very properly assumes the tone of an injured person, with regard to the scandalous reports that were in circulation against her, and demands that he and the council should take the requisite steps for putting a stop to those injurious rumours. Letter from the Lady Elizabeth to the Protector Somerset. My Lord, having received your Lordship's letters, I perceive in them your good will towards me, because you declare to me plainly your mind in this thing, and again for that, you would not wish that I should do anything that should not seem good unto the council, for the which thing I give you most hearty thanks. And whereas, I do understand, that you do take an evil part, the letters that I did write unto your lordship. I am very sorry that you should take them so, for my mind was to declare unto you plainly, as I thought, in that thing which I did, also the more willingly, because as I write to you, you desired me to be plain with you in all things. And as concerning that point that you write, that I seem to stand in my own wit, and being so well assured of mine own self, I did assure me of myself, no more than I trust the truth shall try, and to say that which I know of myself, I did not think should have displeased the counsel or your grace. And surely, the cause why that I was sorry, that there should be any such thing about me, was because that I thought the people will say that I deserved, through my lewd demeanour, to have such a one, and not that I mislike anything that your lordship, or the council, shall think good. For I know that you and the council are charged with me, and that I take upon me to rule myself, for I know that they are most deceived, that trusteth most in themselves, wherefore I trust you shall never find that fault in me, to the which thing I do not see that your grace has made any direct answer at this time, and seeing that they make so evil reports already, shall be but an increasing of these evil tongues. Howbeit, you did write, that if I would bring forth any that had reported it, you and the council would see it redressed, which thing, though I can easily do it, I would be loath to do, because it is mine own cause, and again, that it should be but a bridging of an evil name of me, that am glad to punish them, and so get the evil will of the people, which thing I would be loath to have. But if it might seem good to your lordship, and the rest of the council, to send forth a proclamation into the countries, that they refrain their tongues, declaring how the tales be but lies, 
it should make both the people think that you and the council have great regard that no such rumors should be spread of any of the king's majesty's sisters as i am though unworthy and also that i should think myself to receive such friendship at your hands as you have promised me although your lordship hath shown me great already howbeit i am ashamed to ask it any more because i see you are not so well minded thereunto and as concerning that you say that i give folks occasion to think in refusing the good to uphold the evil i am not so simple understanding nor would that your grace should have so evil an opinion of me that i have so little respect of my own honesty that i would maintain it if i had sufficient promise of the same and so your grace shall prove me when it comes to the point and thus i bid you farewell desiring god always to assist you in all your affairs written in haste from hatfield this twenty first of february your assured friend to my little power elizabeth superscribed to my very good lord my lord protector to such a horrible extent had the scandals to which elizabeth adverts in this letter proceeded that not only was it said that she had been seduced by seymour and was about to become a mother but that she had actually borne him a child from the manuscript life of jane dormer duchess of feria who had been in the service of her sister the princess mary we learn that there was a report of a child born and miserably destroyed but that it could not be discovered whose it was a midwife testified that she was brought from her house blindfold to a house where she did her office and returned in like manner she saw nothing in the house but candlelight and only said it was the child of a very fair young lady this wild story was but a modern version of an ancient legend which is to be met with among the local traditions of every county in england in border minstrelsy and ballad lore and even in oriental tales and it had certainly been revived by some of the court gossips of edward the sixth reign who thought proper to make the youthful sister of that prince the heroine of the adventure the council had offered to punish any one whom elizabeth could point out as the author of the injurious rumours against her character and her observation in her letter to somerset in reply to this offer that she should but gain an evil name as if she were glad to punish and thus incur the ill-will of the people which she should be loath to have is indicative of the profound policy which throughout life enabled this great queen to win and retain the affections of the men of england popularity was a leading object with elizabeth from her childhood to the grave and well had nature fitted her to play her part with eclat in the splendid drama of royalty on the fourth of march fifteen forty nine the bill of attainer against thomas seymour baron sudley lord admiral of england was read for the third time in the house of lords and though his courtship of elizabeth formed one of the numerous articles against him and it must have been a season replete with anxious alarm and anguish to herself she generously ventured to write an earnest appeal to somerset in behalf of her imprisoned governess mrs ashley and her husband who were as she had every reason to suppose involved in the same peril that impended over her rash lover with whom they had been confederate her letter is written in a noble spirit and does equal credit to her head and heart and is a beautiful specimen of special pleading in a girl of fifteen letter from elizabeth to the protector somerset my lord i have a request to make unto your grace which fear has made me omit till this time for two causes the one because i saw that my request for the rumours which were spread abroad of me took so little place which thing when i considered i thought i should little profit in any other suit howbeit now i understand that there is a proclamation for them for the which i give your grace and the rest of the council most humble thanks i am the bolder to speak for another thing and the other was because peradventure your lordship and the rest of the council will think that i favour her evil doing for whom i shall speak which is catherine ashley that it would please your grace and the rest of the council to be good unto her which thing i do not to favour her in any evil for that i would be sorry to do but for these considerations that follow the which hope doth teach me in saying that i ought not to doubt but that your grace and the rest of the council will think that i do it for other considerations 
first because she hath been with me a long time and many years and hath taken great labor and pain in bringing me up in learning and honesty and therefore i ought of very duty speak for her for saint gregory saith that we are more bound to them that bringeth us up well than to our parents for our parents do that which is natural for them that bringeth us into this world but our bringers up are a cause to make us live well in it the second is because i think that whatsoever she hath done in my lord admiral's matter as concerning the marrying of me she did it because knowing him to be one of the council she thought he would not go about any such thing without he had the council's consent thereunto for i have heard her many times say that she would never have me marry in any place without your graces and the council's consent the third cause is because that it shall and doth make men think that i am not clear of the deed myself but that it is pardoned to me because of my youth because that she i love so well is in such a place thus hope prevailing more with me than fear hath won the battle and i have at this time gone forth with it which i pray god be taken no otherwise than it is meant written in haste from hatfield this seventh day of march also if i may be so bold not offending i beseech your grace and the rest of the council to be good to master ashley her husband which because he is my kinsman i would be glad he should do well your assured friend to my little power elizabeth to my very good lord my lord protector there is something truly magnanimous in the manner in which elizabeth notices her relationship to the prisoner ashley at the time when he was under so dark a cloud and it proves that the natural impulses of her heart were generous and good the constitutional levity which she inherited from her mother appears at that period of her life to have been her worst fault and though afterwards she acquired the art of veiling this under an affectation of extreme prudery her natural inclination was perpetually breaking out and betraying her into follies which remind one of the conduct of the cat in the fable who was turned into a lady but never could resist her native penchant for catching mice on the twentieth of march seymour was brought to the block he had employed the last evening of his life in writing letters to elizabeth and her sister with the point of an aglet which he plucked from his hose being denied the use of pen and ink these letters which he concealed within the sole of a velvet shoe were discovered by the emissaries of the council and opened no copies of these interesting documents have apparently been preserved but bishop latimer in his sermon in justification of the execution of the unhappy writer describes them to be of a wicked and dangerous nature tending to excite the jealousy of the king's sisters against the protector somerset as their great enemy when elizabeth was informed of the execution of the admiral she had the presence of mind to disappoint the malignant curiosity of the official spies who were watching to report every symptom of emotion she might betray on that occasion and merely said this day died a man with much wit and very little judgment although this extraordinary instance of self-command might by some be regarded as a mark of apathy in so young a woman there can be no doubt that elizabeth had been entangled in the snares of a deep and enduring passion for seymour passion that had rendered her regardless of every consideration of pride caution and ambition and forgetful of the obstacle which nature itself had opposed to a union between the daughter of anne boleyn and a brother of jane seymour that elizabeth continued to cherish the memory of this unsuitable lover with tenderness not only after she had been deprived of him by the acts of the executioner but for long years afterwards may be inferred from the favor which she always bestowed on his faithful follower sir john harrington the elder and the fact that when she was actually the sovereign of england and had rejected the addresses of many of the princes of europe harrington ventured to present her with a portrait of his deceased lord the admiral with the following descriptive sonnet of person rare strong limbs and manly shape by nature framed to serve on sea or land in friendship firm in good state or ill hap in peace headwise in war skill great bold hand on horse or foot in peril or in play none could excel though many did assay a subject true to king a servant great friend to god's truth and foe to rome's deceit 
sumptuous abroad for honor of the land temperate at home yet kept great state with stay and noble house that fed more mouths with meat than some advanced on higher steps to stand yet against nature reason and just laws his blood was spilt guiltless without just cause the gift was accepted and no reproof addressed to the donor elizabeth had six ladies of honor in her household at hatfield whose names were celebrated by sir john harrington in a complimentary poem which he addresses to that princess early in mary's reign the poem commences the great diana chaste in forest late i met did me command in haste to hatfield for to get and to you six a row her pleasure to declare thus meaning to bestow on each a gift most rare first she doth give to gray the falcon's courteous kind her lord for to obey with most obedient mind he proceeds to praise isabella markham for her modesty and beauty mrs norwich for goodness and gravity mrs st lo for stability mrs willoughby for being a laurel instead of a willow and mrs shipwith for prudence elizabeth chose to personate diana or paulus all her life End of section three. Section four of the Lives of the Queens of England, Volume six by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter two, Part one the disastrous termination of elizabeth's first love affair appears to have had the salutary effect of inclining her to habits of a studious and reflective character she was for a time under a cloud and during the profound retirement in which she was doomed to remain for at least a year after the execution of the lord admiral the energies of her active mind found employment and solace in the pursuits of learning she assumed a grave and sedate demeanor withal and bestowed much attention on theology which the polemic spirit of the times rendered a subject of powerful interest her new governess lady turwit had been the friend of the late queen catherine parr and was one of the learned females who had supported the doctrines of the reformation and narrowly escaped the fiery crown of martyrdom and though elizabeth had in the first instance defied her authority there is reason to believe that she was reconciled to her after the first effervescence of her high spirit had subsided and the assimilation of their religious feelings produced sympathy and good will between them a curious little devotional volume is mentioned by anthony a wood as having once belonged to queen elizabeth which was compiled by this lady for her use when acting as her preceptress it was of miniature size bound in solid gold and entitled lady elizabeth turwitz morning and evening prayers with divers hymns and meditations it was probably about this period that elizabeth translated an italian sermon of ochinus which she transcribed in a hand of great beauty and sent to her royal brother as a new year's gift the dedication is dated enfield december thirtieth but the year is not specified the manuscript is now in the bodleian library not in vain did elizabeth labor to efface the memory of her early indiscretion by establishing a reputation for learning and piety the learned roger ashcombe under whom she perfected herself in the study of the classics in his letters to sturmius the rector of the protestant university at strasburg is enthusiastic in his enconiums on his royal pupil of whose scholastic attainments he is justly proud numberless honorable ladies of the present time says he surpass the daughters of sir thomas more in every kind of learning but amongst them all my illustrious mistress the lady elizabeth shines like a star excelling them more by the splendor of her virtues than by the glory of her royal birth in the variety of her commendable qualities i am less perplexed to find matter for the highest panegyric than to circumscribe that panegyric within just bounds yet i shall mention nothing respecting her but what has come under my own observation for two years she pursued the study of greek and latin under my tuition 
but the foundations of her knowledge in both languages were laid by the diligent instruction of william grindal my late beloved friend and seven years my pupil in classical learning at cambridge from this university he was summoned by john cheek to court where he soon after received the appointment of tutor to this lady after some years when through her native genius aided by the efforts of so excellent a master she had made a great progress in learning and grindal by his merit and favour of his mistress might have aspired to high dignities he was snatched away by a sudden illness i was appointed to succeed him in his office and the work which he had so happily begun without my assistance indeed but not without some counsels of mine i diligently laboured to complete now however released from the throng of a court and restored to the felicity of my former learned leisure i enjoy through the bounty of the king an honourable appointment in this university the lady elizabeth has completed her sixteenth year and so much solidity of understanding such courtesy united with dignity have never been observed at so early an age she has the most ardent love of true religion and the best kind of literature the constitution of her mind is exempt from female weakness and she is endued with masculine power of application no apprehension can be quicker than hers no memory more retentive french and italian she speaks like english latin with fluency propriety and judgment she also spoke greek with me frequently willingly and moderately well nothing can be more elegant than her handwriting whether in the greek or the roman character in music she is very skilful but does not greatly delight with respect to her personal decoration she greatly prefers a simple elegance to show and splendor so despising the outward adorning of plaiting the hair and wearing of gold that in the whole manner of her life she rather resembles hippolyta than phaedra she read with me almost the whole of cicero and a great part of livy from those two authors her knowledge of the latin language has been almost exclusively derived the beginning of the day was always devoted by her to the new testament in greek after which she read select orations of isocrates and the tragedies of sophocles which i judge best adapted to supply her tongue with the purest diction her mind with the most excellent precepts and her exalted station with a defence against the utmost power of fortune for her religious instruction she drew first from the fountains of scripture and afterwards from saint cyprian the commonplaces of melanchthon and similar works which convey pure doctrine in elegant language in every kind of writing she easily detected any ill adapted or far-fetched expression she could not bear those feeble imitators of erasmus who bind the latin language in the fetters of miserable proverbs on the other hand she approved a style chaste in propriety and beautiful in perspicuity and she greatly admired metaphors when not too violent and antithesis when just and happily opposed by a diligent attention to these particulars her ear became so practised and so nice that there was nothing in greek latin or english prose or verse which according to its merits or defects she did not either reject with disgust or receive with the highest delight the letters from which these passages have been extracted were written by ashcombe in latin in the year fifteen fifty when he had for some reason been compelled to withdraw from his situation in elizabeth's household the commendations of this great scholar had probably some share in restoring her to the favour of the learned young king her brother whose early affection for the dearly loved companion of his infancy appears to have been revived after a time and though the jealousy of the selfish statesman who held him in thrall prevented the princely boy from gratifying his yearnings for her presence he wrote to her to send him her portrait elizabeth in her reverential and somewhat pedantic epistle in reply certainly gives abundant evidence of the taste for metaphors to which ashcombe adverts in his letters to sturmius letter from the princess elizabeth to king edward the sixth with a present of her portrait like as the rich man that daily gathereth riches to riches and to one bag of money layeth a great sort till it come to infinite so methinks your majesty not being sufficed with many benefits and gentlenesses showed to me afore this time 
doth now increase them in asking and desiring where you may bid and command requiring a thing not worthy the desiring for itself but made worthy for your highness's request my picture i mean in which if the inward good mind towards your grace might as well be declared as the outward face and countenance shall be seen i would not have tarried the commandment but prevented it nor have been the last to grant but the first to offer it for the face i grant i might well blush to offer but the mind i shall never be ashamed to present for though from the grace of the picture the colors may fade by time may give by weather may be spotted by chance yet the other nor time with her swift wings shall overtake nor the misty clouds with their lowerings may darken nor chance with her slippery foot may overthrow of this although yet the proof could not be great because the occasions hath been but small notwithstanding as a dog hath a day so may i perchance have time to declare it in deeds where now i do write them but in words and further i shall most humbly beseech your majesty that when you shall look on my picture you will vouchsafe to think that as you have put the outward shadow of the body afore you so my inward mind wisheth that the body itself were oftener in your presence howbeit because both my so being i think i could do your majesty little pleasure though myself great good and again because i see as yet not the time agreeing thereunto i shall learn to follow the saying of oris or horus ferus non culpes quad vitare non potest and thus i will troubling your majesty i fear and with my most humble thanks beseeching god long to preserve you to his honour to your comfort to the realm's profit and to my joy from hatfield this fifteenth day of may your majesty's most humble sister elizabeth in the summer of fifteen fifty elizabeth had succeeded in reinstating her trusty cofferer thomas perry in his old office and she employed him to write to the newly appointed secretary of state william cecil afterwards lord burleigh to solicit him to bestow the parsonage of Harptree in the county of somerset on john kenyon the yeoman of her robes a lamentable instance of an unqualified layman through the patronage of the great devouring that property which was destined for the support of efficient ministers of the church such persons employed incompetent curates as their substitutes at a starving salary to the great injury and dissatisfaction of the congregation perry's letter is dated september twenty second from ashridge her grace he says hath been long troubled with rheums or rheumatism but now thanks be to the lord is nearly well again and shortly ye shall hear from her grace again a good understanding appears to have been early established between elizabeth and cecil which possibly might be one of the undercurrents that led to her recall to court where however she did not return till after the first disgrace of the duke of somerset on the seventeenth of march fifteen fifty one she emerged from the profound retirement in which she had remained since her disgrace in fifteen forty nine and came in state to visit the king her brother she rode on horseback through london to st james's palace attended by a great company of lords knights and gentlemen and after her about two hundred ladies on the nineteenth she came from st james's through the park to the court the way from the park gate to the court was spread with fine sand she was attended by a very honourable confluence of noble and worshipful persons of both sexes and was received with much ceremony at the court gate that wily politician the earl of warwick afterwards duke of northumberland had considered elizabeth young and neglected as she was of sufficient political importance to send her a duplicate of the curious letter addressed by the new council jointly to her and her sister the lady mary in which a statement is given of the asserted misdemeanors of somerset and their proceedings against him the council were now at issue with mary on the grounds of her adherence to the ancient doctrines and as a conference had been appointed between her and her opponents on the eighteenth of march it might be to divert popular attention from her and her cause that the younger and fairer sister of the sovereign was permitted to make her public entrance into london on the preceding day and that she was treated with so many marks of unwonted respect 
thus we see mary makes her public entry on the eighteenth with her train all decorated with black rosaries and crosses and on the nineteenth elizabeth is again shown to the people as if to obliterate any interest that might have been excited by the appearance of the elder princess the love of edward the sixth for elizabeth was so very great according to camden that he never spoke of her by any other title than his dearest sister or his sweet sister temperance elizabeth at this period affected extreme simplicity of dress in conformity to the mode which the rigid rules of the calvinist church of geneva was rendering general among the stricter portion of those noble ladies who professed the doctrines of the reformation the king her father says dr aylmer left her rich clothes and jewels and i know it to be true that in seven years after his death she never in all that time looked upon that rich attire and precious jewels but once and that against her will and that there never came gold or stone upon her head till her sister forced her to lay off her former soberness and bear her company in her glittering gayness and then she so wore it that all men might see that her body carried that which her heart misliked i am sure that her maidenly apparel which she used in king edward's time made the noblemen's wives and daughters ashamed to be dressed and painted like peacocks being more moved with her more virtuous example than with all that ever paul or peter wrote touching that matter the first opening charms of youth elizabeth well knew required no extraneous adornments and her classic tastes taught her that the elaborate magnificence of the costumes of her brother's court tended to obscure rather than enhance those graces which belong to the morning bloom of life the plainness and modesty of the princess elizabeth's costume was particularly noticed during the splendid festivities that took place on the occasion of the visit of the queen dowager of scotland mary of lorraine to the court of edward the sixth in october fifteen fifty one the advent of the beautiful regent of the sister kingdom and her french ladies of honor fresh from the gay and gallant louvre produced no slight excitement among the noble belles of king edward's court and it seems that a sudden and complete revolution in dress took place in consequence of the new fashions that were then imported by queen mary and her brilliant cortege so that all the ladies went with their hair frounced curled and double curled except the princess elizabeth who altered nothing says aylmer but kept her old maiden shamefacedness at a later period of life elizabeth made up in the exuberance of her ornaments and the fantastic extravagance of her dress for the simplicity of her attire when in the bloom of sweet seventeen what would her reverend eulogist have said if while penning these passages in her honor the vision of her three thousand gowns and the eighty wigs of divers colored hair in which his royal heroine finally rejoiced could have arisen in array before his mental eye to mark the difference between the elizabeth of seventeen and the elizabeth of seventy the elizabeth of seventeen had however a purpose to answer and a part to play neither of which were compatible with the indulgence of her natural vanity and the inordinate love of dress which the popular preachers of her brother's court were perpetually denouncing from the pulpit her purpose was the re-establishment of that fair fame which had been sullied by the cruel implication of her name by the protector somerset and his creatures in the proceedings against the lord admiral and in this she had by the circumspection of her conduct the unremitting manner in which she had since that mortifying period devoted herself to the pursuits of learning and theology so fully succeeded that she was now regarded as a pattern for all the youthful ladies of the court the part which she was ambitious of performing was that of the heroine of the reform party in england even as her sister mary was of the catholic portion of the people that elizabeth was already so considered and that the royal sisters were early placed in incipient rivalry to each other by the respective partisans of the warring creeds which divided the land may be gathered from the observations of their youthful cousin lady jane grey when urged to wear the costly dress that had been presented to her by mary nay that were a shame to follow my lady mary who leaveth god's word and leave my lady elizabeth who followeth god's word elizabeth wisely took no visible part in the struggle between the dudley and seymour factions 
though there is reason to believe that somerset tried to enlist her on his side the following interrogatory was put to him on one of his examinations whether he did not consent that vane should labour the lady elizabeth to be offended with the duke of northumberland then earl of warwick the earl of pembroke and others of his council the answer to this query has not been found or it might possibly throw some light on the history of elizabeth at this period she certainly had no cause to cherish the slightest friendship for somerset for though it appears from her letter to her sister mary that he had succeeded in persuading her that he was not guilty of his brother's death yet by bringing all the particulars of the indiscretions that had taken place between her and the admiral before the council he had acted with the utmost cruelty towards herself and cast a blight on her morning flower of life if we may believe letty somerset sent a piteous supplication to elizabeth from the tower imploring her to go to the king and exert her powerful influence to obtain his pardon and she wrote to him in reply that being so young a woman she had no power to do anything in his behalf and assured him that the king was surrounded by those who took good care to prevent her from approaching too near the court and she had no more opportunity of access to his majesty than himself the fall of somerset made at first no other difference to elizabeth than the transfer of her applications to the restoration of durham house from him to the duke of northumberland who had obtained the grant of that portion of somerset's illegally acquired property elizabeth persisted in asserting her claims to this demesne and that with a high hand for she addressed an appeal to the lord chancellor on the subject she openly expressed her displeasure that northumberland should have asked it of the king without first ascertaining her disposition touching it she made a peremptory demand that the house should be delivered up to her and sent word to northumberland that she was determined to come and see the king at candlemas and request that she might have the use of st james's palace for her abode pro tempore because she could not have her things so soon ready at the strand house but concludes northumberland after relating these energetic proceedings of the young lady i am sure her grace would have done no less though she had kept durham house this observation certainly refers to her wish of occupying st james's palace it was however no part of northumberland's policy to allow either of the sisters of the young king to enjoy the opportunity of personal intercourse with him and least of all elizabeth whom from the tender friendship that had ever united them and more than all the conformity of her profession with edward's religious opinions he might have naturally been desirous of appointing as his successor when his brief term of royalty was drawing to a close that elizabeth made an attempt to visit her royal brother in his sickness at what period is uncertain and that she was circumvented in her intention and intercepted on her approach to the metropolis by the agents of the faction that had possession of his person she herself informs him in the following letter in which she evinces a truly sisterly solicitude for his health letter from the princess elizabeth to king edward the sixth like as a shipman in stormy weather plucks down the sails tarrying for better winds so did i most noble king in my unfortunate chance on thursday pluck down the high sails of my joy and comfort and do trust one day that as troublesome waves have repulsed me backward so a gentle wind will bring me forward to my haven two chief occasions moved me much and grieved me greatly the one for that i doubted your majesty's health the other because for all my long tarrying i went without that i came for of the first i am relieved in a part both that i understood of your health and that also your majesty's lodging is not far from my lord marquis's chamber of my other grief i am not eased but the best is that whatsoever other folks will suspect i intend not to fear your grace's good will which i know that i never deserve to forfeit so i trust will still stick by me for if your grace's advice that i should return whose will is a commandment had not been i would not have made the half of my way the end of my journey and thus as one desirous to hear of your majesty's health though unfortunate to see it i shall pray god for ever to preserve you from hatfield this present saturday 
your majesty's humble sister to commandment elizabeth to the king's most excellent majesty the same power that employed to prevent the visit of elizabeth to her sick perhaps dying brother probably deprived him of the satisfaction of receiving the letter which informed him that such had been her intention it was the interest of those unprincipled statesmen to instil feelings of bitterness into the heart of the poor young king against those to whom the fond ties of natural affection had once so strongly united him the tenor of edward the sixth will and the testimony of the persons who were about him at the time of his death prove that he was at last no less estranged from elizabeth his sweetest sister temperance as he was formerly wont to call her than from mary whose recusancy had been urged against her as a reasonable ground for exclusion from the throne both were alike excluded from their natural places in the succession and deprived of the benefit of their father's nomination in the act for settling the royal succession in the year fifteen forty four and subsequently in his will mary first because of her papistry and secondly because she had been declared illegitimate the reproach of papistry could not with any consistency be objected to elizabeth for had not the lady jane grey herself the innocent rival for her title declared that the lady elizabeth was a follower of god's word and as to the second objection of their declaring mary illegitimate the direct contrary had been the result for the establishment of the legitimacy of either of these sisters no matter which must infallibly have stigmatized the birth of the other the next objection to mary and elizabeth was that being only sisters to edward by the half-blood they could not be his lawful heirs but this was indeed a fallacy for their title was derived from the same royal father from whom edward inherited the throne and would in no respect have been strengthened by the comparatively mean blood of jane seymour even if they had been her daughters by the late king the third reason given for the exclusion of edward's sisters was that they might marry foreign princes and thus be the means of bringing papistry into england again which lady jane grey could not do as she was already married to the son of the duke of northumberland latimer preached in favour of the exclusion of elizabeth as well as mary declaring that it was better that god should take away the ladies mary and elizabeth than that by marrying foreign princes they should endanger the existence of the reformed church ridley set forth the same doctrine although it was well known that elizabeth had rejected the offer of one foreign prince and had evinced a disinclination to marriage altogether nothing therefore could be more unfair than rejecting her for fear of a contingency that never might and in fact never did happen the name of conscience was however the watchword under which northumberland and his accomplices had carried their point with their pious young sovereign when they induced him to set aside the rightful heirs and bequeath the crown to lady jane grey elizabeth kept her state at hatfield house during the last few months of edward's reign the expenses of her household amounted to an average of three thousand nine hundred and thirty eight pounds according to one of her household books from october first fifth of edward the sixth to the last day of september in the sixth year of that prince in the possession of lord strangford it is entitled the account of thomas perry esq cofferer to the right excellent princess the lady elizabeth her grace the king's majesty's most honourable sister the above was the style and title used by elizabeth during her royal brother's reign every page of the book is signed at the bottom by her own hand her cellar appears to have been well stocked with beer sweet wine rhenish and gascon wines lamprey pies were once entered as a present the wages of her household servants for a quarter of a year amounted to eighty two pounds seventeen shillings eight pence the liveries for velvet coats for thirteen gentlemen at forty shillings the coat amounted to twenty six pounds the liveries of her yeomen to seventy eight pounds eighteen shillings she paid for the making of her turnspits coats nine shillings and two pence given in alms at sundry times to poor men and women seven pounds fifteen shillings eight pence among the entries for the chamber and robes are the following paid to john spithonius the seventeenth of may for books and to mr allen for a bible twenty seven shillings four pence 
paid to Edmund Allen for a Bible, twenty shillings. Third of November, to the keeper of Hertford Jail, for fees of John Wingfield, being in ward, thirteen shillings four pence. Paid, fourteenth of December, to Blanche Perry for her half year's annuity, a hundred shillings, and to Blanche Courtney for the like, sixty six shillings eight pence. Paid, December fourteenth, at the christening of Mr. Pendred's child, by warrant of the peer, one shilling. Paid in reward unto sundry persons at St. James's, her grace then being there, namely, the king's footman, eleven shillings, the underkeeper of St. James's, ten shillings, the gardener, five shillings, to one Russell, groom of the king's great chamber, ten shillings, to the wardrobe, eleven shillings, the violins, ten shillings, a Frenchman that gave a book to her grace, ten shillings, the keeper of the park gate at St. James's, ten shillings. From another of Elizabeth's account books, in the possession of Gustavus Brander, Esquire, the antiquarian reparatory quotes the following additional items. Two French hoods, two pounds, nine shillings, nine pence, half a yard and two nails of velvet, four partlets, eighteen shillings, nine pence, paid to Edward Allen for a Bible, one pound, paid to the kings, Edward the Sixth, droner or bagpiper, and Pfeiffer, twenty shillings, to Mr. Haywood, thirty shillings, and to Sebastian, towards the charge of the children, with the carriage of the player's garments, four pounds, nineteen shillings. Paid to sundry persons at St. James's, her grace being there, nine pounds, fifteen shillings. To Beaumont, the king's servant, for his boys that played before her grace, ten shillings. In reward to certain persons, on the 10th of August, this was after Mary's accession, to former, who played on the lute, to Mr. Ashfield's servant, for two prize oxen and ten muttons, twenty shillings more, the harper, thirty shillings, to him that made her grace a table of walnut tree, forty-four shillings nine pence, to Mr. Caucus's servant, that brought her grace a sturgeon, six shillings eight pence, to my Lord Russell's minstrels, twenty shillings accounts of thomas perry cofferer of her household till october fifteen fifty three the last documentary record of elizabeth in the reign of edward the sixth is a letter addressed by her to the lords of the council relating to some of her landed property concerning which there was a dispute between her tenant smith and my lord privy seal the earl of bedford she complains of having been evilly handled by the minister though she denies taking part with Smith in the controversy against him. All she wishes is, she says, to enjoy her own right in quietness. She requests, in conclusion, her humble commendations to the king's majesty, for whose health, she says, I pray daily and daily, and evermore shall so do, during my life. At Hatfield, the last day of May, 1553. End of section 4Section 5 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 2, Part 2 On the morning of the 6th of July, Edward expired at Greenwich, but his death was kept secret for the purpose of securing the persons of his sisters, to both of whom, deceitful letters were written in his name by order of northumberland requiring them to hasten to england to visit him in his sickness the effect of this treacherous missive on mary her narrow escape and subsequent proceedings have been related in her memoir in the preceding volume of the lives of the queens of england elizabeth more wary or better informed of what was in agitation by some secret friend at court supposed to be cecil instead of obeying the guileful summons remained quietly at hatfield to watch the event this was presently certified to her by the arrival of commissioners from the duke of northumberland who after announcing the death of the young king and his appointment of lady jane grey for his successor offered her a large sum of money and a considerable grant of lands as the price of her acquiescence if she would make a voluntary secession of her own rights in the succession 
which she was in no condition to assert. Elizabeth, with equal wisdom and courage, replied, that they must first make their agreement with her elder sister, during whose lifetime she had no claim or title to resign. Letty assures us that she also wrote a letter of indignant expostulation to Northumberland on the wrong that had been done to her sister and herself by proclaiming his daughter-in-law queen. A fit of sickness, real, or as some have insinuated, feigned, preserved Elizabeth from the peril of taking any share in the contest for the crown. Her defenseless position and her proximity to the metropolis placed her in a critical predicament, and if by feigning illness she avoided being conducted to the tower by Northumberland's partisans, she acted as a wise woman, seeing that discretion is the better part of valor. But, sick or well, she preserved her integrity, and as soon as the news of her sister's successes reached her, she forgot her indisposition, and hastened to give public demonstrations of her loyalty and affection to her person, by going in state to meet and welcome her, on her triumphant progress to the metropolis. The general assertion of historians, that Elizabeth raised a military force for the support of Queen Mary, is erroneous, she was powerless in the first instance, and the popular outburst in favor of Mary rendered it needless after the first week's reign of the nine days queen was over. On the 29th of July, according to the Cottonian manuscript, quoted by Stripe, Elizabeth came riding from her seat in the country along Fleet Street to Somerset House, which now belonged to her, attended by 2,000 horse armed with spears, bows, and guns. In this retinue appeared Sir John Williams and Sir John Bridges, and her chamberlain, all being dressed in green, but their coats were faced with velvet, satin, taffeta, silk or cloth, according to their quality. This retinue of Elizabeth assumed a less warlike character on the morrow, when it appears that Mary had disbanded her armed militia. When Elizabeth rode through Aldgate next day, on her road to meet her sister, she was accompanied by a thousand persons on horseback, a great number of whom were ladies of rank. The royal sisters met at Wainstead, where Elizabeth and her train paid their first homage to Queen Mary, who received them very graciously, and kissed every lady presented by Elizabeth. On the occasion of Mary's triumphant entrance into London, the royal sisters rode side by side, in the grand equestrian procession, the youthful charms of Elizabeth, then in her twentieth year, the majestic grace of her tall and finely proportioned figure, attracted every eye, and formed a contrast, disadvantageous to Mary, who was nearly double her age, small in person, and faded prematurely by early sorrow, sickness, and anxiety. The pride and reserve of Mary's character would not allow her to condescend to the practice of any of those arts of courting popularity, in which Elizabeth, who rendered everything subservient to the master passion of her soul, ambition, was a practice adept. In every look, word, and action, Elizabeth studied effect, and on this occasion it was noticed that she took every opportunity of displaying the beauty of her hand, of which she was not a little vain. Within one little month after their public entrance into London, the evil spirits of the times had succeeded in rekindling the sparks of jealousy between the Catholic Queen and the Protestant heiress of the throne. That Mary, after all the mortifications that had been inflicted upon her at Elizabeth's birth, had had the magnanimity to regard her with sisterly feelings, is a fact that renders the divisions that were effected between them the more deeply to be regretted. When Mary, who had never dissembled her religious opinions, made known her intentions of restoring the Mass and all the ancient ceremonials that had been abolished by King Edward's council, the Protestants naturally took alarm. Symptoms of disaffection towards their new sovereign betrayed themselves, in the enthusiastic regard which they lavished on Elizabeth, who became the beacon of hope, to which the champions of the Reformation turned, as the horizon darkened around them. But it was not only on those to whom a sympathy in religious opinions endeared her, that Elizabeth had succeeded in making a favorable impression, for she was already so completely established as the darling of the people of England, that Pope Julius the Third, 
in one of his letters, adverting to the report made by his envoy, Commendioni, on the state of Queen Mary's government, says, That heretic and schismatic sister, formally substituted for her, Queen Mary, in the succession by their father, is in the heart and mouth of every one. The refusal of Elizabeth to attend Mass, while it excited the most lively feelings of admiration for her sincerity and courage among the Protestants, gave great offence to the Queen and her council, and the princess was sternly enjoined to conform to the Catholic rites. Elizabeth was resolute in her refusal. She even declined, under pretext of indisposition, being present at the ceremonial of making her kinsman Courtney an earl. This was construed into disrespect for the queen. Some of the more headlong zealots, by whom Mary was surrounded, recommended that she should be put under arrest. Mary refused to consent to a measure at once unpopular and unjustified, but endeavored, by alternate threats, persuasions, and promises, to prevail on her sister to accompany her to the chapel royal. The progress of the contest between the queen and her sister, on this case of conscience, is thus detailed by the French ambassador Noel, in a letter dated September 6th. Elizabeth will not hear mass, nor accompany her sister to the chapel, whatever remonstrance, either the queen or the lords on her side, have been able to make to her on this subject. It is feared that she is counseled in her obstinacy by some of the magnates, who are disposed to stir up fresh troubles. Last Saturday and Sunday, continues he, the queen caused her to be preached to, and entreated by all the great men of the council, one after the other, but their importunity only elicited from her, at last, a very rude reply. The queen was greatly annoyed by the firmness of Elizabeth, which promised to prove a serious obstacle to the restoration of papacy in England. The faction, that had attempted to sacrifice the rights of both the daughters of Henry the Eighth by proclaiming Lady Jane Grey queen, gathered hopes from the dissension between the royal sisters. Elizabeth, however, who had no intention of unsettling the recently established government of the sickly sovereign, to whom she was heir presumptive, when she found that it was suspected that her nonconformity proceeded from disaffection, demanded an audience with Queen Mary, and throwing herself on her knees before her, she told her, weeping at the same time, that she saw plainly how little affection her majesty appeared to have for her, and that she knew she had done nothing to offend her, except in the article of religion, in which she was excusable, having been brought up in the creed she at present professed, without having ever heard any doctor who could have instructed her in the other. She entreated the queen, therefore, to let her have some books, explanatory of doctrine, contrary to that set forth in the Protestant books, she had hitherto read, and she would commence a course of study, from works, composed expressly in defense of the Catholic creed, which, perhaps, might lead her to adopt other sentiments. She also requested to have some learned man appointed for her instructor. The queen received these overtures in a conciliatory spirit, and Elizabeth appeared with her at the celebration of Mass, on the 8th of September, a festival by which the Church of Rome commemorates the nativity of the Blessed Virgin. Griffith affirms that Elizabeth did this with a bad grace, and gave evident tokens of repugnance, but she voluntarily wrote to the Emperor Charles V, requesting him to send a cross, chalices, and other ecclesiastical ornaments for a chapel, which she intended, she said, to open in her own house. By these condescensions to expediency, Elizabeth succeeded for a time in maintaining her footing at court, and securing her proper place in the approaching ceremonials of the coronation, as next in rank to her sister the Queen. In the splendid pageant of the royal cavalcade, from the tower to Westminster on the preceding day, Elizabeth wore a French dress of white and silver tissue, and was seated with Anne of Cleves, her sometime stepmother, in a chariot drawn by six horses, trapped also with white and silver, which followed immediately after the gold canopied litter in which the sovereign was born. At the coronation, Elizabeth was again paired with the Lady Anne of Cleves, who had precedency over every other lady in court. These two princesses also dined at the same table with the queen at the banquet, 
an honor which was not vouchsafed to any other person there during all the festivities and royal pageants that succeeded the coronation mary gave public testimonials of respect and sisterly regard for elizabeth by holding her by the hand and placing her next to herself at table this noel notices that she did in particular at the great banquet given to the spanish ambassador and his suite elizabeth was also prayed for as the queen's sister by dr harpsfield at the opening of the convocation at westminster immediately after the coronation stripe who honestly narrates the fact complains that nothing was added in her commendation but this as she was opposed to the doctrines of the church of rome was scarcely to be expected from other divines neither were the deceitful terms of flattery which were conventionally used towards the members of the royal family of such importance to elizabeth as her public recognition by her sister's hierarchy and divines as the heiress presumptive to the throne this was of the greater moment to elizabeth because by the act which passed immediately after the meeting of mary's first parliament confirming the marriage of henry the eighth and catherine of aragon and establishing the legitimacy of the queen the subsequent marriage of henry with anne boleyn was rendered null and void and the birth of elizabeth illegitimate in point of law although from motives of decency as well as sound policy it was not declared so elizabeth was the darling of the people and as long as her reversionary claims to the regal succession were recognized by the reigning sovereign she stood beside the throne as a check to the plots of the aspiring house of suffolk on the one hand and the designs of the french party on the other lady jane grey was still living and unforgotten and henry the second of france treated his daughter-in-law the young queen of scots as the rightful sovereign of england on the plea that neither of the daughters of henry the eighth were legitimate their father had stigmatized the birth of both mary and elizabeth and the subservient parliament of june fifteen thirty six had in obedience to his unjust intention of preferring any future daughters that might be born to him by Jane Seymour or her successors, to the issue of Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn, formally declared the royal sisters illegitimate, and incapable of succeeding to the throne. The act for settling the succession in 1545, and the will of Henry the Eighth had indeed taken away the latter clause, but the declaration of illegitimacy remained unrepealed, and had been further insisted upon in the will of the late king edward the sixth by the exclusion of both princesses in favor of the granddaughter of the youngest sister of henry the eighth the experiment of placing a juvenile scion from a collateral branch of the royal family on the throne had been displeasing to the nation in general not only catholics but protestants had united in opposing so flagrant a violation of the old established laws of the regal succession in england the miseries caused by the wars of the roses had proved a salutary lesson on the danger of permitting a temporary alienation of the crown from the direct line of primogeniture and a mighty majority of the people had vested the sovereignty in the person of mary tudor according to the letter of her father's will the conditions of which she never violated with regard to elizabeth's reversionary claim to the succession so far the interests of elizabeth were united with those of her sister but when the act which established the legitimacy of the queen passed she and her friends took umbrage because it tacitly implied the fact that she was not born in lawful wedlock if elizabeth had acted with profound policy which marked her subsequent conduct she would not have called attention to this delicate point by evincing her displeasure but her pride was piqued and she demanded permission to withdraw from court it was refused and a temporary estrangement took place between her and the queen noel the french ambassador whose business it was to pave the way for the succession of the young queen of scots to the throne of england by the destruction of the present heiress presumptive fomented the differences between the royal sisters with fiend-like subtlety and satisfaction henry the second made the most liberal offers of money and advice to elizabeth while in fancy he exalted the idea of her disgrace and death 
and the recognition of his royal daughter-in-law as the future sovereign of the britannic isles from sea to sea under the matrimonial dominion of his eldest son the brilliancy of such a prospect rendered the french monarch and his ministers reckless of the restraints of honor conscience and humanity which might tend to impede its realization and elizabeth was marked out first as their puppet and finally as the victim of a plot which might possibly end in the destruction not only of one sister but both the protestant party alarmed at the zeal of queen mary for the re-establishment of the old catholic institutions and detesting the idea of her spanish marriage were easily excited to enter into any project for averting the evils they foresaw a plot was devised for raising the standard of revolt against queen mary's government in the joint names of the princess elizabeth and courtney earl of devonshire to whom they proposed to unite her in marriage that courtney who had been piqued at mary's decline to accept him for her husband entered into a confederacy which promised him a younger and more attractive royal bride with the prospect of a crown for her dowry there is no doubt though the romantic tales in which some modern historians have indulged touching his passion for elizabeth are somewhat apocryphal the assertion that he refused the proffered hand of mary on account of his disinterested preference for elizabeth is decidedly untrue it was not till convinced of the hopelessness of his suit to the queen that he allowed himself to be implicated in a political engagement to marry elizabeth who if consenting to the scheme appears to have been wholly a passive agent cautiously avoiding any personal participation in the confederacy till she saw how it was likely to end it is therefore difficult to say how far her heart was touched by the external graces of her handsome but weak-minded kinsman the difficulties of her position at this crisis were extreme distrusted by the queen watched and calumniated by the spanish ambassador renaud assailed by the misjudging enthusiasm of the protestant party with spiritual adulation and entreated to stand forth as the heroine of their cause and tempted by the persuasions and treacherous promises of the subtle noel it required caution and strength of mind seldom found in a girl of twenty not to fall into some of the snares which so thickly beset her path noel made his house a rendezvous for the discontented protestants and the disaffected of every description midnight conferences were held there at which courtney was a prominent person though the pusillanimity of his character rendered it difficult to stir him up to anything like open enterprise noel informed his court that though elizabeth and courtney were proper instruments for the purpose of exciting a popular rising courtney was so timorous that he would suffer himself to be taken before he would act the event proved the accuracy of this judgment by the dint however of great nursing the infant conspiracy began to assume a more decided form and as elizabeth could not be induced to unite herself openly with the confederates noel affirms that they intended to surprise and carry her away to marry her to courtney and conduct them into devonshire and cornwall where courtney had powerful friends they imagined that a general rising would take place in their favor in the west of england with a simultaneous revolt of the suffolk faction in the east and other parts where they greatly miscalculated the popular feeling against the queen elizabeth meantime perceiving the perils that beset her on the one hand from the folly of her injudicious friends and on the other from the malignity of her foes and alarmed at the altered manner of the queen towards her reiterated her entreaties to be permitted to retire to one of her houses in the country the leave was granted and the day for her departure actually fixed but the representations of the spanish minister that she was deeply engaged in plots against her majesty's government and that she only wished to escape from observation by withdrawing herself into the country in order to have the better opportunity of carrying on her intrigues with the disaffected caused queen mary to forbid her to quit the palace so much incensed was the queen at the reports that were daily brought to her of the disloyalty of elizabeth that she would not admit her to her presence and inflicted upon her the severe mortification of allowing the countess of lennox and the duchess of suffolk to take precedency of her 
Elizabeth then absented herself from the chapel royal, and confined herself to her own chamber, on which the queen forbade any of her ladies to visit her there without a special permission. So considerable, however, was the influence Elizabeth had already acquired among the female aristocracy of England, and so powerful was the sympathy excited for her at this period, that, in defiance of the royal mandate, all the young gentlewomen of the court visited her daily, and all day long in her chamber, and united in manifesting the most ardent affection for her. Elizabeth received these flattering tokens of regard, with answering warmth, in the vain hope that the strength of her party would place her on a more independent footing, but of course it only rendered her case worse, by exciting jealousy and provoking anger. She was sedulously watched by the council, spies in her own household made almost hourly reports of all her movements, and every visit she received. By one of these traitors, information was conveyed to Mary's ministers, that a refugee French preacher had secret interviews with her, on which the Spanish ambassador advised that she should be sent to the tower. Renaud also charged Noël, the French ambassador, with holding private nocturnal conferences with the princess in her own chamber. This Noël angrily denied, and a violent altercation took place between the two diplomatists on the subject. Two of the queen's ministers, Paget and Arundel, then waited on Elizabeth, and informed her of the accusation. She found no difficulty in disproving a charge, of which she was really innocent, and with some emotion expressed her gratitude, for not having been condemned unheard, and entreated them, never to give credit to the calumnies, that might hereafter be circulated against her, without allowing her an opportunity of justifying herself. The queen, after this explanation, as a pledge of her reconciliation with Elizabeth, presented her with a double set of large and valuable pearls, and having granted her permission to retire into the country, dismissed her with tokens of respect and affection. It was in the beginning of December that Elizabeth obtained the long-delayed leave from her royal sister to retire to her own house at Ashridge in Buckinghamshire, but even there a jealous watch was kept on all her movements and those of her servants. Never had captive bird panted more to burst from the thraldom of a cage than she to escape from the painful restraints and restless intrigues of the court, where she was one day threatened with a prison, and the next flattered with the prospect of a crown, but the repose for which she sighed was far remote. Instead of enjoying the peaceful pursuits of learning, or sylvan sports, in her country abode, she was harassed with a matrimonial proposal, which had been suggested to Mary by the Spanish cabinet, in behalf of the Prince of Piedmont. It was not being considered expedient for the Queen to solemnize her unpopular nuptials with Philip of Spain, till Elizabeth was wedded to a foreign husband. Elizabeth resolutely refused to listen to the pretensions of the Prince of Piedmont, and she also declined the overtures that were privately renewed to her by the king of Denmark, in favor of his son, whom she had refused during her brother's reign. In all the trials, mortifications, and perplexities which surrounded her, she kept her eyes steadily fixed on the bright reversion of the crown of England, and positively refused to marry out of the realm, even when the only alternative appeared to be a foreign husband, or a scaffold. The sarcastic proverb, defend me from my friends, and I will take care of my foes, was never more fully exemplified in the case of Elizabeth, during the first year of her sister's reign, for an army of declared enemies would have been less perilous to her than the insidious caresses of the King of France and his ambassador. Henry wrote to her letters, with unbounded offers of assistance and protection, and he advanced just enough money to the conspirators, to involve them in the odium of receiving bribes from France, without bearing the slightest proportion to their wants. He endeavored to persuade Elizabeth to take refuge in his dominions, but if she had fallen into such a snare, she would have found herself in much the same situation as Mary Queen of Scots was, when she sought an asylum in her realm. The only result of this correspondence was, that it involved Elizabeth in the greatest peril, when letters in cipher, supposed to be from her in reply to Henry, were intercepted. On the 21st of January, 1553-54, to 54, 
gardiner drew from the weak or treacherous courtney the secrets of the confederacy of which he was to have been the leader and the hero the conspirators on the following day learned that they had been betrayed and found themselves under the fatal necessity of anticipating their plans by taking up arms wyatt immediately sent to elizabeth an earnest recommendation to retire from the vicinity of the metropolis young russell the son of the earl of bedford who was a secret member of the confederacy was the bearer of the letter and it seems that he was the agent through whom all communications between wyatt and her were carried on sir james crofts also saw and urged her to adopt this plan elizabeth perceived her peril and determined not to take any step that might be construed into an overt act of treason she knew the weak and unsteady elements of which the confederacy was composed courtney had proven a broken reed and of all people in the world she had the least reason to place confidence in either the wisdom the firmness or the integrity of the duke of suffolk who would of course if successful endeavor to replace his daughter lady jane grey on the throne common sense must have convinced elizabeth that he could have no other motive for his participation in the revolt it was probably her very apprehension of such a result that led this suspicious princess into an incipient acquiescence in the conspiracy that she might obtain positive information as to the real nature of their projects so that if she found them hostile to her own interests the power of denouncing the whole affair to the queen would be in her own hands under any circumstances elizabeth would have found a straightforward path the safest letters addressed to her by the french ambassador and also by wyatt were intercepted by queen mary's ministers russell was placed under arrest and confessed that he had been the medium of secret correspondence with the leaders of the confederacy and elizabeth wyatt unfurled the standard of revolt on the twenty fifth of january and the queen sent her royal mandate to elizabeth on the twenty sixth enjoining her immediate return to court where however she assured her she would be heartily welcome elizabeth mistrusted the invitation and took to her bed sending a verbal message to the queen that she was too ill at present to travel that as soon as she was able she would come and prayed her majesty's forbearance for a few days after the lapse of several days the officers of elizabeth's household addressed a letter to her majesty's council to explain that increased indisposition on the part of their mistress was the sole cause that prevented her from repairing to the queen's highness and though they continued in hope of her amendment they saw no appearance of it and therefore they considered it their duty considering the perilous attempts of the rebels to apprise their lordships of her state mary received this excuse and waited for the coming of elizabeth till the tenth of february during that eventful fortnight a formidable insurrection had broken out of which the ostensible object was the dethronement of the queen and the elevation of elizabeth to the regal office the french and venetian ambassadors had both intrigued with the disaffected and supplied them with money and arms mary had been attacked in her own palace by wyatt's army of insurgents she had quelled the insurrection and proceeded to measures of great severity to deter her factious subjects from further attempts to disturb the public peace terror was stricken into every heart when it was known that a warrant was issued for the immediate execution of lady jane grey and her husband wyatt and others of the confederates with the view of escaping the penalty of their own rash attempts basely denounced elizabeth and courtney as the exciters of the treasonable designs that had deluged the metropolis with blood and shaken the throne of mary elizabeth had fortified her house meantime and introduced an armed force within her walls probably for a defence against the partisans of lady jane grey but of course her enemies and the spanish party insisted that it was intended as a defiance of the royal authority the queen who had every reason to distrust her loyalty then dispatched lord william howard sir edward hastings and sir thomas cornwallis to bring her to court with these gentlemen she sent her own physicians dr owen and dr wendy to ascertain whether elizabeth was really able to bear the journey now dr wendy to his honour be it remembered was instrumental in the preservation of queen catherine parr's life 
by the prudent counsel he gave her at the time of her extreme peril, and also, as it has been supposed, by acting as a mediator between her and King Henry. He had known Elizabeth from her childhood, and his appearance would rather have had the effect of inspiring her with hope and confidence than terror. Be that as it may, he and his coadjutor decided that she might be removed without peril of her life. The three commissioners then required an audience of the princess, who, guessing their errand, no doubt, refused to see them, and when they entered the chamber, it being past ten o'clock at night, she said, Is the haste such, that it might not have pleased you to come in the morning? They made answer, That they were sorry to see her grace in such a state. And I, replied she, am not glad to see you at this time of night. This little dialogue, which rests on the authority of Hollingshed, is characteristic, and likely enough to have taken place, although it is not mentioned in the following letter of the commissioners to the queen. We are, however, to bear in mind that Elizabeth's great-uncle, Lord William Howard, who appears to have been the leading man on the occasion, would scarcely have related any speech on the part of his young kinswoman, likely to have been construed by the queen and her council as an act of contumacy. On the contrary, he describes Elizabeth as using the most dutiful and compliant expressions, only fearful of encountering the fatigue of a journey in her weak state. Any one, from his report, would have imagined her to be the meekest and gentlest of all invalids. The Lord Admiral, Lord William Howard, Sir Edward Hastings, and Sir Thomas Cornwallis, to the Queen. In our humble wives, it may please your highness to be advertised, that yesterday, immediately upon our arrival at Ashridge, we required to have access unto my Lady Elizabeth's grace, which obtained, we delivered unto her your highness's letter, and I, the Lord Admiral, declared the effect of your highness's pleasure, according to the credence given to us, being before advertised of her state, by your highness's physicians, by whom we did perceive the state of her body to be such, that, without danger to her person, we might well proceed to require her, in your majesty's name, all excuses set apart, to repair to your highness, with all convenient speed and diligence. Whereunto, we found her grace very willing and conformable, save only that, she much feared her weakness to be so great, that she should not be able to travel, and to endure the journey without peril of life, and therefore desired some longer respite, until she had better recovered her strength. But in conclusion, upon the persuasion, as much of us, as of her own counsel and servants, whom we assure your highness we have found very ready and forward to the accomplishment of your highness's pleasure in this behalf she is resolved to remove hence to-morrow towards your highness with such journeys as by a paper herein enclosed your highness shall perceive further declaring to your highness that her grace much desireth if it might stand with your highness's pleasure that she might have a lodging at her coming to court somewhat further from the water that is the Thames, than she had at her last being there, which your physicians, considering the state of her body, thinketh very meet, who have travailed, or taken great pains, very earnestly with her grace, both before our coming and after, in this matter. And after her first day's journey, one of us shall await upon your highness, so declare more at large, the whole state of our proceedings here, and even so, we shall most humbly beseech Christ, long to preserve your highness in honour, health, and the contentation of your godly heart's desire. From Ashridge, the 11th of February, at four of the clock in the afternoon, your highness's most humble and bounden servants and subjects, W. Howard, Edward Hastings, T. Cornwallis. The paper enclosed, sketching the plan of their progress to London, a document of no slight importance, considering the falsified statement which has been embodied in history, is as follows. The order of my Lady Elizabeth's Grace's voyage to the court. Monday, in primus to Mr. Cook's, six miles. Tuesday, item, to Mr. Pope's, eight miles. Wednesday, to Mr. Stamford's, seven miles. Thursday, to Highgate, Mr. Comely's house, seven miles. Friday, to Westminster, 
five miles. Such is the official report of Elizabeth's maternal kinsman, Lord William Howard, attested by the signatures of two other noble gentlemen. Motives of worldly interest, to say nothing of the ties of nature, would have inclined Lord William Howard to cherish and support, as far as he could with safety to himself, an heiress presumptive to the crown, so nearly connected in blood with his own illustrious house. He was the brother of her grandmother, Lady Elizabeth Howard, and in the probable event of Queen Mary's death without issue, it was only reasonable for this veteran statesman to calculate on directing the counsels of his youthful niece, and exercising the executive power of the crown. He was a man whom Elizabeth both loved and honored, and she testified her grateful remembrance of his kindness after her accession to the crown. If Mary had intended Elizabeth to be treated as barbarously as Fox has represented, she would have selected some other agent for the minister of her cruelty. End of section 5section six of lives of the queens of england volume six by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain elizabeth chapter two part three the letter of the commissioners to the queen is dated february eleventh which was a sunday contrary to the assertions of fox and hollingshed they remained at ashridge the whole of that day and night and it was not till Monday morning, the 12th, that they proceeded to remove Elizabeth. It was the day appointed for the execution of the Lady Jane Grey and Lord Guilford Dudley, and even the strong mind and lion-like spirit of Elizabeth must have quailed at the appalling nature of her own summons to the metropolis, and the idea of commencing her journey in so ominous an hour. Thrice she was near fainting as she was led between two of her escort, to the royal litter which the queen had sent for her accommodation her bodily weakness or some other cause appears to have caused a deviation from the original program of the journey for the places where she halted were not the same as those specified by the commissioners in their letter to the queen she reached redburn in a feeble condition the first night on the second she rested at sir ralph rollett's house at st albans on the third, at Mr. Dodd's, at Meems. On the fourth, at Highgate, where she remained at Mr. Chomley's house, a night and day, according to Hollinshed, but most probably it was longer, as she did not enter London till the 23rd of February. And Noel, in a letter dated the 21st, makes the following report of her condition to his own court. While the city is covered with gibbets, and the public buildings crowded with the heads of the bravest men in the kingdom, who, by the by, had given but an indifferent sample of their valor. The Princess Elizabeth, for whom no better fate is foreseen, is lying ill, about seven or eight miles from hence, so swollen and disfigured that her death is expected. He expresses doubts, whether she would reach London alive. Notwithstanding this piteous description of her sufferings and prospects, His Excellency, in another place, calls the indisposition of Elizabeth, a favorable illness, and the phrase has led some persons into the notion that her sickness was feigned for the purpose of exciting popular sympathy, but he certainly means merely to intimate that it occurred at a seasonable time for her, and was probably the means of saving her from the same punishment that had just been inflicted on her youthful kinswoman, Lady Jane Grey. That Elizabeth was suffering severely, both in mind and body, at this terrific crisis, there can be no doubt and if she made the most of her illness to gain time, and delay her approach to the dreaded scene of blood and horror, which the metropolis presented, in consequence of the recent executions, no one can blame her. But when the moment came for her public entrance into London, as a prisoner of state, her firmness returned, and the spirit of the royal heroine triumphed, over the weakness of the invalid, and the terrors of the woman." Her deportment on that occasion is thus finely described by an eyewitness who thirsted for her blood, Simon Renaud, the Spanish ambassador, in a letter to her great enemy, the Emperor Charles V, dated February 24, 1554. 
the lady elizabeth says he arrived here yesterday dressed all in white surrounded with a great company of the queen's people besides her own attendants she made them uncover the litter in which she rode that she might be seen by the people her countenance was pale and stern her mien proud lofty and disdainful by which she endeavoured to conceal her trouble a hundred gentlemen in velvet coats formed a sort of guard of honour for elizabeth on this occasion next her person and they were followed by a hundred more in coats of fine red cloth guarded with black velvet this was probably the royal livery the road on both sides the way from highgate to london was thronged with gazing crowds some of whom wept and bewailed her it must indeed have been a pageant of most tragic interest considering the excited state of the public mind for suffolk had been executed that morning and it was only eleven days since the young lovely and interesting lady jane grey had been brought to the block many persons in that crowd remembered the execution of elizabeth's mother queen anne boleyn not quite seventeen years ago and scarcely anticipated a better fate for her whom they now saw conducted through their streets a guarded captive having arrayed herself in white robes emblematic of innocence her youth her pallid cheek and searching glance appealed to them for sympathy and it might be for succour but neither arm nor voice was raised in her defence in all that multitude and this accounts for the haughty and scornful expression which renaud observed in her countenance as she gazed upon them perhaps she thought with sarcastic bitterness of the familiar proverb a little help is worth a deal of pity the cavalcade passed through smithfield and fleet street to whitehall between four and five in the afternoon and entered the palace through the garden whatever might be her inward alarm elizabeth assumed an intrepid bearing her cheek was pale but resolved and high were the words of her lip and the glance of her eye she boldly protested her innocence and demanded an interview with her sister the queen on the plea of mary's previous promise never to condemn her unheard mary declined seeing her and she was conducted to a quarter of the palace at westminster from which neither she nor her servants could go out without passing through the guards six ladies two gentlemen and four servants of her own retinue were permitted to remain in attendance on her person the rest of her train were sent into the city of london and lodged there it was on the fidelity and moral courage of these persons that the life of elizabeth depended and it is certain that several of them were implicated in the conspiracy courtney her affianced husband had been arrested on the twelfth of february in the house of the earl of sussex and was safely lodged in the bell tower and subjected to daily examinations he had previously given tokens of weakness and want of principle sufficient to fill every one with whom he had been politically connected with apprehension yet he seems to have acted honourably with regard to elizabeth for none of his admissions tended to implicate her nothing could be more agonizing than the state of suspense in which for three weeks elizabeth remained at whitehall while her fate was debated by her sister's privy council fortunately for her this body was agitated with jealousies and divided interests one party relentlessly urged the expediency of putting her to death and argued against the folly of sparing a traitoress who had entered into plots with foreign powers against her queen and country lord arundel and lord paget were the advocates of these ruthless counsels which however really emanated from the emperor charles v who considered elizabeth in the light of a powerful rival to the title of the bride-elect of his son philip and he laboured for her destruction in the same spirit that his grandfather ferdinand had made the execution of the unfortunate earl of warwick one of the secret articles of the marriage treaty of catherine of aragon and arthur prince of wales besides this political animosity charles entertained a personal hatred to elizabeth because she was the daughter of anne boleyn whose fatal charms had been the cause of so much evil to his beloved aunt bishop gardiner who was at that time opposed to the spanish party acted in this instance as the friend of elizabeth and courtney he contended that there was no proof of a treasonable correspondence between them during the late insurrections alleging the residence of courtney in the queen's household at st james's palace 
and Elizabeth's dangerous sickness at Ashridge, as reasons why they were not, and could not have been, actually engaged in acts of treason, whatever might have been their intentions. In this matter, Gardner acted in the true spirit of a modern politician. He threw all the weight of his powerful talents and influence into the scale of mercy and justice, not for the sake of the good cause he advocated, but because it afforded him an opportunity of contending with his rivals on vantage ground. The murderous policy of Spain is thus shamelessly avowed by Renaud in one of his letters to his imperial master. The queen, he says, is advised to send her, Elizabeth, to the tower, since she is accused by Wyatt, named in the letters of the French ambassador, and suspected by her own counsel, and it is certain that the enterprise was undertaken in her favor. Assuredly, sire, if they do not punish her and Courtney, now that the occasion offers, the queen will never be secure, for I doubt that if she leaves her in the tower, when she goes to meet the parliament, some treasonable means will be found to deliver her or Courtney, or perhaps both, and then the last error will be worse than the first. The council was in possession of two notes addressed to Elizabeth by Wyatt, the first advising her to remove to Donnington, which was close to their headquarters. The second, after her neglecting to obey the queen's summons to court, informing her of his victorious entry into Southwark. Three dispatches of Noel to his own government had been intercepted and deciphered, which revealed all the plans of the conspirators in her favor. Noel, too, and that made the matter worse, had married one of her maids of honor, which circumstance, of course, afforded a direct facility for more familiar intercourse than otherwise could publicly have taken place between the disaffected heiress of the crown and the representative of a foreign power. In addition to these presumptive evidences, a letter, supposed to have been written by her to the King of France, had fallen into the hands of the Queen. The Duke of Suffolk, doubtless with a view to the preservation of his own daughter, Lady Jane Grey, had declared that the object of the conspiracy was the dethronement of the queen and the elevation of elizabeth to her place wyatt acknowledged that he had written more than one letter to elizabeth and charged courtney face to face with having first suggested the rebellion sir james crofts confessed that he had conferred with elizabeth and solicited her to retire to donnington lord russell that he had privately conveyed letters to her from wyatt and another prisoner that he had been privy to a correspondence between Carew and Courtney respecting the intended marriage between the nobleman and the princess. In short, a more disgusting series of treachery and cowardice never was exhibited than on this occasion, and if it be true that there is honor among thieves, that is to say, an observance of good faith towards each other in time of peril, it is certain nothing of the kind was to be found among these confederates, who respectively endeavored, by the denunciation of their associates, to shift the penalty of their mutual offenses to their fellows in misfortune. Wyatt's first confession was, that the Sieur Diossi, when he passed through England into Scotland, with the French ambassador to that country, spoke to Sir James Crofts, to persuade him to prevent the marriage of Queen Mary, with the heir of Spain, to raise Elizabeth to the throne, marry her to Courtney, and put the queen to death. He also confessed the promised aid that was guaranteed by the King of France to the Confederates, and the projected invasions from France and Scotland. We have this morning, writes Mr. Secretary Bourne, travailed with Sir Thomas Wyatt, touching the Lady Elizabeth and her servant, Sir William St. Lo, and your Lordship shall understand that Wyatt affirmeth his former sayings, or depositions, and says further, that Sir James Crofts knoweth more, if he be sent for and examined. Whereupon, Crofts had been called before us and examined, and confesseth with Wyatt, charging St. Lo with like matter, and further, as we shall declare unto your said lordships. Wherefore, under your correction, we think necessary, and beseech you to send for Mr. St. Lo, and to examine him, or cause him to be sent hither by us to be examined. Crofts is plain, and will tell all. The Spanish ambassador, in his report to the emperor, dated March 1st, affirms that Crofts had confessed the truth in a written deposition, and admitted, in plain terms, the intrigues of the French ambassador with the heretics and rebels. 
but this deposition has been vainly sought for in the state paper office great pains were taken by the spanish faction to incense the queen to the death against elizabeth renaud even presumed to intimate that her betrothed husband don philip would not venture his person in england till elizabeth and courtney were executed and endeavoured by every sort of argument to tempt her to hasten her own marriage by the sacrifice of their lives irritated as mary was against both she could not resolve on shedding her sister's blood she told the subtle statesman that she should act as the law decided on the evidences of their guilt but that the prisoners whose guilt had actually been proved should be executed before she left her metropolis to open her parliament which was summoned to meet at oxford she was in great perplexity in what manner to dispose of elizabeth for her own security before she herself departed from london and she asked the lords of her council one by one if either of them would take charge of that lady they all declined the perilous responsibility and then the stern resolution was adopted of sending her to the tower after a stormy debate in council on the justifiableness of such a measure the truth was gardiner finding himself likely to be left in a minority by his powerful rivals in the cabinet succumbed to their wishes and instead of opposing the motion supported it and kept his chancellorship for a temporary reconciliation was then effected between him and the leaders of the spanish faction arundel paget and petre of which the blood of elizabeth was the intended cement from the moment this trimming statesman abandoned the liberal policy he had for a brief few months advocated he shamed not to become the most relentless and determined of those who sought to bring the royal maiden to the block on the friday before palm sunday he with nine more of the council came into her presence and there charged her both with wyatt's conspiracy and the rising lately made in the west by sir peter carew and others and told her it was the queen's pleasure that she should be removed to the tower the name of this doleful prison which her own mother and more recently her cousin lady jane grey had found their next step to the scaffold filled her with dismay i trust said she that her majesty will be far more gracious than to commit to that place a true and most innocent woman that never has offended her in thought word or deed she then entreated the lords to intercede for her with the queen which some of them compassionately promised to do and testified much pity for her case about an hour after four of them namely gardiner the lord steward the lord treasurer and the earl of sussex returned with an order to discharge all her attendants except her gentleman usher three gentlewomen and two grooms of her chamber hitherto elizabeth had been in the honourable keeping of the lord chamberlain no other than her uncle lord william howard and sir john gage but now that a sterner policy was adopted a guard was placed in the two ante-rooms leading to her chamber two lords with an armed force in the hall and two hundred northern white coats in the garden to prevent all possibility of rescue or escape the next day the earl of sussex and another lord of the council announced to her that a barge was in readiness to convey her to the tower and she must prepare to go as the tide served which would tarry for no one this intimation seems to have inspired elizabeth with a determination to outstay it since the delay of every hour was important to her whose fate hung on a balance so nicely poised she implored to see the queen her sister and that request being denied she then entreated for permission to write to her this was peremptorily refused by one of the noblemen who told her that he durst not suffer it neither in his opinion was it convenient but the earl of sussex whose generous nature was touched with manly compassion bent his knee before her and told her she should have liberty to write her mind and swore as he was a true man he would himself deliver it to the queen whatsoever came of it and bring her back the answer elizabeth then addressed with the earnest eloquence of despair the following moving letter to her royal sister taking good care not to bring it to a conclusion till the tide had ebbed so far as it rendered it impossible to shoot the bridge with a barge that turn the lady elizabeth to the queen if ever did try this old saying that a king's word was more than another man's oath i must humbly beseech your majesty to verify it in me 
and to remember your last promise, and my last demand, that I be not condemned without answer and due proof, which it seems that I now am, for without cause proved, I am by your counsel from you commanded, to go to the tower, a place more wanted for a false traitor than a true subject, which though I know I deserve it not, yet in the face of all this realm it appears proved, I pray to God, I may die the shamefulest death that any ever died, if I may mean any such thing, and to this present hour I protest before God, who shall judge my truth whatsoever malice shall devise, that I never practised, counselled, nor consented to anything that might be prejudicial to your person any way, or dangerous to the state by any means, and therefore I humbly beseech your majesty to let me answer afore yourself, and not suffer me to trust your counsellors, yea, and that afore I go to the tower, if it be possible, if not, before I be further condemned. Howbeit, I trust assuredly that your highness will give me leave to do it afore I go, that thus shamefully I may not be cried out on, as I shall now be, and yea, that without cause. Let conscience move your highness to pardon this my boldness, which innocency procures me to do, together with hope of your natural kindness, which I trust will not see me cast away without desert, which what it is, her desert. I would desire no more of God, but that I truly knew, but which thing I think and believe, you shall never by report know, unless by yourself you hear. I have heard of many in my time cast away, for want of coming to the presence of their prince, and in late days I heard my lord of Somerset say, that if his brother had been suffered to speak with him, he had never suffered, but persuasions were made to him so great, that he was brought in belief, that he could not safely live if the admiral, Lord Thomas Seymour, lived, and that made him give consent to his death. Though these persons are not to be compared to your majesty, yet I pray God, the like evil persuasions persuade not one sister against the other, and all, for that they have heard false report, and the truth not known. Therefore, once again, kneeling with humbleness of heart, because I am not suffered to bow the knees of my body, I humbly crave to speak with your highness, which I would not be so bold as to desire, if I knew not myself most clear, as I know myself most true. And as for the traitor Wyatt, he might perventure, write me a letter, but on my faith I never received any from him. And as for the copy of the letter sent to the French king, I pray God confound me eternally, if ever I sent him word, message, token, or letter, by any means, and this truth I will stand in till my death. Your Highness's most faithful subject, that hath been from the beginning, and will be to my end, Elizabeth. I humbly crave but only one word of answer from yourself. This letter, written as has been shown, on the spur of the moment, possesses more perspicuity and power than any other composition from the pen of Elizabeth. She had not time to hammer out artificial sentences, so completely entangled with far-fetched metaphors and pedantic quotations, that a commentator is required to construe every one of her ambiguous paragraphs. No such ambiguity is used here, where she pleads for her life in good earnest, and in unequivocal language appeals boldly, from the inimical privy council to her sister's natural affection, and the event proved in the end that she did not appeal in vain. Yet her majesty showed no symptoms of relenting, at the time it was delivered, being exceedingly angry with Sussex for having lost the tide, and, according to Renaud, she rated her counsel soundly for having presumed to deviate from the instructions she had issued. The next tide did not serve till midnight, misgivings were felt, lest some project were in agitation among her friends and confederates, to effect a rescue under cover of the darkness. And so it was decided that they would defer her removal till the following day. This was Palm Sunday, and the council considered that it would be the safest plan to have the princess conveyed to the tower by water during the time of morning service, and on that account the people were strictly enjoined to carry their palms to church. Sussex and the Lord Treasurer were with Elizabeth soon after nine o'clock that morning, and informed her that the time was now come, that her grace must away with them to the tower. She replied, The Lord's will be done. I am contented, seeing as it is the Queen's pleasure. 
yet as she was conducted through the garden to the barge she turned her eyes towards every window in the lingering hope as it was thought of seeing some one who would espouse her cause and finding herself disappointed in this she passionately exclaimed i marvel what the nobles mean by suffering me a prince to be led into captivity the lord knoweth wherefore for myself i do not her escort hurried her to the barge being anxious to pass the shores of london at a time when they would be least likely to attract attention but in their efforts not to be too late they were too early for the tide had not risen sufficiently high to allow the barge to shoot the bridge where the fall of the water was so great that the experienced boatmen declined attempting it the peers urged them to proceed and they lay hovering upon the water in extreme danger for a time and at length their caution was overpowered by the imperative orders of the two noblemen who insisted on their passing the arch they reluctantly essayed to do so and struck the stern of the barge against the starling and not without great difficulty and much peril succeeded in clearing it not one perhaps of the anxious spectators who from the houses which at that time overhung the bridge beheld the jeopardy of that boat's company suspected the quality of the pale girl whose escape from a watery grave must have elicited an ejaculation of thanksgiving from many a kindly heart elizabeth objected to being landed at the traitor's gate neither well could she unless she should step into the water over her shoe she said one of the lords told her she must not choose and as it was then raining offered her his cloak she dashed it from her with a good dash says our author and as she set her foot on the stairs exclaimed here lands as true a subject being prisoner as ever landed at these stairs before thee o god i speak it having no other friend but thee alone to which the nobles who escorted her replied if it were so it was the better for her when she came to the gate a number of the warders and servants belonging to the tower were drawn up in rank and some of them as she passed knelt and prayed god to preserve her grace for which they were afterwards reprimanded instead of passing through the gates to which she had been thus conducted elizabeth seated herself on a cold damp stone with the evident intention of not entering a prison which had proved so fatal to her race bridges the lieutenant of the tower said to her madam you had best come out of the rain for you sit unwholesomely better sit here than in a worse place she replied for god knoweth not i whither you will bring me on hearing these words her gentleman usher burst into a passion of weeping which she perceiving chid him for his weakness in thus giving way to his feelings and discouraging her whom he ought rather to comfort and support especially knowing her truth to be such that no man had any cause to weep for her when however she was inducted into the apartment appointed for her confinement and the doors made fast upon her with locks and bolts she was sore dismayed but called for her book and gathering the sorrowful remnant of her servants round her begged them to unite with her in prayer for the divine protection and succour meantime the lords of the council who had brought her to the tower proceeded to deliver their instructions to the authorities there for her safe keeping but when some measure of unnecessary rigour was suggested by one of the commissioners the earl of sussex who appears to have been thoroughly disgusted with the ungracious office that had been put upon him and the unmanly conduct of his associates sternly admonished them in these words let us take heed my lords that we go not beyond our commission for she was our king's daughter and is we know the prince next in blood wherefore let us so deal with her now that we have not if it so happen to answer for our dealings hereafter end of section six section seven of lives of the queens of england volume six by agnes and elizabeth strickland this LibriVox recording is in the public domain elizabeth chapter three part one it was on the eighteenth of march that elizabeth was lodged in the tower and she was soon afterwards subjected to a rigorous examination by the lord chancellor gardiner with nine other of the lords of the council 
they questioned her on her motives for her projected remove to donnington castle during the late insurrection elizabeth being taken by surprise allowed her natural propensity for dissimulation to betray her into the childish evocation of affecting to be unconscious that she had such a house as donnington when sir james crofts was brought in and confronted with her she recollected herself and said as touching my remove to donnington my officers and you sir james crofts being then present can well testify whether any rash or unbeseeming word did then pass my lips which might not have well become a faithful and loyal subject thus adjured sir james crofts knelt to her and said he was heartily sorry to be brought in that day to be a witness against her grace but he took god to record that he never knew anything of her worthy the least suspicion my lords said elizabeth methinks you do me wrong to examine every mean prisoner against me if they have done evil let them answer for it i pray you join me not with such offenders touching my remove from ashridge to donnington i do remember me that mr hoby mine officers and you sir james crofts had some talk about it but what is that to the purpose might i not my lords go to mine own houses at all times whereupon the lord of arundel kneeling down observed that her grace said the truth and that himself was sorry to see her troubled about such vain matters well my lords rejoined she you sift me narrowly but you can do no more than god hath appointed unto whom i pray to forgive you all this generous burst of feeling on the part of the earl of arundel must have had a startling effect on all present for he had been foremost in the death cry against elizabeth and had urged the queen to bring her to trial and execution blinded by the malignant excitement of party feeling he had doubtless so far deceived himself as to regard such a measure as a stern duty to the nation at large in order to prevent future insurrections by sacrificing one person for the security of mary's government but when he saw and heard the young defenceless woman whom he and his colleagues had visited in her lonely prison room to browbeat and to entangle in her talk his heart smote him for the cruel part he had taken and he yielded to the generous impulse which prompted him to express his conviction of her innocence and his remorse for the injurious treatment to which she was subjected so powerful was the reaction of his feelings on this occasion that he not only labored as strenuously for the preservation of elizabeth as he had hitherto done for her destruction but even went so far as to offer his heir to her for a husband and subsequently made her a tender of his own hand and became one of the most persevering of her wooers it is to be feared that elizabeth then in the bloom of youth and very fairly endowed by nature exerted all her fascinations to entangle the heart of this stern pillar of her sister's throne in the perplexities of a delusive passion for herself that the royal coquette indulged the stately old earl with deceitful hopes appears evident by the tone he assumed towards her after her accession to the throne and his jealousy of his handsome audacious rival robert dudley but of this hereafter elizabeth's confinement in the tower was at first so rigorous that she was not permitted to see any one but the servants who had been selected by the council to wait upon her a service fraught with danger even to those who were permitted to perform it as for the other members of her household several were in prison and one of these edmund tremaine was subjected to the infliction of torture in the vain attempt to extort evidence against her before elizabeth had been two days in the tower the use of english prayers and protestant rites was prohibited and she was required to hear mass one of her ladies mrs elizabeth sands refused to attend that service on which her father brought abbot feckenham to persuade her to it but as she continued firm in her resistance she was dismissed from her office and another lady mrs coldburn appointed in her stead another of elizabeth's ladies the beautiful isabella markham who was just married to sir john harrington was also sequestered from her service 
on account of her heretical opinions and committed to a prison lodging in the tower with her husband whose offence was having conveyed a letter to the princess this misdemeanor however appears to have been committed as far back as the second year of edward the sixth if we may judge from the allusions harrington makes to his former master the lord admiral thomas seymour in the spirited letter of remonstrance which he addressed to gardiner on the subject of his imprisonment and that of his wife nothing can afford a more beautiful picture of the attachment subsisting between the captive princess and these faithful adherents than this letter which is written in the fearless spirit of a true knight and noble-minded gentleman my lord this mine humble prayer doth come with much sorrow for any deed of evil that have been done to your lordship but alas i know of none save such duty to the lady elizabeth as i am bounden to pay her at all times and if this matter breedeth in you such wrath towards her and me i shall not in this mine imprisonment repent thereof my wife is her servant and doth but rejoice in this our misery when we look with whom we are holden in bondage our gracious king henry did ever advance our family's good estate as did his pious father aforetime wherefore our service is in remembrance of such good kindness albeit there needeth none other cause to render our tendance sith the lady elizabeth beareth such piety and godly affection to all virtue consider that your lordship aforetime hath combated with much like affliction why then should not our state cause you to recount the same and breed pity to usward mine poor lady hath greater cause to wail than we of such small degree but her rare example affordeth comfort to us and shameth our complaint why then my lord must i be thus annoyed for one deed of special good will to the lady elizabeth in bearing a letter sent from one that had such right to give me his commands and to one who had such right to all mine hearty service may god incline you to amend all this cruelty and ever and anon turn our prayer in good and merciful consideration my lord admiral seymour did truly win my love amidst this hard and deadly annoyance now may the same like pity touch your heart and deal us better usage his service was ever joyful and why must this be afflicting mine ancient kindred have ever held their duty and liege obeisance nor will i do them such dishonour as may blot out their worthy deeds but will ever abide in all honesty and love if you should give ear to my complaint it will bind me to thankfully repay this kindness but if not we will continue to suffer and rest ourselves in god whose mercy is sure and safe and all true love to her the princess elizabeth who doth honour us in tender sort and scorneth not to shed her tears with ours i commend your lordship to god's appointment and rest sorely afflicted john harrington from the tower fifteen fifty four the above interesting letter is the more valuable because it affords the testimony of the accomplished writer as to the personal deportment of elizabeth among her own immediate friends during their mutual imprisonment in the tower sir john harrington the younger says that his parents had not any comfort to beguile their affliction but the sweet words and sweeter deeds of their mistress and fellow prisoner the princess elizabeth in after years elizabeth herself told castanot the french ambassador when adverting to this period that she was in great danger of losing her life from the displeasure her sister had conceived against her in consequence of the accusations that were fabricated on the subject of her correspondence with the king of france and having no hope of escaping she desired to make her sister only one request which was that she might have her head cut off with a sword as in france and not with an axe after the present fashion adopted in england and therefore desired that an executioner might be sent for out of france if it were so determined what frightful visions connected with the last act of her unfortunate mother's tragedy must have haunted the prison musings of the royal captive who having recently recovered from a long and severe malady was probably suffering from physical depression of spirits at this time the traditions of the tower of london affirm that the lodging of the princess elizabeth was immediately under the great alarm bell which in case of any attempt being made for her escape was to have raised its clamorous toxin to summon assistance 
and the hue and cry for pursuit it seems scarcely probable however that she had been placed in such close contiguity with courtney unless the proximity were artfully contrived as a snare to lure them into a stolen intercourse or attempts at correspondence for the purpose of furnishing a fresh mass of evidence against them in a letter of the third of april renaud relates the particulars of two successive interviews which he had had with the queen and some of the members of her council on the measures necessary to be adopted for the security of don philip's person before he would venture himself in england his excellency states that he had assured the queen that it was of the utmost importance that the trials and executions of the criminals especially those of courtney and elizabeth should be concluded before the arrival of the prince the queen evasively replied that she had neither rest nor sleep for the anxiety she took for the security of his highness at his coming gardiner then remarked that as long as elizabeth was alive there was no hope that the kingdom could be tranquil but if every one went to work as roundly as he did in providing remedies things would go on better as touching courtney pursues renaud there is matter sufficient against him to make his punishment certain but for elizabeth they had not yet been able to obtain matter sufficient for her conviction because those persons with whom she was in communication have fled nevertheless her majesty tells me that from day to day they are finding more proofs against her that especially they had several witnesses who deposed as to the preparation of arms and provisions which she made for the purpose of rebelling with the others and of maintaining herself in strength in a house to which she sent the supplies this was of course donnington castle to which allusion has so often been made renaud then proceeds to relate the substance of a conversation he had had with paget on the subject of elizabeth in which he says that paget told him that if they could not procure sufficient evidence to enable them to put her to death the best way of disposing of her would be to send her out of the kingdom through the medium of a foreign marriage and the prince of piedmont was named as the most eligible person on whom to bestow her great advantages were offered to all parties paget considered if this convenient union could be effected it would obviate all the dangers and difficulties involved in the unpopular marriage between queen mary and philip of spain and if elizabeth could be induced to consent to such an alliance her own rights in the succession were to be secured to her consort in the event of the queen having no children for the minister added he could see no way by which she could at present be excluded or deprived of the right which the parliament had given her if we may rely on hollingshed whose testimony as a contemporary is at any rate deserving of attention elizabeth's table while she was a prisoner in the tower was supplied at her own cost he gives a curious account of the disputes that took place daily between the authorities of the tower and the servants of the princess who were appointed to purvey for her these when they brought her daily diet to the outer gate of the tower were required to deliver it says our chronicler to the common rascal soldiers and they considering it unmeet that it should pass through such hands requested the vice-chamberlain sir john gage who had personal charge and control over the royal captive that they might be permitted to deliver it within the tower themselves this he refused on the plea that the lady elizabeth was a prisoner and should be treated as such and when they remonstrated with him he threatened that if they did either frown or shrug at him he would set them where they should neither see sun nor moon either they or their mistress had the boldness to appeal to the lords of the council by whom ten of the princess's own servants were appointed to superintend the purveyances and cooking department and to serve her at table namely two yeomen of her chamber two of her robes two of her pantry and ewry one of her buttery one of her cellar another of her larder and two of her kitchen at first the chamberlain was much displeased and continued to annoy them by various means though he afterwards behaved more courteously and good cause why as the chronicler for he had good cheer and fared of the best and her grace paid for it 
from a letter of renaud to the emperor dated the seventh of april we find there were high words between elizabeth's kinsman the admiral lord william howard and sir john gage about a letter full of seditious expressions in her favour which had been found in the street in what manner lord william howard identified sir john gage with this attempt to ascertain the state of public feeling towards elizabeth or whether he suspected it of being a device for accusing her friends it is difficult to judge but he passionately told gage that she would be the cause of cutting off so many heads that both he and others would repent it on the thirteenth of april wyatt was brought to the block and on the scaffold publicly retracted all that he had formerly said in the vain hope of escaping the penalty of his own treason to criminate elizabeth and courtney up to this period the imprisonment of elizabeth had been so extremely rigorous that she had not been permitted to cross the threshold of her own apartments and now her health beginning to give way again she entreated permission to take a little air and exercise lord chandos the constable of the tower expressed his regret at being compelled to refuse her as it was contrary to his orders she then asked leave to walk only in the suite of apartments called the queen's lodgings he applied to the council for instructions and after some discussion the indulgence was granted but only on condition that he himself the lord chamberlain and three of the queen's ladies who were selected for that purpose accompanied her and that she should not be permitted to show herself at the windows which were ordered to be kept shut a few days afterwards as elizabeth evidently required air as well as exercise she was allowed to walk in a little garden that was enclosed with high pails but the other prisoners were strictly enjoined not so much as to look in that direction while her grace remained therein the powerful interest that was excited for the captive princess at this fearful crisis may be conjectured by the lively sympathy manifested towards her by the children of the officers and servants of the royal fortress who brought her offerings of flowers one of these tender-hearted little ones was the child of martin the keeper of the queen's robes another was called susanna a babe not above three years old there was also another infant girl who having one day found some little keys carried them to the princess when she was walking in the garden and innocently told her she had brought her the keys now so she need not always stay there but might unlock the gates and go abroad elizabeth was all her life remarkable for her love of children and her natural affection for them was doubtless greatly increased by the artless traits of generous feeling and sympathy which she experienced in her time of trouble from her infant partisans in the tower how jealous a watch was kept on her and them may be gathered from the following passage in one of renaud's letters to the emperor charles v it is asserted that courtney has sent his regards to the lady elizabeth by a child of five years old who is in the tower the son of one of the soldiers there this passage authenticates the pretty incident related in the life of elizabeth in fox's appendix where we are told that at the hour she was accustomed to walk in the garden in the tower there usually repaired unto her a little boy about four years old the child of one of the people of the tower in whose pretty prattling she took great pleasure he was accustomed to bring her flowers and to receive at her hands such things as commonly please children which bred a great suspicion in the chancellor that by this child letters were exchanged between the princess elizabeth and courtney and so thoroughly was the matter sifted that the innocent little creature was examined by the lords of the council and plied with alternative promises of rewards if he would tell the truth and confess who sent him to the lady elizabeth with letters and to whom he carried tokens from her and threats of punishment if he persisted in denying it nothing however could be extracted from the child and he was dismissed with threats and his father who was severely reprimanded was enjoined not to suffer his boy to resort any more to her grace which nevertheless he attempted the next day to do but finding the door locked he peeped through a hole and called to the princess who was walking in the garden mistress i can bring you no more flowers now the tower was at that time crowded with prisoners of state among whom besides elizabeth's kinsman and political lover courtney were sir james crofts sir william st low edmund tremaine harrington 
and others of her own household, and last not least, Lord Robert Dudley, who was afterwards her great favorite, the celebrated Earl of Leicester. This nobleman was born on the same day and in the same hour with Elizabeth, and had been one of her playfellows in childhood, having, as he afterwards said, known her intimately from her eighth year. Considering the intriguing temper of both, it is probable that, notwithstanding the jealous precautions of their respective jailers, some sort of secret understanding was established between them, even at this period, possibly through the medium of the child, who brought the daily offerings of flowers to the princess, although the timid Courtney was the person suspected of carrying on a correspondence by the agency of this infant Mercury. The signal favor that Elizabeth lavished on Robert Dudley, by appointing him her master of horse, and loading him with honors within the first week of her accession to the crown, must have originated from some powerful motive which does not appear on the surface of history. His imprisonment in the tower was for aiding and abetting his ambitious father, the Duke of Northumberland, and his faction, in raising Lady Jane Grey, the wife of his brother, Lord Guilford Dudley, to the throne, to the prejudice of Elizabeth, no less than her sister Mary. Therefore he must by some means have succeeded, not only in winning Elizabeth's pardon for this offence, but in exciting an interest in her bosom of no common nature, while they were both imprisoned in the tower, since being immediately after his liberation, employed in the wars in France, he had no other opportunity of ingratiating himself with that princess. On the 17th of April, Noel writes, Madame Elizabeth, having since her imprisonment been very closely confined, is now more free. She has the liberty of going all over the tower, but without daring to speak to any one but those appointed to guard her. As they cannot prove her implication with the recent insurrection, it is thought she will not die. Great agitation pervaded Mary's privy council at this time, according to the reports of Renaud to his imperial master, on the subject of Elizabeth and Courtney. What one counsels, says he, another contradicts. One advises to save Courtney, another Elizabeth, and such confusion prevails that all we expect is to see their disputes end in war and tumult. He then notices that the Chancellor Gardiner headed one party, and the Earl of Arundel, Pembroke, Sussex, the Master of the Horse, Paget, Petrie, and the Admiral another. These were now the protectors of Elizabeth, and Renaud adds, that the Queen is irresolute about what should be done with her and Courtney, but that he can see that she is inclined to set him at liberty, through the intercession of her comptroller, Sir Robert Rochester, and his friends, who have formed a compact for his marriage with that lady. As for Elizabeth, pursues he, the lawyers can find no matter for her condemnation. Already she has liberty to walk in the tower garden, and even if they had proof, they would not dare to proceed against her, for the love of the admiral, her kinsman, who espouses her quarrel, and has at present all the force of England in his power. If, however, they release her, it appears evident that the heretics will proclaim her queen. The part taken by Arundel in favor of Elizabeth was so decided that the queen was advised to send him to the tower. Paget appears to have played a double game, first plotting with one side and then with the other, sometimes urging the immediate execution of Elizabeth and then intriguing with her partisans. In the midst of these agitations, the queen was stricken with a sudden illness, and it must have been at that time that Gardiner, on his own responsibility, sent a privy council warrant to the lieutenant of the tower for the immediate execution of Elizabeth. He knew the temper of that princess, and probably considered that in the event of the queen's death, he had sinned too deeply against her to be forgiven, and therefore ventured a bold stroke to prevent the possibility of the sword of vengeance passing into her hand, by her succeeding to the royal office. Bridges, the honest lieutenant of the tower, observing the queen's signature was not affixed to this illegal instrument for the destruction of the heiress of the realm, and being sore grieved for the charge it contained, refused to execute it till he had ascertained the queen's pleasure by a direct communication on the subject with her majesty. The delay caused by this caution preserved Elizabeth from the machinations of her foes. 
the queen was much displeased when she found such a plot was in agitation and sent sir henry bedingfeld a stern norfolk knight in whose courage and probity she knew she could confide with a hundred of her guard to take the command of the tower till she could form some plan for the removal of her sister to one of the royal residences further from the metropolis notwithstanding all that had been done by friends foes and designing foreign potentates to inflame the queen's mind against elizabeth the voice of nature was suffered to plead in behalf of the oppressed captive early in may it was noticed that her majesty began when speaking of elizabeth to call her sister which she had not done before since her imprisonment and that she had caused her portrait to be replaced next to her own in her gallery she had positively given up the idea of bringing either her or courtney to trial for their alleged offences and had negatived the suspicious proposal of the emperor that elizabeth should be sent into a sort of honourable banishment to the court of his sister the queen of hungary or his own court at brussels it was then suggested in council that she should be imprisoned in the pontefract castle but that ill-omened place stained with the blood of princes was rejected for the royal bowers of woodstock where it was finally determined to send her under the charge of sir henry bedingfeld and lord williams of tame who were both staunch catholics elizabeth who naturally regarded every unwanted movement and change with apprehension when she first saw sir henry bedingfeld and the hundred men-at-arms in blue coats under his command enter the inner court of the tower supposing it to be a prelude to her execution demanded in terror if the lady jane's scaffold were removed she then sent for lord chandos and fearfully inquired the meaning of what she saw he endeavoured to calm her mind by telling her that she had no cause for alarm but that his orders were to consign her into the charge of sir henry bedingfeld to be conveyed he believed to woodstock elizabeth then declared that she knew not what manner of man bedingfeld was and inquired whether he were a person who made conscience of murder if such an order were entrusted to him her mind evidently recurred on this occasion to the appointment of sir james tyrrell by richard the third for the midnight murder of the youthful brethren of her grandmother elizabeth of york as a parallel circumstance and when it is remembered that seventy years had not elapsed since the perpetration of this mysterious tragedy it is not to be wondered that the stout heart of elizabeth tudor occasionally vibrated with a thrill of terror during her incarceration as a state prisoner within those gloomy walls the nineteenth of may is generally mentioned as the date of elizabeth's removal from the tower we find this notice in a contemporary record the twentieth day of may my lady elizabeth the queen's sister came out of the tower and took her barge at the tower wharf and so to richmond elizabeth was attended on this occasion by the lord treasurer marquis of winchester and the chamberlain she performed the voyage to richmond without once landing till she arrived there it is affirmed that she was then conducted to the palace where she had an interview with the queen her sister who offered her pardon and liberty on condition of her accepting the hand of philibert of savoy prince of piedmont in marriage and that she firmly refused to contract matrimony with him or any other foreign prince whatsoever alleging her preference of a single life the harsh measures that were adopted that evening at richmond in removing all her own servants from their attendance on her person were probably resorted to on account of the inflexibility of her determination on this point she evidently considered herself in great peril for she required the prayers of her departing servants with mournful earnestness for this night said she i think i must die which sorrowful words drew fountains of tears from their eyes and her gentlemen ushers went to the lord tame in the court and conjured him to tell him whether the princess his mistress were in danger of death that night that if so he and his fellows might take such part as god would appoint mary god forbid exclaimed lord tame that any such wickedness should be intended which rather than it should be wrought i and my men will die at her feet all night however a strict guard of soldiers kept watch and ward about the house where she lay to prevent escape or rescue 
the next morning in crossing the river at richmond to proceed on her melancholy journey towards woodstock she found her disbanded servants lingering on the banks of the thames to take a last look of her go to them said she to one of the gentlemen in her escort and tell them from me tanquam ovis like a sheep to the slaughter for so added she am i led no one was however permitted to have access to her and the most rigorous scrutiny was used towards every one who endeavoured to open the slightest communication either direct or indirect with the royal captive noel the french ambassador no sooner understood that elizabeth was removed from the tower than he commenced his old tricks by sending a spy with a present of apples to her on her journey a very unwelcome mark of attention from such a quarter considering the troubles and dangers in which the unfortunate girl had already been involved in consequence of that unprincipled diplomat's previous intercourse with her and her household the guards as a matter of course stopped and examined the messenger whom they stripped to the shirt but found nothing except the apples which from the season of the year might appear an acceptable offering but certainly an ill-judged one under the present circumstances and doubtless it had an unfavourable effect on the mind of elizabeth's stern guardian sir henry bedingfeld the sympathy of the people for the distressed heiress of the realm was manifested by their assembling to meet her by the way and greeting her with tearful prayers and loving words but when they pressed nearer to obtain a sight of her they were driven back and angrily reviled by the names of rebels and traitors to the queen and whereas pursues the chronicler in certain villages the bells were rung for joy for her supposed deliverance as she passed sir henry bedingfeld took the matter so distastefully that he commanded the bells to be stopped and set the ringers in the stocks the second day's journey brought elizabeth to windsor where she spent the night and lodged in the dean's house near st george's chapel the next resting place was rycote in oxfordshire which being the seat of lord williams of tame she there received every princely and hospitable entertainment from that amiable nobleman who had invited a noble company of knights and ladies to meet his royal charge at dinner and treated her with all the marks of respect that were due to her exalted rank as the sister of his sovereign this seasonable kindness greatly revived the drooping spirits of the princess though it was considered rather de trop by sir richard bedingfeld who significantly asked his fellow commissioner if he were aware of the consequences of thus entertaining the queen's prisoner the generous williams replied with manly spirit that let what would befall her grace might and should be merry in his house it is said that when elizabeth expressed a wish to sir henry bedingfeld to delay her departure till she had seen a game of chess in which lord williams and another gentleman were engaged played out he would not permit it probably sir henry suspected that she intended to outwit him by means of a secret understanding between the friendly antagonists in order to gain time for it is well known that a game of chess may be prolonged for days and in fact to any length of time it is also related that as they were proceeding towards woodstock a violent storm of wind and rain which they encountered greatly disordered the princess's dress insomuch that her hood and veil were twice or thrice blown off on which she begged to retire to a gentleman's house near the road this we are told sir henry bedingfeld who perhaps had some reason for his caution would not permit and it is added that the royal prisoner was fain to retire behind the shelter of a hedge by the wayside to replace her headgear and bind up her disordered tresses end of section seven section eight of lives of the queens of england volume six by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain elizabeth chapter three part two when she arrived at woodstock instead of being placed in the royal apartments she was lodged in the gatehouse of the palace in a room which retained the name of the princess elizabeth's chamber till it was demolished in the year seventeen fourteen hollingshed has preserved the rude couplet which she wrote with a diamond on a pane of glass in the window of this room 
much suspected of me nothing proved can be quoth elizabeth prisoner her confinement at woodstock was no less rigorous than when she was in the tower sixty soldiers were on guard all day both within and without the quarter of the palace where she was in ward and forty kept watch within the walls all night and though she obtained permission to walk in the gardens it was under very strict regulations and five or six locks were made fast after her whenever she came within the appointed bounds of her joyless recreation although sir henry bedingfeld has been very severely censured on account of these restraints and other passages of his conduct with regard to the captive princess there is reason to believe that his harshness has been exaggerated and that he had great cause to suspect that the ruthless party who thirsted for elizabeth's blood having been foiled in their eagerly expressed wish of seeing her brought to the block were conspiring to take her off by murder this he was determined should not be done while she was in his charge it is said that once having locked the garden gates when elizabeth was walking she passionately upbraided him for it and called him her jailer on which he knelt to her beseeching her not to give him that harsh name for he was one of her officers appointed to serve her and guard her from the dangers by which she was beset among the incidents of elizabeth's imprisonment a mysterious tale is told of an attempt made by one bassett a creature of gardener against her life during the temporary absence of sir henry bedingfeld this bassett it seems had been with five-and-twenty disguised ruffians loitering with evil intentions at bladenbridge seeking to obtain access to the lady elizabeth on secret and important business as he pretended but sir henry had given such strict cautions to his brother whom he left as deputy castellan in his absence that no one should approach the royal prisoner that the project was defeated once a dangerous fire broke out in the quarter of the palace where she was confined which was kindled apparently not by accident between the ceiling of the room under her chamber and her chamber floor by which her life would have been greatly endangered had it not been providentially discovered before she retired to rest the lofty spirit of elizabeth though unsubdued was saddened by the perils and trials to which she was daily exposed and in the bitterness of her heart she once expressed a wish to change fortunes with the milkmaid whom she saw singing merrily over her pail while milking the cows in woodstock park for she said that milkmaid's lot was better than hers and her life merrier it was doubtless while in this melancholy frame of mind that the following touching lines were composed by the royal captive which have been preserved by hentzner with the interesting tradition that she wrote them on a shutter with a piece of charcoal no doubt at a period when she was entirely deprived of pen and ink o oh, fortune how thy restless wavering state hath fraught with cares my troubled wit witness this present prison whither fate could bear me and the joys i quit thou cost the guilty to be loosed from bands wherein our innocence enclosed causing the guiltless to be straight reserved and freeing those that death had well deserved by her envy can be nothing wrought so god send to my foes all they have wrought quoth elizabeth prisoner she also composed some elegant latin lines on the same subject and when in a more heavenly frame of mind inscribed the following quaint but beautiful sentence in the blank leaf of a black letter edition of the epistles of st paul which she used during her lonely imprisonment at woodstock august i walk many times into the pleasant fields of the holy scriptures where i pluck up the goodly some herbs of sentences by pruning eat them by reading chew them by musing and lay them up at length in the high seat of memory by gathering them together that so having tasted their sweetness i may the less perceive the bitterness of this miserable life the volume is covered with devices and needlework embroidered by the royal maiden who was then drinking deeply of the cup of adversity and thus solacing her weary hours in holy and feminine employments this interesting relic is preserved in the bodleian library at oxford needlework in which like her accomplished stepmother queen catherine parr and many other illustrious ladies elizabeth greatly excelled was one of the resources with which she whiled away the weary hours of her imprisonment at woodstock 
as we learn both by the existing devices wrought by her hand in gold thread on the cover of the volume which has just been described and also from the following verses by taylor in his poem in praise of the needle when this great queen whose memory shall not by any terms of time be overcast for when the world and all therein shall rot yet shall her glorious fame for ever last when she a maid had many troubles past from jail to jail by marie's angry spleen and woodstock in the tower imprisoned fast and after all was england's peerless queen yet howsoever sorrow came and went she made the needle her companion still and in that exercise her time she spent as many living yet do know her skill thus she was still a captive or else crowned a needlewoman royal and renowned the fate of elizabeth was long a subject of discussion at the council board of her royal sister after her removal to the sequestered bowers of woodstock the base pageant had dared to assert that there would be no peace in england till her head were smitten from her shoulders yet courtney who had been removed from the tower to fotheringay castle confessed to a person named sillier who conducted him to his new prison that paget had importuned him to marry the lady elizabeth adding that if he did not the son of the earl of arundel would and that hobie and morrison both at the instigation of paget had practiced with him touching that marriage on the eighth of june elizabeth was so ill that an express was sent to the court for two physicians to come to her assistance they were sent and continued in attendance upon her for several days when youth and a naturally fine constitution enabled her to triumph over a malady that had in all probability been brought on by anxiety of mind the physicians on their return made a friendly report of the loyal feelings of the princess towards the queen which appears to have had a favorable effect on mary's mind and now says camden the princess elizabeth guiding herself like a ship in tempestuous weather her divine service after the romanish manner was frequently confessed and at the pressing instances of cardinal pole and for fear of death professed herself to be of the roman catholic religion the queen doubting her sincerity caused her to be questioned as to her belief in transubstantiation on which elizabeth being pressed to declare her opinion as to the real presence of the saviour in the sacrament of the lord's supper replied in the following extempore lines christ was the word that spake it he took the bread and brake it and what his word did make it that i believe and take it it was impossible for either catholic or protestant to impugn the orthodoxy of this simple scriptural explanation of one of the sublimest mysteries of the christian faith it silenced the most subtle of her foes at least they forbore to harass her with questions on theological subjects dr story however in one of his fierce declamations against heretics declared that it was of little avail destroying the branches as long as the root of all heresies meaning the princess elizabeth were suffered to remain the delusive hopes which queen mary entertained in the autumn of that year of bringing an heir to england appears to have altered elizabeth's position even with her own party for a time and philip being desirous of pleasing the people of england is supposed to have interceded with his consort for the liberation of all the prisoners in the tower also that he requested that his sister-in-law the princess elizabeth might be admitted to share in the christmas festivities at hampton court she travelled from woodstock under the charge of sir henry bedingfeld and rested the first night at rycote the next she passed at the house of mr dormer at winge in buckinghamshire and from thence to an inn at colnbrook where she slept at this place she was met by the gentlemen and yeomen of her own household to the number of sixty much to all their comforts who had not seen her for several months they were not however permitted to approach near enough to speak to her but were all commanded to return to london the next day she reached hampton court and was ushered into the prince's lodgings but the doors were closed upon her and guarded so that she had reason to suppose she was still to be treated a prisoner soon after her arrival she was visited by gardiner and three other of the queen's cabinet whom without waiting to hear their errand she addressed in the following words 
my lords i am glad to see you for methinks i have been kept a great while from you desolately alone wherefore i would entreat you to be a means to the king's and queen's majesties that i may be delivered from my imprisonment in which i have been kept a long time as to you my lords is not unknown gardiner in reply told her she must then confess her fault and put herself on the queen's mercy she replied that rather than she would do so she would lie in prison all her life that she had never offended against the queen in thought word or deed that she craved no mercy at her majesty's hand but rather desired to put herself on the law the next day gardiner and his colleagues came to her again and gardiner told her on his knee that the queen marvelled at her boldness in refusing to confess her offence so that it might seem as if her majesty had wrongfully imprisoned her grace nay replied elizabeth she may if it please her punish me as she thinketh good her majesty willeth me to tell you retorted gardiner that you must tell another tale ere that you are set at liberty elizabeth replied that she had as lief be in prison with honesty as to be abroad suspected of her majesty adding that which i have said i will stand to then said gardiner your grace hath the advantage of me and these lords for your long and wrongful imprisonment what advantage i have you know replied elizabeth i seek no vantage at your hands for your so dealing with me but god forgive you and me also they then finding no concessions were to be obtained from her withdrew and elizabeth was left in close confinement for a week at the end of which time she was startled by receiving a summons to the queen's presence one night at ten o'clock imagining herself in great danger she bade her attendants pray for her for she could not tell whether she should ever see them again she was conducted to the queen's bedchamber where the interview that has been related in the memoir of queen mary took place it has always been said that philip of spain was concealed behind a large screen or the tapestry to witness this meeting between the royal sisters after their long estrangement historians have added that he was thus ambushed in order to protect elizabeth from the violence of the queen if necessary but there was no warrant for such an interference mary was never addicted to the use of striking arguments and elizabeth at that period of her life knew how to restrain her lips from angry expletives and her fingers from fighting philip's object therefore in placing himself perdu could scarcely have been for the purpose of seeing fair play between the ladies in the event of their coming to blows as gravely insinuated by fox and others but rather we should surmise with the jealous intention of making himself acquainted with what passed between his consort and the heiress presumptive of england against whose life he and his father had for the first fifteen months practised with such determined malice that philip ought to have been as it appeared he really was ashamed to look upon her for the first time face to face great confusion exists among historians as to the year in which this memorable interview took place but there can be no doubt that it was in the autumn of fifteen fifty four because of the presence of philip of spain and his friend philibert of savoy who both graced the festivals of the english court that christmas and no other and it is supposed that one object of bringing elizabeth into the royal circle on this occasion was to afford the gallant savoyard an opportunity of pleading his own cause to her in person philibert was not only invited to receive the hand of elizabeth but was actually inducted in her town residence during his stay in london the prince is expected in four days writes noel to his sovereign and apartments are prepared for him in somerset house which now belongs to the lady elizabeth when he arrived he was so very ill from seasickness that he was obliged to stay at dover fifteen days to the great regret of the king and queen at the brilliant christmas eve festival elizabeth appeared once more publicly in her sister's palace as the second royal personage in the realm as such she took her place both at feasts and tournaments before the assembled chivalry of england spain and flanders in the presence of alva egmont ruy gomez and other distinguished men whose fame for good or evil expanded throughout europe 
her own suitor philibert emmanuel the most illustrious for worth and valor was also present at this banquet elizabeth was seated at the queen's table next the royal canopy or cloth of estate after supper she was served by her former treacherous friend and cruel foe lord paget with a perfumed napkin and a plate of confits she retired however to her ladies before the masking and dancing began perhaps to avoid any communication with her suitor in the rejection of whose addresses after events fully manifested the queen supported her it would have been a more deadly blow to the protestant interest of this country than all the persecutions with which it was visited in the succeeding years of mary's reign had elizabeth while yet her character was flexible married this great man in this case as may be gathered from his matrimonial felicity with margaret of valois the intellectual daughter of francis i the personal character and happiness of elizabeth would have been improved but england might have remained if we may judge from the slavish devotion of the era to the religion of their monarch a roman catholic country the extreme beauty and grace of courtney's person perhaps rendered elizabeth indifferent to the addresses of philibert emmanuel on st stephen's day elizabeth heard matins in the queen's closet in the chapel royal on which occasion she was attired in a style of almost bridal elegance wearing a robe of rich white satin passamented all over with large pearls at the tournament on the twenty ninth of december she sat with their majesties in the royal gallery to witness the grand but long delayed pageant of the jousting in honor of her sister's nuptials two hundred spears were broken on this occasion by the cavaliers of spain and flanders attired in their national costumes the great respect with which elizabeth was treated at this period by the principal personages in the realm can scarcely be more satisfactorily proved than by the following account which fox narrates of a dispute between one of her servants and an ill-mannered tradesman about the court who had said that jilt the lady elizabeth was the real cause of wyatt's rising the princess's man cited the other before the ecclesiastical court to answer for his scandalous language and there expressed himself as follows i saw yesterday at court that my lord cardinal pole when meeting the princess in the presence chamber kneeled down and kissed her hand and i saw also that king philip meeting her made her such obeisance that his knee touched the ground and then methinketh it were too much to suffer such a varlet as this to call her a jilt and to wish them to hop headless that shall wish her grace to enjoy possession of the crown when god shall send it unto her in right of inheritance yea quoth bonner who was then presiding when god sendeth it unto her let her enjoy it however the reviler of elizabeth was sent for and duly reproved for his misbehavior elizabeth failed not to avail herself of every opportunity of paying her court to her royal brother-in-law with whom she was on very friendly terms although she would not comply with his earnest wish of her becoming the wife of his friend and ally philibert of savoy the period of elizabeth's return to woodstock is doubtful but it does not appear that she was under any particular restraint there for she had all her own people about her and early in the spring fifteen fifty five some of the members of her household were accused of practicing by enchantment against the queen's life elizabeth had ventured to divert her lonely sojourn in the royal bowers of woodstock by secret consultations with a cunning clerk of oxford one john d afterwards celebrated as an astrologer and mathematician throughout europe and who by his pretended skill in divination acquired an influence over the strong mind of that learned and clear-headed princess which he retained as long as she lived a curious letter of news from thomas martin of london to edward courtney earl of devonshire then travelling in italy was lately discovered at the state paper office which was doubtless intercepted and considering to whom it was written and the facts in which elizabeth's name is implicated it must be regarded as a document of no common interest in england says he all is quiet such as wrote traitorous letters into germany be apprehended as likewise others that did calculate the king's the queen's and my lady elizabeth's nativity 
whereof one d and carey and butler and one other of my lady elizabeth's are accused that they should have a familiar spirit which is the more suspected for that fairies one of their accusers had immediately on the accusation both of his children stricken the one with death the other with blindness carey and butler were both related to elizabeth by her maternal lineage and d had obtained access to her through his relationship and intimacy with her confidential servants the perrys elizabeth escaped a public implication in the charge of these occult practices her household were faithful to her but it was probably the cause of her removal from woodstock and of her being once more conducted as a prisoner of state to hampton court which according to most authorities she was a second time april fifteen fifty five it has been generally said that she was indebted for her liberation to the good offices of her brother-in-law philip of spain who when he found himself disappointed in his hopes of an heir to england by queen mary and perceived how precarious a threat her existence hung became fully aware of the value of elizabeth's life as the sole barrier to the ultimate recognition of mary queen of scots and dauphiness of france as queen of great britain to prevent so dangerous a preponderancy in the balance of power from falling to his political rival the monarch of france he wisely determined that elizabeth's petty misdemeanors should be winked at and the queen finally gave her permission to reside once more in royal state at her favorite abode hatfield house in hertfordshire at parting mary placed a ring on the princess's finger to the value of seven hundred crowns as a pledge of amity it was not however mary's intention to restore elizabeth so entirely to liberty as to leave her the unrestrained mistress of her own actions and sir thomas pope was entrusted with the responsible office of residing in her house for the purpose of restraining her from intriguing with suspected persons either abroad or at home veiling the intimation of her sovereign will under the semblance of a courteous recommendation mary presented this gentleman to elizabeth as an officer who was henceforth to reside in her family and who would do his best to render her and her household comfortable elizabeth to whom sir thomas pope was already well known had the tact to take this in good part she had indeed reason to rejoice that her keeper while she remained as a state prisoner at large was a person of such honourable and friendly conditions as this learned and worthy gentleman the fetters in which he held her were more like flowery wreaths flung lightly around her to attach her to a bower of royal pleasance than aught which might remind her of the stern restraints by which she was surrounded during her incarceration in the tower and her subsequent abode at woodstock in the summer and autumn of fifteen fifty four there is reason to believe that she did not take her final departure from the court till late in the autumn it is certain that she came by water to meet the queen her sister and philip at greenwich for the purpose of taking a personal farewell of him at his embarkation for flanders elizabeth did not however make one in the royal procession when queen mary went through the city in an open litter in order to show herself to the people who had long believed her to be dead at this very time elizabeth passed to greenwich by water and shot london bridge in a shabby barge very ill appointed attended only by four damsels and three gentlemen with all this the people were much displeased as they supposed it was contrived that they might not see the princess which they greatly desired during king philip's absence he manifested a great interest in the welfare of elizabeth whether personal or political it is not so easy to ascertain her vanity led her to believe that her brother-in-law was in love with her and much she boasted of the same in after life meantime he wrote many letters to his wife queen mary and to some spanish grandees resident at the english court commending elizabeth to their kindness she made many visits to the queen and went to mass every day besides fasting with her very sedulously in order to qualify themselves for the reception of the pope's pardon and to fit them for the benefits of the jubilee which he had granted altogether elizabeth appeared to be fairly in her sister's good graces 
nor did mary ever betray the least personal jealousy respecting king philip's regard for her sister yet contemporaries and even elizabeth herself after the queen's death had much to say on the subject attributing to him partiality beyond the due degree of brotherhood insomuch that many years subsequently thomas cecil the eldest son of lord burley repeated at elizabeth's court that king philip had been heard to say after his return to spain that whatever he suffered from queen elizabeth was the just judgment of god because being married to queen mary whom he thought to be a most virtuous and good lady yet in the fancy of love he could not affect her but as for the lady elizabeth he was enamoured of her being a fair and beautiful woman when elizabeth took her final departure from london to hatfield that autumn october eighteenth the people crowded to obtain a sight of her says noel followed her through the city and greeted her with acclamations and such vehement manifestations of affection that she was fearful it would expose her to the jealousy of the court and with her wanton exercise of caution she fell back behind some of the officers in her train as if unwilling to attract public attention and applause at hatfield she was permitted to surround herself with her old accustomed train of attached servants among whom were her beloved governess mrs catherine ashley her husband the perrys and last not least her learned preceptor roger ashcombe who had obtained the preferment of latin secretary to her sister the queen and was permitted to visit and resume his instructions to elizabeth who in her twenty-second year was better qualified than ever to make the most of the advantages she enjoyed under such an instructor on the fourteenth of september fifteen fifty five ashcombe wrote to his friend sturmius from metulus you will learn what my most noble elizabeth is he will tell you pursues ashcombe how much she excels in greek italian latin and french also her knowledge of things in general and with what a wise and accurate judgment she is endowed he added that metulus thought it more to have seen elizabeth than to have seen england the lady elizabeth and i pursues ashcombe are reading together in greek the orations of Ascanes and demosthenes she reads before me and at first sight she so learnedly comprehends not only the idiom of the language and the meaning of the orator but the whole grounds of contention the decrees and the customs and manners of the people as you would greatly wonder to hear again in a conversation with aylmer on the subject of the talents and attainments of the princess he said i teach her words and she me things i teach her the tongues to speak and her modest and maidenly looks teach me works to do for i think she is the best disposed of any in all europe castiglione an italian master added that elizabeth possessed two qualities that were seldom united in one woman namely a singular wit and a marvellous meek stomach he was however the only person who ever gave the royal lioness of the tudor line credit for the latter quality and very probably intended to speak of her affability but mistook the meaning of the word according to noel the queen paid elizabeth a visit at hatfield more than once this autumn and yet soon after it appears when elizabeth had removed to another of her houses in hertfordshire that two of her majesty's officers arrived with orders to take mrs catherine ashley and three of elizabeth's maids of honour into custody which they actually did and lodged mrs ashley in the fleet prison and the other ladies in the tower the cause of this extraordinary arrest has never been satisfactorily explained speed openly attributes it to the hostility of gardiner and miss aiken taking the same view observes that it was a last expiring effort of his indefatigable malice against elizabeth he died on the twelfth of november when however the intriguing disposition of mrs ashley is remembered and that it was on the eve of the abortive attempt of sir henry dudley to raise a fresh insurrection in england in favour of elizabeth and courtney and that several of the princess's household were actually implicated in the plot it is more natural to suppose that she and the other ladies had been accused of carrying on a treasonable correspondence with the confederates elizabeth had the prospect of a new royal suitor at this period 
for a report was prevalent when the archduke of austria came to visit his kinsman philip the second at brussels december fifteen fifty five that his intention was to propose for her hand as for her former lover philibert emmanuel of savoy he had committed himself both with philip and elizabeth having been seen making love from his window to the fair duchess of lorraine christina of denmark and for the present the princess had a respite from his unwelcome addresses the respectful and kind attention which elizabeth received from sir thomas pope during her residence under his friendly surveillance at hatfield is testified by the following passage in a contemporary chronicle at strovetide sir thomas pope made for the lady elizabeth all at his own cost a grand and rich masking in the great hall at hatfield where the pageants were marvellously furnished there were there twelve minstrels antiquely disguised with forty-six or more gentlemen and ladies many knights nobles and ladies of honour apparelled in crimson satin embroidered with wreaths of gold and garnished with borders of hanging pearl there was the device of a castle of cloth of gold set with pomegranates about the battlements with shields of knights hanging therefrom and six knights in rich harness tourneyed at night the cupboard in the hall was of twelve stages mainly furnished with garnish of gold and silver vessels and a banquet of seventy dishes and after a void of spices and subtleties with thirty spice plates all at the charge of sir thomas pope and the next day the play of holofernes but the queen per case misliked these follies as by her letters to sir thomas pope did appear and so these disguisings were ceased the reason of mary's objection to these pageants and public entertainments was probably on account of the facility they afforded for the admission of strangers and emissaries from the king of france or the foreign ambassadors with whom elizabeth and her partisans had been so frequently suspected of intriguing the spring and summer of fifteen fifty six were agitated by a series of new plots by the indefatigable conspirators who made elizabeth's name the rallying point of their schemes of insurrection and this whether she consented or not it was extremely dangerous for her that persons of her household were always involved in these attempts in the conspiracy between the king of france and sir henry dudley to depose mary and raise elizabeth to the throne two of elizabeth's chief officers were deeply engaged these men peckham and wern were tried and executed their confessions as usual implicated elizabeth who it is asserted owed her life to the interposition of king philip likewise it is said that he obliged mary to drop all inquiry into her guilt and to give out that she believed peckham and wern had made use of the name of their mistress without her authority moreover mary sent her a ring in token of her amity that mary did so is probable but that she acted on compulsion and against her inclination is scarcely consistent with a letter concerning the next insurrection which took place in june a few weeks after in which elizabeth was actually proclaimed queen a young man named cleobury who was extremely like the earl of devonshire landed on the coast of sussex as if that noble had returned from exile and proclaimed elizabeth queen and himself king as edward earl of devonshire and her husband this scene took place in yaxley church but the adventurer was immediately seized and in september following was executed for treason at bury this insurrection was communicated to elizabeth by a letter from the hand of queen mary herself a kind one it may be gathered from the following answer still extant where amidst elizabeth's laboured and contorted sentences this fact may be elicited by the reader princess elizabeth to queen mary august second fifteen fifty six when i revolve in mind most noble queen the old love of paynims to their princes and the reverent fear of the romans to their senate i cannot but muse for my part and blush for theirs to see the rebellious hearts and devilish intents of christians in name but jews indeed towards their anointed king which methinks if they had feared god though they could not have loved the state they should for the dread of their own plague have refrained that wickedness which their bounden duty to their majesty had not restrained but when i call to remembrance that devil tanquam leo rugiens circumvit quarens quem devorare potest 
like a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour i do the less marvel that he the devil have gotten such novices into his professed house as vessels without god's grace more apt to serve his the devil's palace than me to inhabit english land i am the bolder to call them mary's rebels his imps for that saint paul saith seditiosi sunt filii diaboli the seditious are sons of the devil and since i have so good a buckler i fear less to enter into their judgment of this i assure your majesty it had been my part above the rest to bewail such things though my name had not been in them yet much it vexed me that the devil oweth me such a hate as to put in any part of his mischievous instigations whom as i profess him my foe that is all christians enemy so wish i he had some other way invented to spite me but since it hath pleased god thus to be right there the insurgent's malice i most humbly thank him both that he has ever thus preserved your majesty through his aid much like a lamb from the horns of this basson's bull or the devil and also stirred up the hearts of your loving subjects to resist them and deliver you to his honour and there the insurgent's shame the intelligence of which proceeding from your majesty deserves more humble thanks than with my pen i can render which as infinite i will leave to number for example will not attempt to number and amongst earthly things i chiefly wish this one that there were as good surgeons for making anatomies of hearts that i might show my thoughts to your majesty as there are expert physicians of bodies able to express the inward griefs of maladies to their patients for then i doubt not but know well that whatever others should subject by malice yet your majesty should be sure by knowledge that the more such mists render effuscate the clear light of my soul the more my tired thoughts should listen to the dimming of their the insurgents hidden malice but since wishes are vain and desires oft fail i must crave that my deeds may supply that which my thoughts cannot declare and that they be not misdeemed as the facts have been so well tried and like as i have been your faithful subject from the beginning of your reign so shall no wicked person cause me to change to the end of my life and thus i commend your majesty to god's tuition whom i beseech long time to preserve ending with the new remembrance of my old suit more than for that i should not be forgotten than for i think it not remembered from hatfield the second of august your majesty's obedient subject and humble sister elizabeth her majesty was happily satisfied with the painfully elaborate and metaphorical protestations of innocence and loyalty contained in this letter and the princess continued in the gentle keeping of sir thomas pope he appears to have been really fond of his royal charge who for her part well knew how to please him by her learned and agreeable conversation and more especially by frequently talking with him on the subject nearest to his heart trinity college which he had just founded at oxford for a president priest and twelve fellows he mentions in one of his letters with peculiar satisfaction the interest she manifested in his college the princess elizabeth says he often asketh me about the course i have devised for my scholars and that part of my statutes respecting study i have shown her she likes well she is not only gracious but most learned ye right well know two of the fellows of this college were expelled by the president and society for violating one of the statutes they repaired in great tribulation to their founder and acknowledging their fault implored most humbly for readmittance to his college sir thomas pope not liking by his own relentings to countenance the infringements of the laws he had made for the good government of his college yet willing to extend the pardon that was solicited kindly referred the matter to the decision of the princess who was pleased to intercede for the culprits that they might be restored to their fellowships on which the benevolent knight wrote to the president that although the two offenders simpson and rude had well deserved their expulsion from his college yet at the desire and commandment of the lady elizabeth's grace seconded by the request of his wife he consented that they should on making a public confession of their fault and submitting to a fine be again received and that it should be recorded in a book that they had been expelled 
and that it was at the lady elizabeth's and his wife's desire that they were readmitted and that he was fully resolved never to do the like again to please any creature living the queen's majesty alone excepted this letter bears date august twenty second fifteen fifty six end of section eight Section 9 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 3, Part 3. In the following November, Elizabeth, having been honored with an invitation to her sister's court, came to London in state. Her entrance and the dress of her retinue are thus quaintly recorded by a contemporary. The 28th of November came riding through Smithfield and Old Bailey, and through Fleet Street unto Somerset Place, my good Lady Elizabeth's Grace, the Queen's sister, with a great company of velvet coats and chains, her Grace's gentlemen, and after, a great company of her men, all in red coats, guarded with a broad guard of black velvet and cuts, or slashes. Elizabeth found herself treated with so many flattering marks of attention, by the nobility as well as the commons, whose darling she always had been, that she assembled a sort of court around her, and determined to settle herself in her town residence for the winter. She was, however, assailed by the council, at the insistence of her royal brother-in-law, with the renewal of the persecution she had undergone, in favor of her persevering suitor, Philibert of Savoy, the imperial ambassadors had been very urgent with the queen on the subject and elizabeth found that she had only been sent for in order to conclude the marriage treaty the earnestness with which this was pushed on immediately after the death of courtney naturally favors the idea that a positive contract of marriage had subsisted between that unfortunate nobleman and the princess which had formed a legal impediment to her entering into any other matrimonial engagement during his life. She was, however, positive in her rejection of the Duke of Savoy's hand, though, as before, she protested her unalterable devotion to a maiden life, as the reason of her refusal. After this decision, she was compelled to give up the hope of spending a festive Christmas in London, and the Cottonian manuscript records her departure after the brief sojourn of one week in these words on the third day of september came riding from her place somerset house my lady elizabeth's grace from somerset place down fleet street and through old bailey and smithfield and so her grace took her way towards bishop hatfield such was the disgust that elizabeth had conceived during her late visit to court or the apprehensions that had been excited by the intimation used by the spanish party that she appears to have contemplated the very impolitic step of secretly withdrawing from the realm that was so soon to become her own and taking refuge in france henry the second had never ceased urging her by his wily agent noel to accept an asylum in his court doubtless with the intention of securing the only person who in the event of queen mary's death would stand between his daughter-in-law and the crown of england noel had however interfered in so unseemly a manner in the intrigues and plots that agitated england that he had been recalled and superseded in his office by his brother the bishop of Ock, a man of better principles and who scrupled to become a party in the iniquitous scheme of deluding a young and inexperienced princess to her own ruin with equal kindness and sincerity, this worthy ecclesiastic told the Countess of Sussex, when she came to him secretly in disguise, to ask his assistance in conveying the Lady Elizabeth to France, that it was an unwise project, and that he would advise the princess to take example by the conduct of her sister, who, if she had listened to the counsels of those who would have persuaded her to take refuge with the emperor, would still have remained in exile. The countess returned again to him on the same errand, and he then plainly told her, that if ever Elizabeth hoped to ascend the throne of England, she must never leave the realm. A few years later, he declared, that Elizabeth was indebted to him for her crown. 
whatever might be the cloud that had darkened the prospects of the princess at the period when she had cherished intentions so fatal to her own interests it quickly disappeared and on the twenty fifth of february fifteen fifty seven she came from her house at hatfield to london attended by a noble company of lords and gentlemen to do her duty to the queen and rested at somerset house till the twenty eighth when she repaired to her majesty at whitehall with many lords and ladies again one morning in march the lady elizabeth took her horse and rode to the palace of sheen with a goodly company of lords ladies knights and gentlemen these visits were probably on account of the return of philip of spain which restored the queen to unwonted cheerfulness for a time and caused a brief interval of gaiety in the lugubrious court we are indebted to the lively pen of giovanni michel the venetian ambassador for the following graphic sketch of the person and character of elizabeth at this interesting period of her life Milady elizabeth says he is a lady of great elegance both of body and mind though her face may be called pleasing rather than beautiful she is tall and well made her complexion fine though rather sallow her bloom must have been prematurely faded by sickness and anxiety for elizabeth could not have been more than three and twenty at this period her eyes but above all her hands which she takes care not to conceal are of superior beauty in her knowledge of the greek and italian languages she surpasses the queen and takes so much pleasure in the latter that she will converse with italians in no other tongue her wit and understanding are admirable as she has proved by her conduct in the midst of suspicion and danger when she concealed her religion and comported herself like a good catholic catherine parr and lady jane grey made no such compromise with conscience indeed this dissimulation on the part of elizabeth appears like a practical illustration of the text the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light michel proceeds to describe elizabeth as proud and dignified in her manners for though she is well aware what sort of a mother she had she is also aware that this mother of hers was united to the king in wedlock with the sanction of the holy church and the concurrence of the primate of the realm this remark is important as it proves that the marriage of anne boleyn was considered legal by the representative of the catholic republic of venice however he goes on to say the queen though she hates her most sincerely yet treats her in public with every outward sign of affection and regard and never converses with her but on pleasing and agreeable subjects a proof by the by that mary neither annoyed her sister by talking at her nor endeavoured to irritate her by introducing the elements of strife into their personal discussions when they were together in this the queen at least behaved with the courtesy of a gentlewoman michel adds that the princess had contrived to ingratiate herself with the king of spain through whose influence the queen was prevented from having her declared illegitimate as she had it in her power to do by an act of parliament which would exclude her from the throne it is believed continues he that but for this interference of the king the queen would without remorse chastise her in the severest manner for whatever plots against the queen are discovered my lady elizabeth or some of her people are always sure to be mentioned among the persons concerned in them michel tells us moreover that elizabeth would exceed her income and incur large debts if she did not prudently to avoid increasing the jealousy of the queen limit her household and followers for continues he there is not a lord or gentleman in the realm who has not sought to place himself or a brother or son in her service her expenses are naturally increased by her endeavors to maintain her popularity although she opposes her poverty as an excuse for avoiding the proposed enlargements of her establishment this plea answered another purpose by exciting the sympathy of her people and their indignation that the heiress of the crown should suffer from straitened finances elizabeth was nevertheless in the enjoyment of the income her father had provided for her maintenance three thousand pounds a year 
equal to twelve thousand per annum of the present currency and presently the same allowance which mary had before her extension to the crown she is pursues michelle to appearance at liberty in her country residence twelve miles from london but really surrounded by spies and shut in with guards so that no one comes or goes and nothing is spoken or done without the queen's knowledge such is the testimony of the venetian ambassador of elizabeth's position in her sister's court but it should be remembered that he is the same man who had intrigued with the conspirators to supply them with arms and that his information is avowedly only hearsay evidence after this it may not be amiss to enrich these pages with the account given by an english contemporary of one of the pageants that was devised for her pleasure by the courteous dragon by whom the captive princess was guarded in her own fair mansion of hatfield and other dominions adjacent in april the same year fifteen fifty seven she was escorted from hatfield to enfield chase by a retinue of twelve ladies clothed in white satin on ambling palfreys and twenty yeomen in green all on horseback that her grace might hunt the hart at entering the chase or forest she was met by fifty archers in scarlet boots and yellow caps armed with gilded bows one of whom presented her a silver-headed arrow winged with peacock feathers sir thomas pope had the devising of this show at the close of the sport her grace was gratified with the privilege of cutting the buck's throat a compliment of which elizabeth who delighted in bear baitings and other savage amusements of those semi-barbarous days was not unlikely to avail herself when her sister queen mary visited her at hatfield elizabeth adorned her great state chamber for her majesty's reception with a sumptuous suit of tapestry representing the siege of antioch and after supper a play was performed by the choir boys of st paul's when it was over one of the children sang and was accompanied on the virginals by no meaner musician than the princess elizabeth herself the account of elizabeth's visit to the queen at richmond and the splendid banquet and pageant which mary with the assistance of sir thomas pope with whom her majesty was long in consultation on the subject devised for the entertainment of her sister has been described in the life of queen mary the pleasant and sisterly intercourse which was for a brief time established between these royal ladies was destined to be once more interrupted by the pertinacious interference of king philip in favor of his friend's matrimonial suit for elizabeth her hand was probably the reward with which that monarch had promised to guarantee his brave friend for his good services at st quentin but the gallant savoyard found it was easier to win a battle in the field under every disadvantage than to conquer the determination of an obdurate lady love elizabeth would not be disposed of in marriage to please any one and as she made her refusal a matter of conscience the queen ceased to importune her on the subject philip as we have seen endeavoured to compel his reluctant wife to interpose her authority to force elizabeth to fulfil the engagement he had made for her and mary proved that she had on occasion a will of her own as well as her sister in short the ladies made common cause and quietly resisted his authority he had sent his two noble kinswomen the duchesses of parma and lorraine to persuade elizabeth to comply with his desire and to convey her to the continent as the bride-elect of his friend but elizabeth by her sister's advice declined receiving these fair envoys and they were compelled to return without fulfilling the object of their mission meantime elizabeth received several overtures from the ambassador of the great gustavus vasa king of sweden who was desirous of obtaining her in marriage for his eldest son prince eric she declined listening to this proposal because it was not made to her through the medium of the queen her sister the ambassador told her in reply that the king of sweden his master as a gentleman and a man of honor thought it most proper to make the first application to herself in order to ascertain whether it would be agreeable to her to enter into such an alliance and if she signified her consent he would then as a king propose it in due form to her majesty this delicacy of feeling was in unison with the chivalric character of gustavus vasa 
who having delivered his country from a foreign yoke had achieved the reformation of her church without persecution or bloodshed and regarding elizabeth as a protestant princess who was suffering for conscience sake was nobly desirous of making her his daughter-in-law elizabeth however who had previously rejected the heir of his neighbor christian of denmark desired the swedish envoy to inform his master that she could not listen to any proposals of the kind that were not conveyed to her through the queen's authority and at the same time declared that if left to her own free will she would always prefer a maiden life this affair reaching her majesty's ears she sent for sir thomas pope to court and having received from him a full account of this secret transaction she expressed herself well pleased with the wise and dutiful conduct of elizabeth and directed him to write a letter to her expressive of her approbation when sir thomas pope returned to hatfield mary commanded him to repeat her commendations to the princess and to inform her that an official communication had now been made to her from the king of sweden touching the match with his son on which she desired sir thomas to ascertain her sister's sentiments from her own lips and to communicate how her grace stood affected in this matter and also to marriage in general sir thomas pope in compliance with this injunction made the following report of what passed between himself and elizabeth on the subject first after i had declared to her grace how well the queen's majesty liked of her prudent and honourable answer made to the same messenger from the king of sweden i then opened unto her grace the effects of the said messenger's credence which after her grace had heard i said that the queen's highness had sent me to her grace not only to declare the same but also to understand how her grace liked the said motion whereunto after a little pause her grace answered in form following master pope i require you after my most humble commendations unto the queen's majesty to render unto the same like thanks that it pleased her highness of her goodness to conceive so well of my answer made to the said messenger and herewithal of her princely commendation with such speed to command you by your letters to signify the same unto me who before remained wonderfully perplexed fearing that her majesty might mistake the same for which her goodness i acknowledge myself bound to honour serve love and obey her highness during my life requiring you also to say unto her majesty that in the king my brother's time there was offered me a very honourable marriage or two and ambassadors sent to treat with me touching the same whereunto i made my humble suit unto his highness as some of honour yet living can be testimonies that it would like the same king edward to give me leave with his grace's favour to remain in that estate i was which of all others best please me and in good faith i pray you say unto her highness i am even at this present of the same mind and so intend to continue with her majesty's favour assuring her highness i so well like this state as i persuade myself there is not any kind of life comparable to it and as concerning my liking the motion made by the said messenger i beseech you say unto her majesty that to my remembrance i never heard of his master before this time and that i so well like both the message and the messenger as i shall most humbly pray god upon my knees that from henceforth i may never hear of the one nor the other not the most civil way in the world it must be owned of dismissing a remarkably civil offer but elizabeth gives her reason in a manner artfully calculated to ingratiate herself with her royal sister and were there nothing else pursues she to move me to mislike the motion other than that his master would attempt the same without making the queen's majesty privy thereunto it were cause sufficient and when her grace had thus ended resumed sir thomas pope in conclusion i was so bold as of myself to say unto her grace her pardon first required that i thought few or none would believe but her grace would be right well contented to marry so there were some honourable marriage offered her by the queen's highness or with her majesty's assent whereunto her grace answered what i shall do hereafter i know not but i assure you upon my truth and fidelity and as god be merciful unto me i am not at this time otherwise minded than i have declared unto you 
no though i were offered the greatest prince in all europe sir thomas pope adds his own opinion of these protestations in the following sly comment and yet per case or perhaps the queen's majesty may conceive this rather to proceed from a maidenly shamefacedness than upon any such certain determination this important letter is among the harleian manuscripts and is endorsed the lady elizabeth her grace's answer made at hatfield the twenty sixth of april fifteen fifty eight to sir t pope knight being sent from the queen's majesty to understand how her grace liked the motion of marriage made by the king elect of switherland's messenger it affords unquestionable proof that elizabeth was allowed full liberty to decide for herself as to her acceptance or rejection of this protestant suitor for her hand her brother-in-law king philip not being so much as consulted on the subject camden asserts that after philip had given up the attempt of forcing her to wed his friend philibert of savoy he would fain have made up a marriage between her and his own son don carlos who was then a boy of sixteen but he finally when he became a widower offered himself to her acceptance instead of his heir elizabeth was so fortunate as to escape any implication in stafford's rebellion but among the spaniards a report was circulated that her hand was destined to reward the earl of westmoreland by whom the insurrection was quelled there were also rumors of an engagement between her and the earl of arundel these are mentioned in gonzales she is always called madame isabel in contemporary spanish memoirs though much has been asserted to the contrary the evidences of history prove that elizabeth was on amicable terms with queen mary at the time of her death and for some months previous to that event on the ninth of november the count de feria one of philip's most confidential counsellors brought the dying queen a letter from her absent consort who already embarrassed in a war with france and dreading the possibility of the queen of scots being placed on the throne requested mary to declare elizabeth her successor the queen had anticipated his desire by her previous appointment of elizabeth from whom she however exacted a profession of her adherence to the catholic creed elizabeth complained that the queen should doubt the sincerity of her faith and if we may credit the duchess of feria added that she prayed god that the earth might open and swallow her alive if she were not a true roman catholic although elizabeth never scrupled through her life to sacrifice truth to expediency it is difficult to believe that any one could to secure a temporal advantage utter so awful a perjury she afterwards told count feria that she acknowledged the real presence in the sacrament at least so the count affirmed in a letter he wrote to philip the second the day before queen mary died she likewise assured the lord lamar of her sincerity in this belief and added that she did now and then pray to the virgin mary stripe who quotes the documents in support of these words of elizabeth offers no contradiction to them edwin sandys in a letter to bollinger gives a very different report of the communication which passed between the royal sisters mary not long before her death says he sent two members of her council to her sister elizabeth and commanded them to let her know that it was her intention to bequeath to her the royal crown together with the dignity that she was then in possession of by right of inheritance in return however for this great favor conferred upon her she required of her three things first that she would not change her privy council secondly that she would make no alteration in religion and thirdly that she would discharge her debts and satisfy her creditors elizabeth replied in these terms i am very sorry to hear of the queen's illness but there is no reason why i should thank her for her intention of giving me the crown of this realm for she has neither the power of bestowing it upon me nor can i lawfully be deprived of it since it is my peculiar and hereditary right with respect to the council i think myself as much at liberty to choose my counsellors as she was to choose hers as to religion i promise thus much that i will not change it provided only that it can be proved by the word of god which shall be the only foundation and rule of my religion 
Lastly, in requiring the payment of her debts, she seems to me to require nothing more than what is just, and I will take care that they shall be paid as far as may lie in my power. Such is the contradictory evidence given by two contemporaries, one of whom, Jane Dormer, afterwards Duchess of Feria, certainly had the surest means of information as to the real state of the case, as she was one of the most trusted of Queen Mary's ladies-in-waiting, and her subsequent marriage to the Spanish ambassador, the Conde de Feria, tended to enlighten her still more on the transactions between the dying queen and the princess. Dr. Sandys was not in England at the time, and merely quotes the statement of a nameless correspondent as to the affairs in England. The lofty tone of Elizabeth's reply suited not the deep dissimulation of her character, and appears inconsistent with the fact that she was at that time, in all outward observances, a member of the Church of Rome. She continued to attend the Mass, and all other Catholic observances, a full month after her sister's death, until she had clearly ascertained that the Protestant party was the most numerous, and likely to obtain the ascendancy. If she, therefore, judged that degree of caution, necessary after the sovereign authority was in her own hands, was it likely that she would declare her own opinion, while the Catholics, who surrounded the dying bed of Mary, were exercising the whole power of the crown? Her answer was probably comprised in language sufficiently mystified to conceal her real intentions from Mary and her counselors. On the 10th of November, Count Feria, in obedience to the directions of his royal master, went to pay his compliments to the princess, and to offer her the assurances of Don Philip's friendship and good will. Elizabeth was then at the house of Lord Clinton, about thirteen miles from London. There Feria sought and obtained an interview with her, which forms an important episode in the early personal annals of this great sovereign. The particulars are related by Feria himself, in a confidential letter to Philip. He says, The princess received him well, though not so cordially as on former occasions. He supped with her and Lady Clinton, and after supper opened the discourse, according to the instructions he had received from the king his master. The princess had three of her ladies in attendance, but she told the count, they understood no other language than English, so he might speak before them. He replied, that he should be well pleased if the whole world heard what he had to say. Elizabeth expressed herself as much gratified by the count's visit, and the obliging message he had brought from his sovereign, of whom she spoke in friendly terms, and acknowledged that she had been under some obligations to him when she was in prison. But when the count endeavored to persuade her that she was indebted for the recognition of her right to the royal succession, neither to Queen Mary or her council, but solely to Don Philip, she exhibited some degree of incredulity. In the same conference, Elizabeth complained, that she had never been given more than three thousand pounds of maintenance, and that she knew the king had received large sums of money. The count contradicted this, because he knew it to be a fact, that Queen Mary had once given her seven thousand pounds, and some jewels of great value, to relieve her from debts in which she had involved herself, in consequence of indulging in some expensive entertainments, in the way of ballets. She then observed, that Philip had tried hard to induce her to enter into a matrimonial alliance with the Duke of Savoy, but that she knew how much favor the Queen had lost by marrying a foreigner. The Count probably felt the incivility of this remark, but only replied carelessly in general terms. Here the details of the conversation end, and Feria proceeds to communicate his own opinions of the princess. It appears to me, says he, that she is a woman of extreme vanity, but acute. She seems greatly to admire her father's system of government. I fear much that in religion she will not go right, as she seems inclined to favor men who are supposed to be heretics, and they tell me the ladies who are about her are all so. She appears highly indignant at the things that had been done against her during her sister's reign. She is much attached to the people, and is very confident that they are all on her side, which is indeed true. In fact, she says, it is they that have placed her in the position she at present holds, as the declared successor to the crown. On this point, Elizabeth, with great spirit, 
refused to acknowledge that she was under any obligation either to the king of spain his council or even the nobles of england though she said that they had all pledged themselves to remain faithful to her indeed concludes the count there is not a heretic or traitor in all the realm who has not started as if from the grave to seek her and offer her their homage two or three days before her death queen mary sent jane dormer to deliver the crown jewels to elizabeth together with her dying requests to that princess first that she would be good to her servants secondly that she would repay the sums of money that had been lent on privy seals and lastly that she would continue the church as she had re-established it philip had directed his envoy to add to these jewels a valuable casket of his own which he had left at whitehall and which elizabeth had always greatly admired in memory of the various civilities this monarch had shown to elizabeth she always kept his portrait in her bedchamber even after they became deadly political foes during the last few days of mary's life hatfield became the resort of the time-serving courtiers who sought to worship elizabeth as the rising sun the conde de feria readily penetrated the secret of those who were destined to hold a distinguished place in her councils and predicted that cecil would be her principal secretary she did not conceal her dislike of her kinsman cardinal pole then on his deathbed he had never she said paid her any attention and had caused her great annoyance there is in letty a long controversial dialogue between elizabeth and him in which the princess appears to have the best of the argument but however widely he might differ with her on theological subjects he always treated her with the respect due to her elevated rank and opposed the murderous policy of her determined foe gardiner he wrote to her in his last illness requesting her to give credit to what the dean of worcester would say in his behalf not doubting but his explanations would be satisfactory but her pleasure or displeasure was of little moment to him in that hour for the sands in the waning glass of life ebbed with him scarcely less quickly than with his departing sovereign and friend queen mary she died on the seventeenth of november he on the eighteenth reports of the death of mary were certainly circulated some hour before it took place and sir nicholas throckmorton who was secretly employed by elizabeth to give her the earliest possible intelligence of that event rode off at fiery speed to hatfield to communicate the tidings the caution of elizabeth taught her that it was dangerous to take any steps toward her own recognition till she could ascertain to a certainty the truth of a report that might only have been devised to betray her into some act that might be construed into treason she bade throckmorton hasten to the palace and request one of the ladies of the bedchamber who was in her confidence if the queen were really dead to send her as a token the black enamelled ring which her majesty wore night and day the circumstances are quaintly versified in the precious throckmorton metrical chronicle of the life of sir nicholas throckmorton then i who was misliked of the time obscurely sought to live scant seen at all so far was i from seeking up to climb as that i thought it well to scape a fall elizabeth i visited by stealth as one who wished her quietness with health repairing off to hatfield where she lay my duty not to slack that i did owe the queen fell very sick as we heard say the truth whereof her sister ought to know that her none might of malice undermine a secret means herself did quickly find she said since not exceedeth woman's fear who still do dread some baits of subtlety sir nicholas know a ring my sister wears enamelled black a pledge of loyalty the which the king of spain in spousals gave if aught fall out amiss tis that i crave but hark ope not your lips to any one in hope as to obtain of courtesy unless you know my sister first be gone for grudging minds will soon coin treachery so shall thyself be safe and us be sure who takes no hurt shall need no care of cure her dying day shall thee such credit get that all will forward be to pleasure thee and none at all shall seek thy suit to let or hinder but go and come and look here to find me thence to court i galloped in post where when i came the queen gave up the ghost 
the ring received my brethren which lay in london town with me to hatfield went and as we rode there met us by the way an old acquaintance hoping advancement a sugared bait that brought us to our bane but chiefly me who therewithal was tain i egged them on with promise of reward i thought if neither credit nor some gain fell to their share the world went very hard yet reckoned i without mine host in vain when to the court i and my brother came my news was stale but yet she knew them true but see how crossly things began to frame the cardinal died whose death my friends may rue for then lord gray and i were sent in hope to find some writings to or from the pope while throckmorton was on his road back to london mary expired and ere he could return with the ring to satisfy elizabeth of the truth of that event which busy rumour had antedated a deputation from the late queen's council had already arrived at hatfield to apprise her of the demise of her sister and to offer their homage to her as their rightful sovereign though well prepared for the intelligence she appeared at first amazed and overpowered at what she heard and drawing a deep respiration she sank upon her knees and exclaimed o domino factum est iliud et est mirable in oculos nostri it is the lord's doing it is marvellous in our eyes which says our authority sir robert naunton we find to this day on the stamp of her gold with this on her silver posui dominum adutorum meum i have chosen god for my helper eight and twenty years afterwards elizabeth in a conversation with the envoys of france castanoff and Belliver, spoke of the tears which she had shed on the death of her sister mary but she is the only person by whom they were ever recorded End of section nine. Section ten of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume six by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter four, Part one while queen mary lay on her deathbed the greatest alarm had prevailed regarding the expected crisis a contemporary who watched closely the temper of the public thus describes the anxieties of the responsible part of the community the rich were fearful the wise careful the honestly disposed doubtful and he adds emphatically the discontented and desperate were joyful wishing for strife as the door for plunder all persons therefore who had anything to lose whatever their religious bias might be must have felt relief at the peaceful extension of elizabeth on the morning of the seventeenth of november parliament which was then sitting assembled betimes for the dispatch of business the demise of the crown was however only known in the palace before noon dr heath the archbishop of york and lord chancellor of england sent a message to the speaker of the house of commons requesting that he with the knights and burgesses of the nether house would without delay adjourn to the upper house to give their assents in a matter of the utmost importance when the commons were assembled in the house of lords silence being proclaimed lord chancellor heath addressed the united senate in these words the cause of your summons hither at this time is to signify to you that all the lords here present are certainly certified that god this morning hath called to his mercy our late sovereign lady queen mary which hap as it is most heavy and grievous to us so we have no less cause otherwise to rejoice with praise to almighty god for leaving us a true lawful and right inheritrix to the crown of this realm which is the lady elizabeth second daughter to our late sovereign of noble memory henry the eighth and sister to our said late queen of whose most lawful right and title to the crown thanks be to god we need not doubt albeit the parliament that is the house of commons by the heavy accident of queen mary's death did dissolve yet as they had been elected to represent the common people of the realm and to deal for them in matters of state they could no way better discharge that trust 
than in joining with the lords in publishing the next succession to the crown wherefore the lords of this house have determined with your assents and consents to pass from hence into the palace and there to proclaim the lady elizabeth queen of this realm without any further tract of time god save queen elizabeth was the response of the lords and commons to the speech of their lord chancellor long may queen elizabeth reign over us and so adds our chronicle was this parliament dissolved by the act of god thus through the wisdom and patriotism of the lord chancellor of england was the title of queen elizabeth rendered indisputable for her first proclamation and recognition were rendered almost solemn acts of parliament it is scarcely possible but that heath must have foreseen his own doom and that of his religion of which he was at that moment with the exception of the expiring pole the ostensible head in england yet it is most evident that he preferred consulting the general good by averting a civil war to the benefit of his own particular class it ought to be remembered that his conduct at this crisis secured the loyalty of the catholics of england to elizabeth all the important acts of the united houses of parliament respecting the recognition of queen elizabeth were completed before the clock struck twelve that seventeenth of november the lords with the heralds then entered the palace of westminster and directly before its hall door after several solemn soundings of trumpets the new queen was proclaimed elizabeth by the grace of god queen of england france and ireland and defender of the faith etc this etc hides an important historical fact namely that she was not then proclaimed supreme head of the church the young duke of norfolk as earl marshal accompanied by several bishops and nobles then went into the city where they met the lord mayor and civic authorities and the heralds proclaimed queen elizabeth at the cross of cheapside in the afternoon all the city bells rang bonfires were lighted ale and wine distributed and the populace invited to feast at tables put out at the doors of the rich citizens all signs of mourning for the deceased queen being entirely lost in the joy for the accession of her sister so passed the first day of the reign of elizabeth a day which came to cheer with hope a season of universal tribulation and misery for besides the inquisitorial cruelties of bonner which had proved plagues sufficient to the london citizens it was a time of famine and of pestilence more universal than the plague which usually confined its ravages to great cities many thousands had in the autumn of fifteen fifty eight fallen victims to a fever called a quotidian ague but which was doubtless a malignant typhus it had broken out in the harvest and carried off so many country people that the harvest rotted on the ground for want of hands great numbers of ecclesiastics had died of this fever thirteen bishops died in the course of four months and to this circumstance the facile change of religion which took place directly may partly be attributed cardinal pole lay in the agonies of death christopherson bishop of chichester and griffin bishop of rochester were either dying or dead while these important scenes were transacting in her senate and metropolis the new sovereign remained probably out of respect to her sister's memory in retirement at hatfield and the ceremony of her proclamation did not take place there till the nineteenth when it was performed before the gates of hatfield house in the same day and hour however in which her accession to the regal office was announced to her she entered upon the high and responsible duties of a vocation for which few princes possessed such eminent qualifications as herself the privy council repaired to the new queen at hatfield and there she sat in council for the first time with them november twentieth sir thomas perry the cofferer of her household cave rogers and sir william cecil were sworn in as members her majesty's address to cecil on that occasion is a noble summary of the duties which he was expected to perform to his queen and country i give you this charge that you shall be of my privy council and content yourself to take pains for me and my realm this judgment i have of you that you will not be corrupted by any manner of gift and that you will be faithful to the state and that without respect to my private will 
you will give me that counsel which you think best and if you shall know anything necessary to be declared to me of secrecy you shall show it to myself only and assure yourself i will not fail to keep taciturnity therein and therefore herewith i charge you elizabeth left no room for doubt or speculation among the eager competitors for her favor as to the minister whom she intended to guide the helm of state for she accepted a note of advice from sir william cecil on the most urgent matters that required her attention that very day and appointed him her principal secretary of state the political tie that was then knit between cecil and his royal mistress though occasionally shaken was only broken by the death of that great statesman who was able to elevate or bend the powers of his acute intellect to all matters of government from measures that rendered england the arbitress of europe to the petty details of a milliner and tailor in sumptuary laws elizabeth commenced her progress to her metropolis november twenty third attended by a magnificent retinue of lords ladies and gentlemen and a prodigious concourse of people who poured out of london and its adjacent villages to behold and welcome her on the road to highgate she met a procession of the bishops who kneeled by the wayside and offered her their allegiance which was very graciously accepted she gave to every one of them her hand to kiss except bonner bishop of london this exception she made to mark her abhorrence of his cruelty the lord mayor and aldermen in their scarlet robes likewise met her and conducted her in great state to the charter house then the town residence of lord north lord chancellor heath and the earls of derby and shrewsbury received her there she stayed at the charter house five days and sat in council every day the queen left the charter house on monday november twenty eighth to take formal possession of her royal fortress of the tower immense crowds assembled to greet her and to gaze on her both without and within the city gates and a mighty retinue of the nobility of both sexes surrounded her she ascended a rich chariot and rode from the charter house along the barbican till she reached cripplegate where the lord mayor and city authorities received her then she mounted on horseback and entered the city in equestrian procession she was attired in a riding dress of purple velvet with a scarf tied over her shoulder the sergeant-at-arms guarded her lord robert dudley as master of the horse rode next her thus early was this favorite exalted to the place he held so long the lord mayor preceded her carrying her sceptre and by his side rode garter king-at-arms lord pembroke rode directly before her majesty bearing the sword of state the queen rode along london wall then a regular fortification which was richly hung with tapestry and the city waits sounded loud music she rode up leadenhall street to grace church street called by our citizen journalist grass church street till she arrived at the blanche chapelton at the entry of the mart or market lane now the well-known mark lane still the corn mart of england though few who transact business there are aware of the extreme antiquity of their station when the queen arrived at the blanche chapelton the tower guns began to herald her approach and continued discharging all the while she progressed down mart lane and tower street she was greeted at various places by playing on regals singing of children and speeches from the scholars of st paul's school the presence of the queen says an eye-witness gave life to all these solemnities she promptly answered all speeches made to her she graced every person either of dignity or office and so cheerfully noticed and accepted everything that in the judgment of the beholders these great honors were esteemed too mean for her personal worth deeply had elizabeth studied her metier du roi before she had an opportunity of rehearsing her part fortunately for her the pride and presumption of youth had been a little tamed by early misfortune and stimulated by the inexorable necessity of self-defense she had been forced to look into human character and adapt her manners to her interest adversity had taught her the invaluable lesson embodied by wordsworth in these immortal words of friends however humble scorn not one as she entered the tower she majestically addressed those about her some said she 
have fallen from being princes of this land to be prisoners in this place i am raised from being a prisoner in this place to be prince of this land that dejection was a work of god's justice this advancement is a work of his mercy as they were to yield patience for the one so i must bear myself to god thankful and to men merciful for the other it is said that she immediately went to her former prison apartment where she fell on her knees and offered up a loud and extempore prayer in which she compared herself to daniel in the lion's den the words of which are in print but bear very strongly the tone of master fox's composition she remained at the tower till the fifth of december holding privy councils of mighty import whose chief tenor was to ascertain what members of the late queen's catholic council would coalesce with her own party which were the remnants of the administration of edward the sixth cecil bacon sadler parr russell and the dudleys likewise to produce a modification between the church of edward the sixth and the henrican or anti-papal church of her father which might claim to be a reformed church with herself for its supreme head on the fifth of december the queen removed from the tower by water and took up her abode at somerset house where a privy council was held daily for fifteen days meantime mass was said at the funerals of queen mary of cardinal pole and the two deceased bishops whose obsequies were observed with all the rites of the ancient church elizabeth attended in person at her sister's burial and listened attentively to her funeral sermon preached by dr white bishop of winchester which was in latin the proverb that comparisons are odious was truly illustrated in this celebrated discourse which sir john harrington calls a black sermon it contained a biographical sketch of the late queen in which he mentioned with great praise her renunciation of church supremacy and repeated her observation that as st paul forbade women to speak in the church it was not fitting for the church to have a dumb head this was not very pleasant to elizabeth who had either just required the oath of supremacy to be administered or was agitating that matter in the privy council had dr white preached in english his sermon might have done her much mischief when the bishop described the grievous suffering of queen mary he fell into such a fit of weeping that his voice was choked for a time when he recovered himself he added that queen mary had left a sister a lady of great worth also whom they were bound to obey for he said melior s canis vivas leone mortuo elizabeth was too good a latinist not to fire at this elegant simile which declared that a living dog was better than a dead lion nor did the orator content himself with this currish comparison for he roundly asserted that the dead deserved more praise than the living for mary had chosen the better part as the bishop of winchester descended the pulpit stairs elizabeth ordered him under arrest he defied her majesty and threatened her with excommunication for which she cared not a rush he was a prelate of austere but irreproachable manners exceedingly desirous of testifying his opinions by a public martyrdom which he did and said all in his power to obtain but elizabeth was at that period of her life too wise to indulge the zealous professors of the ancient faith in any such wishes no author but the faithful and accurate stowe has noted the important result of the daily deliberations held by the queen and her privy council at somerset house at this epoch he says the queen began then to put in practice that oath of supremacy which her father first ordained and amongst the many that refused that oath was my lord chancellor dr heath the queen having a good respect for him would not deprive him of his title but committed the custody of the great seal to nicholas bacon attorney of the wards who from that time was called lord keeper and exercised the authority of lord chancellor as confirmed by act of parliament this oath of supremacy was the test which sifted the council from those to whom the ancient faith was matter of conscience and those to whom it was a matter of worldly business the non-jurors withdrew either into captivity or country retirement of the catholic members of the privy council who remained lord william howard was her majesty's uncle and entire friend 
Sackville was her cousin, the Earl of Arundel her lover. The Marquis of Winchester acted according to his characteristic description of his own policy, by playing the part of the willow, rather than the oak, and from one of the most cruel of Elizabeth's persecutors, became at once the supplest of her instruments. His example was imitated by others in this list, who for the most part appear duly impressed with the spirit of the constitutional maxim, the crown takes away all defects. Elizabeth acted much as Mary did at her accession. She forbade any one to preach without her license, and ostensibly left the rites of religion as she found them, but she for a time wholly locked up the famous pulpit of political sermons, St. Paul's Cross. Meantime, mass was daily celebrated in the chapel royal, and throughout the realm, and the queen, though well known to be a Protestant, conformed outwardly to the ceremonial observances of the Church of Rome. It was desirable that the coronation of Elizabeth should take place speedily, in order that she might have the benefit of the oaths of allegiance, of that part of the aristocracy, who regarded oaths. But a great obstacle arose, there was no one to crown her. The Archbishop of Canterbury was dead. Dr. Heath, the Archbishop of York, positively refused to crown her as supreme head of the church. There were but five or six Catholic bishops surviving the pestilence, and they all obstinately refused to perform the ceremony. Neither would they consecrate any bishops, who were of a different way of thinking. Notwithstanding these signs and symptoms of approaching change, all ceremonies were preparing for celebrating the Christmas festival, according to the rites of the ancient church. It was on the morning of Christmas Day that Elizabeth took the important step of personal secession from the Mass. She appeared in her closet in great state, at the celebration of the morning service, surrounded by her ladies and officers. Oglethorpe, Bishop of Carlisle, was at the altar, preparing to officiate at High Mass, but when the gospel was concluded, and every one expected that the queen would have made the usual offering, she rose abruptly, and with her whole retinue withdrew from the closet into her privy chamber, which was strange to divers. God be blessed for all his gifts, as the narrator of this scene. This withdrawal was to signify her disapprobation of the mass, yet she proceeded softly and gradually, till she ascertained the tone of the new parliament, which had not yet met. Had her conduct on Christmas morning excited general reprobation, instead of approbation, she could have laid her retreat, and that of her personal attendance, on her sudden indisposition. When she found this step was well received, she took another, which was to issue a proclamation, ordering that from the approaching New Year's Day, the litany should, with the epistle and gospel, be said in English, in her chapel, and in all churches. Further alteration was not at this time effected, because it was determined that Elizabeth should be crowned with the religious ceremonials of the Catholic Church, but her mind was occupied with other thoughts than religion, relative to her coronation. She sent her favorite, Robert Dudley, to consult her pet conjurer, Dr. D, to fix a lucky day for the ceremony. Such was the occupations of the great Elizabeth, in the first exercise of her regal power, now dictating the mode of worship in her dominions, now holding a consultation with a conjurer. Elizabeth has been praised for her superiority to the superstitions of her age. Her frequent visits and close consultations with Dr. D, throughout the chief part of her life, are in lamentable contradiction to this panegyric. He had, as already noticed, been prosecuted for telling the fortunes of Elizabeth when princess, and casting the nativity of Queen Mary, to the infinite indignation of that queen. He had, it seems, made a lucky guess as to the short duration of Mary's life, and truly, it required no great powers of divination to do so. Such was the foundation of Queen Elizabeth's faith in this disreputable quack. Her confidential maid, too, Blanche Perry, who was in all the secrets of her royal mistress, before and after her accession, was an avowed disciple of Dr. D, and his pupil in alchemy and astrology. The Queen, her Privy Council, and Dr. D, having agreed that Sunday, the 15th of January, would be the most suitable day for her coronation, she likewise appointed the preceding day, Saturday the 14th, for her grand recognition procession through the city of London. 
as this procession always commenced from the royal fortress of the tower the queen went thither in a state barge on the twelfth of january from the palace of westminster by water the lord mayor and his city companies met her on the thames with their barges decked with banners of their crafts and mysteries the lord mayor's own company namely the mercers had a bachelor's barge and an attendant foist with artillery shooting off lustily as they went with great and pleasant melody of instruments which played in a sweet and heavenly manner her majesty shot the bridge about two o'clock at the still of the ebb the lord mayor with the other barges following her and she landed at the private stairs on tower wharf the queen was occupied the next day by making knights of the bath she likewise created or restored five peers among others she made her mother's nephew sir henry carey lord hunsdon the recognition procession through the city of london was one of peculiar character marked not by any striking difference of parade or ceremony but by the constant drama acted between the new queen and the populace the manner and precedence of the line of march much resembled that previously described in the life of her sister queen mary elizabeth left the tower about two in the afternoon seated royally attired in a chariot covered with crimson velvet which had a canopy borne over it by knights one of whom was her illegitimate brother sir john perrot the queen says george ferrers who was an officer in the procession as she entered the city was received by the people with prayers welcomings cries and tender words and all signs which argue an earnest love of subjects towards their sovereign and the queen by holding up her hands and glad countenance to such as stood afar off and most tender language to those that stood nigh to her grace showed herself no less thankful to receive the people's good will than they to offer it to all that wished her well she gave thanks to such as bade god save her grace she said in return god save you all and added that she thanked them with all her heart wonderfully transported were the people with the loving answers and gestures of the queen the same she had displayed at her first progress from hatfield the city of london might at that time have been termed a stage wherein was shown the spectacle of the noble-hearted queen's demeanour towards her most loving people and the people's exceeding joy at beholding such a sovereign and hearing so princely a voice how many nosegays did her grace receive at poor women's hands how often stayed she her chariot when she saw any simple body approach to speak to her a branch of rosemary given to her majesty with a supplication by a poor woman about fleet bridge was seen in her chariot when her grace came to westminster not without the wondering of such as knew the presenter and noted the queen's gracious reception and keeping the same an apt simile to the stage seems irresistibly to have taken possession of the brain of our worthy dramatist george ferrers in the midst of this pretty description of his liege lady's performance however her majesty adapted her part well to her audience a little coarsely in the matter of gesture perhaps as more casting up her eyes to heaven signing with her hands and moulding her features are described in the course of the narrative than are exactly consistent with the good taste of a gentlewoman in these days nevertheless her spectators were not very far advanced in civilization and she dexterously adapted her style of performance to their appreciation the pageants began in fenchurch street where a fair child in costly apparel was placed on a stage to welcome her majesty to the city the last verse of his greeting shall serve as a specimen of the rest welcome o queen as much as heart can think welcome again as much as tongue can tell welcome to joyous tongues and hearts that will not shrink god thee preserve we pray and wish thee ever well at the words of the last line the people gave a great shout repeating with one assent what the child had said and the queen's majesty thanked graciously both the city for her reception and the people for confirming the same here was noted the perpetual attentiveness in the queen's countenance while the child spake and a marvellous change in her look as the words touched either her or the people so that her rejoicing visage declared that the words took their place in her mind thus elizabeth who steered her way so skilfully till she attained the highest worldly prosperity 
appreciated the full influence of the mute angel of attention. It is evident she knew how to listen, as well as to speak. At the upper end of Grace Church Street, before the sign of the eagle, perhaps the spread eagle, the city had erected a gorgeous arch, beneath which was a stage, which stretched from one side of the street to the other. This was an historical pageant, representing the queen's immediate progenitors. There sat Elizabeth of York, in the midst of an immense white rose, whose petals formed elaborate furbelows round her. By her side was Henry the Seventh, issuing out of a vast red rose, disposed in the same manner. The hands of the royal pair were locked together, and the wedding ring ostensibly displayed. From the red and white roses proceeded a stem, which reached up to a second stage, occupied by Henry the Eighth, issuing from a red and white rose, and for the first time since her disgrace and execution, was the effigy of the queen's mother, Anne Boleyn, represented by his side. One branch sprang from this pair, which mounted to a third stage, where sat the effigy of Queen Elizabeth herself, enthroned in royal majesty, and the whole pageant was framed with wreaths of roses, red and white. By the time the queen had arrived before this quaint spectacle, her loving lieges had become so outrageously noisy in their glee that there were all talkers and no hearers not a word that the child said who was appointed to explain the whole puppet show and repeat some verses could be heard and the queen was forced to command and entreat silence her chariot had passed so far forward that she could not well view the said kings and queens but she ordered it to be backed yet scarcely could she see because the child who spoke was placed too much within. Besides, it is well known, Elizabeth was near-sighted, as well as her sister. As she entered Cornhill, one of the knights, who bore her canopy, observed that an ancient citizen turned away and wept. Yonder is an alderman, he said to the queen, which weepeth and averteth his face. I warrant it is for joy, replied the queen, a gracious interpretation, as the narrator, which makes the best of the doubtful. In Cheapside she smiled, and being asked the reason, she replied, because I have just overheard one say in the crowd, I remember old King Harry the Eighth. The scriptural pageant was placed on a stage, which spanned the entrance of Soper's Lane. It represented the eight Beatitudes, prettily personified by beautiful children. One of these little performers addressed to the queen the following lines, which are a more favorable specimen than usual pageant poetry. Thou hast been eight times blessed, O queen of worthy fame, by meekness thy sprite, when care did thee beset, by mourning in thy grief, by mildness in thy blame, by hunger and by thirst, when right thou couldst not get, by mercy showed not proved, by pureness of thine heart, by seeking peace alway, by persecution wrong, Therefore trust thou in God, since he hath helped thy smart, that as his promise is, so he will make thee strong. The people all responded to the wishes the little spokesman had uttered, whom the queen most gently thanked for their loving good will. Many other pageants were displayed at all the old stations in Cornhill and Cheap, with which our readers are tolerably familiar in preceding biographies. These must we pass by unheeded, so did not Queen Elizabeth, who had some pertinent speech, or at least some appropriate gesture, ready for each. Thus, when she encountered the governors and boys of Christchurch Hospital, all the time she was listening to a speech from one of the scholars, she sat with her eyes and hands cast up to heaven, to the great edification of all beholders. Her reception of the grand allegory of time and truth, at the little conduit in Cheapside, was more natural and pleasing. She asked, who an old man was who sat with his scythe and hourglass? She was told, time. Time, she repeated, and time has brought me here. In this pageant, she spied that Truth held a Bible in English, ready for presentation to her, and she bade Sir John Perrault, the knight nearest to her, who held up her canopy, to step forward and receive it for her, but she was informed that it was not the regular manner of presentation, for it was to be let down into her chariot, by a silken string. She therefore told Sir John Perrault to stay, and at the proper crisis, in some verses recited by truth, the book descended, and the queen received it in both hands, kissed it, 
clasped it to her bosom and thanked the city for this present esteemed above all others she promised to read it diligently to the great comfort of the bystanders throughout the whole of cheapside from every penthouse and window hung banners and streamers and the rich carpets stuffs and cloth of gold tapestried the streets specimens of the great wealth of the stores within for cheapside was the principal location of the mercers and silk dealers in london at the upper end of this splendid thoroughfare were collected the city authorities in their gala dresses headed by their recorder master renolf chomelli who in the name of the lord mayor and the city of london begged her majesty's acceptance of a purse of crimson satin containing a thousand marks in gold and withal beseeched her to continue good and gracious lady and queen to them the queen's majesty took the purse with both hands and readily answered i thank my lord mayor his brethren and ye all and whereas master recorder your request is that i may continue your good lady and queen be ye assured that i will be as good unto ye as ever queen was to a people after pausing to behold a pageant of deborah who governed israel in peace for forty years she reached the temple bar where gog and magog and a concert of sweet-voiced children were ready to bid her farewell in the name of the whole city the last verse of the song of farewell gave a hint of the expected establishment of the reformation farewell o worthy queen and as our hope is sure that into error's place thou wilt now truth restore so trust we that thou wilt our sovereign queen endure and loving ladies stand from henceforth evermore allusions to the establishment of truth and the extirpation of error had been repeated in the previous parts of this song and whenever they occurred elizabeth held up her hands and eyes to heaven and at the conclusion expressed her wish that all the people should respond amen as she passed through temple bar she said as a farewell to the populace be ye well assured i will stand your good queen the acclamations of the people in reply exceeded the thundering of the ordnance at that moment shot off from the tower thus ended this celebrated procession which certainly gave the tone of elizabeth's public demeanor throughout the remainder of her life end of section ten Section 11 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 4, Part 2. The Queen's perplexity regarding the prelate, who was to crown her, must have continued till the last moment, because, had Dr. Oglethorpe, the Bishop of Carlisle, been earlier prevailed on, to perform the ceremony, it is certain proper vestments could have been prepared for him instead of borrowing them from bonner which was actually done on the spur of the moment dr oglethorpe was the officiating bishop at the royal chapel he might therefore consider that he owed more obedience to the sovereign's command than the rest of the catholic prelates the compromise appears to have been that if elizabeth took the ancient oath administered to her catholic predecessors he would set the crown on her head that she took such oath is universally agreed by historians she passed the night preceding her coronation at whitehall and early in the morning came in her barge in procession by water to the old palace at westminster she assumed the same robes in which she afterwards opened parliament a mantle of crimson velvet furred with ermine with a cordon of silk and gold with buttons and tassels of the same a train and surcoat of the same velvet the train and skirt furred with ermine a cap of maintenance striped with passaments of gold lace and a tassel of gold to the same this was by no means in accordance with the jewelled circlets usually worn by queens of england whether consort or regnant preparatory to their coronation there is every reason to believe from the utter exhaustion of the treasury that the coronation of elizabeth was in many instances abbreviated of its usual splendor but one very scarce and imperfect detail exists of it 
for it could not have given pleasure to any party the protestants must have been ashamed of the oath she took and the catholics enraged at her breaking it her procession from westminster hall was met by the one bishop oglethorpe he wore his mitre and the borrowed vestments of bonner three crosses were borne before him and he walked at the head of the singers of the queen's chapel who sang as they went salve festa deis the path for the queen's procession was railed in and spread with blue cloth the queen was conducted with the usual ceremonies to a chair of state at the high altar she was then led by two noblemen to the platform for recognition and presented by bishop oglethorpe as queen trumpets blowing between every proclamation when she presented herself before the high altar she knelt before oglethorpe and kissed the cover or veil of the paten and chalice and made an offering in money she returned to her chair while bishop oglethorpe preached the sermon and bade the beads a service somewhat similar to our litany and the queen kneeling said the lord's prayer then being reseated the bishop administered the coronation oath the precise words of it are omitted but it has been asserted that it was the same exacted for james i and the Stuart kings of england who were required to take a similar oath namely to keep the church in the same state as did king edward the confessor some important points of difference certainly existed between the discipline of the anglo-saxon church of the eleventh century and the roman catholic of the sixteenth century what they were it is the place of theologians to discuss but it is our duty to our subject to suggest as her defence from the horrid appearance of wilful perjury that it is possible she meant at that time to model the reformed church she projected and for which she challenged the appellation of catholic as near as possible to the anglo-saxon church when bishop oglethorpe was kneeling before the altar the queen gave a little book to a lord to deliver to him the bishop refused to receive it and read in other books but immediately afterwards the bishop took the queen's book and read it before her grace it is supposed that the queen sent with her little book a request that oglethorpe would read the gospel and epistle in english which was done and it constituted the sole difference between the former catholic coronations and that of elizabeth then the bishop sang blank here is an hiatus from the manuscript the mass from a missal which had been carried in procession before the queen a carpet was spread before the high altar and cushions of gold cloth placed upon it and the secretary cecil delivered a book to the bishop another bishop standing at the left of the altar the queen now approached the altar and leaned upon cushions while her attendants spread a silken cloth over her and the bishop anointed her it seems she was displeased at this part of the ceremony for when it was finished and she retired behind her traverse to change her dress she observed to her maids that the oil was grease and smelled ill when she reappeared before the public in the abbey she wore a train and mantle of cloth of gold furred with ermine then a sword with a girdle was put upon her the belt going over one shoulder and under the other two garters were put on her arms these were the armilla or armlets and were not connected with the order of the garter then the bishop put the crown upon her head and delivered the sceptre into her hand she was then crowned with another crown probably the crown of ireland the trumpets again sounding the queen then offered the sword laying it on the altar and knelt with the scepter and cross in her hand while the bishop read from a book the queen then returned to her chair of state the bishop put his hands into the queen's hands and repeated certain words this was the homage the whole account being evidently given by an eyewitness not previously acquainted with the ceremony he asserts that the lords did homage to the queen kneeling and kissing her he adds then the rest of the bishops did homage but this must be a mistake because they would have preceded the nobles then the bishop began the mass the epistle being read first in latin and then in english the gospel the same the book being sent to the queen who kissed the gospel she then went to the altar to make her second offering three unsheathed swords being borne before her and one in the scabbard the queen kneeling put money in the basin and kissed the chalice and then and there certain words were read to her grace she retired to her seat again during the consecration and kissed the pax 
she likewise received the eucharist but did not receive from the cup when mass was done she retired behind the high altar and as usual offered her crown robes and regalia in st edward's chapel coming forth again with the state crown on her head and robed in violet velvet and ermine and so proceeded to the banquet in westminster hall the champion of england sir edward dymock performed his official duty by riding into the hall in fair complete armor upon a beautiful courser richly trapped with gold cloth he cast down his gauntlet in the midst of the hall as the queen sat at dinner with offer to fight him in the queen's rightful quarrel who should deny her to be the lawful queen of this realm the proclamation of the heralds on this occasion is a historical and literary curiosity the right the champion offered to defend was according to the proclamation of mr garter king at arms that of the most high and mighty princess our dread sovereign lady elizabeth by the grace of god queen of england france ireland defender of the true ancient and catholic faith most worthy empress from the orcade isles to the mountains pyrenee a largest a largest a largest thus the title of supreme head of the church was not then publicly challenged by elizabeth yet it might appear implied in the addition to her regal style so strangely brought in after the phrase defender of the true ancient and catholic faith as if she were empress of the faith of those who renounced the papal domination from the north of scotland to the reformers in the south of france for what but to mystify the listening ear with some such idea could such a phrase be interpolated in such a ceremony for if she meant to challenge the old claim of bretwalda over scotland why was it not added to her temporal titles besides by claiming the whole kingdom of france in the preceding sentence she had previously asserted her empire over that country to the pyrenees labor dire and weary woe is the struggle for those to appear consistent who are wilfully acting a double part it is withal useless elizabeth far famed as she was for courage personal and mental and both have perhaps been overrated had not at this juncture the moral intrepidity to assert what she had already assumed and acted on in private one of the earliest regnal acts of elizabeth was to send friendly and confidential assurances to the kings of denmark and sweden and all the protestant princes of germany of her attachment to the reformed faith and her wish to cement a bond of union between all its professors at the same time with a view of keeping fair with the catholic powers of europe and obtaining a recognition that would ensure the obedience of her own subjects of that persuasion she directed Carney, her late sister's resident minister at the court of rome to announce her accession to pope paul the fourth and to assure him that it was not her intention to offer violence to the consciences of any denomination of her subjects on the score of religion the aged pontiff incensed at the new doctrine of liberty of conscience implied in this declaration and regarding with hostile feelings the offspring of a marriage which had involved the overthrow of the papal power in england replied that he was not able to comprehend the hereditary right of one not born in wedlock that the queen of scots claimed the crown as the nearest legitimate descendant of henry the seventh but that if elizabeth were willing to submit the controversy to his arbitration every indulgence should be shown to her which justice would permit elizabeth immediately recalled her minister the pope forbade his return under peril of excommunication and Carney, though he talked largely of his loyalty to his royal mistress remained at rome till his death the bull issued by this haughty pontiff on the twelfth of january fifteen fifty eight to fifty nine declaring heretical sovereigns incapable of reigning though elizabeth's name was not mentioned therein was supposed to be peculiarly aimed at her yet it did not deprive her of the allegiance of her catholic peers all of whom paid their liege homage to her as their undoubted sovereign at her coronation the new sovereign received the flattering submissions of her late persecutors with a graciousness of demeanor which proved that the queen had the magnanimity to forgive the injuries and even the insults that had been offered to the princess elizabeth one solitary instance is recorded in which she used an uncourteous expression to a person who had formerly treated her with disrespect 
and now sought her pardon. A member of the late queen's household, conscious that he had offered many petty affronts to Elizabeth, when she was under the cloud of her sister's displeasure, came in a great fright to throw himself at her feet, on her first triumphant assumption of the regal office, and, in the most abject language, besought her not to punish him for his impertinences to her when princess. Fear not, replied the queen. We are of the nature of the lion, and cannot descend to the destruction of mice and such small beasts. To Sir Henry Bedingfeld she archly observed, when he came to pay his duty to her at her first court. Whenever I have a prisoner who requires to be safely and straightly kept, I shall send him to you. She was wont to tease him by calling him her jailer, when in her mirthful mood, but always treated him as a friend, and honored him, subsequently, with a visit at his stately mansion, Oxburg Hall, Norfolk. Elizabeth strengthened her interest in the upper house, by adding and restoring five Protestant statesmen to the peerage. Henry Carey, her mother's nephew, she created Lord Hunsdon. Lord Thomas Howard, brother to the Duke of Norfolk, she made Viscount Bindon. Oliver St. John, also in connection of the Boleyns, Baron of Bletsoe. She restored the brother of Catherine Parr, William, Marquis of Northampton, to the honors he had forfeited in the late reign, by espousing the cause of Lady Jane Grey, and also the son of the late protector, Somerset, Edward Seymour, to the title of Earl of Hertford. The morning after her coronation, she went to her chapel, it being the custom to release prisoners at the inauguration of a sovereign. Perhaps there was some forgotten religious ceremony connected with this act of grace. In her great chamber, one of the courtiers presented her with a petition, and before the whole court, in a loud voice implored, that four or five more prisoners might be released. On inquiry, he declared them to be, the four evangelists and the apostle St. Paul, who have been long shut up in an unknown tongue, as it were, in prison, so they could not converse with the common people. Elizabeth answered very gravely, It is best first to inquire of them, whether they approve of being released or not. The inquiry was soon after made in the convocation appointed by Parliament, the result of which was, that the apostles did approve of their translation. The translation of the scriptures was immediately published by authority, which, after several revisions, became, in the succeeding reign, the basis of our present version. The religious revolution, effected by Elizabeth, was very gently and gradually brought to pass. The queen, writes Jewel to Peter Martyr, though she openly favors our cause, is wonderfully afraid of allowing any innovations. This is owing partly to her own friends, by whose advice everything is carried on, and partly to the influence of Count Feria, a Spaniard, and Philip's ambassador. She is, however, prudently, piously, and firmly following up her purpose, though somewhat more slowly than we could wish. The queen, continues Jewel, regards you most highly. She made so much of your letter, that she read it over a second and third time, with the greatest eagerness. I doubt not but that your book, when it arrives, will be even more acceptable. Her charge to her judges, given about the same time, is noble in the simplicity of its language. It may be noticed, that when Elizabeth used perspicuous phraseology, in speaking or writing, she was usually sincere. Have a care over my people, you have my people, do you that which I ought to do. They are my people. Every man oppresseth and spoileth them without mercy. They cannot revenge their quarrel, nor help themselves. See unto them. See unto them, for they are my charge. I charge you, even as God hath charged me. I care not for myself. My life is not dear to me. My care is for my people. I pray God, whoever succeedeth me, be as careful as I am. They who know what cares I bear, would not think I took any great joy in wearing a crown. These ears, added Dr. Jewell, heard Her Majesty speak these words. The Queen rode in her parliamentary robes on the 25th of January, with all her peers, spiritual and temporal, in their robes, to Westminster Abbey, where she attended a somewhat incongruous religious service. High mass was celebrated at the altar before Queen, Lords, and Commons. The sermon was preached by Dr. Cox, Edward the Sixth, 
Calvinistic schoolmaster, who had returned from Geneva for the purpose. The Queen's supremacy was debated in this Parliament. Dr. Heath, the Lord Chancellor, who took his seat with the rest of the Catholic bishops, spoke against this measure. Finally, the oath of the Queen's supremacy, as confirmed by Parliament, being tendered to Dr. Heath, Archbishop of York, and the rest of the Catholic bishops, all refused it but Landaff. They were deprived of their sees, with which the most illustrious of the Protestant divines were endowed. The learned Dr. Parker, the friend of Anne Boleyn, was appointed by the Queen, Archbishop of Canterbury. He had been in exile for conscience sake in the reign of Queen Mary. Under his auspices, the Church of England was established, by authority of this session of Parliament, nearly in its present state. The common prayer and articles of Edward the Sixth Church being restored, with some important modifications. The translation of the scriptures in English was likewise restored to the people. Before the House of Commons was dissolved, Sir Thomas Gargrave, their speaker, craved leave to bring up a petition to Her Majesty of vital importance to the realm. It was to entreat that she would marry, that the country might have her royal issue to reign over them. Elizabeth received the address presented by the speaker, knights and burgesses of the lower house, seated in state in her great gallery at Whitehall Palace. She paused a short space after listening to the request of the commons, and then made a long oration in reply, which George Ferrers, who was present, recorded, as near as he could bring it away. But whether the fault rests with the royal oratress or the reporter, this task was not very perspicuously achieved. In the course of her speech, she alluded very mysteriously to her troubles in the former reign. From my years of understanding, she said, knowing myself a servitor of Almighty God, I choose this kind of life, in which I do yet live, as a life most acceptable to him, wherein I thought I could best serve him. From which my choice, if ambition of high estate offered me in marriage, the displeasure of the prince, the eschewing the danger of mine enemies, or the avoiding the peril of death, whose messenger the princess's indignation was, continually present before mine eyes, by whose means, if I knew, or do justly suspect, I will not now utter them, or if the whole cause were my sister herself, I will not now charge the dead. Could all have drawn or dissuaded me, I had not now remained in this virgin's estate, wherein you see me. But so constant have I always continued in this my determination, that though my words and youth may seem hardly to agree together, yet it is true that, to this day, I stand free from any other meaning. Towards the conclusion of her speech, she made an observation, which, some years later, would have seemed to imply, the future advantages of the whole island being united, by the succession of the heirs of Stuart, to the English throne. Yet, as Mary of Scotland was then Dauphiness of France, and childless, nothing of the kind could have been in the thoughts of Elizabeth. And albeit it doth please Almighty God, to continue me still in the mind, to live out of the state of marriage, it is not to be feared but he will so work in my heart and in my wisdoms, that as good provision may be made in convenient time, whereby the realm shall not remain destitute of an heir, that may be a fit governor, and perventure, more beneficial to the realm than such offspring as may come of me. For though I be never so careful for your well-doings, yet may mine issue grow out of kind and become ungracious. She then drew from her finger her coronation ring, and showing it to the commons, told them, that, when she received that ring, she had solemnly bound herself in marriage to the realm, and that it would be quite sufficient for the memorial of her name, and for her glory, if, when she died, an inscription were engraved on a marble tomb, saying, Here lieth Elizabeth, which reigned a virgin, and died a virgin. In conclusion, she dismissed the deputation with these words. I take your coming to me in good part, and give to you, Efsoons, my hearty thanks, yet more for your good will and good meaning than for your message. Elizabeth, when she made this declaration, was in the flower of her age, having completed her twenty-fifth year in the preceding September, and according to the description given of her, at the period of her accession to the throne, by Sir Robert Naughton, she must have been possessed of no ordinary personal attractions. 
she was of person tall of hair and complexion fair and therewithal well favoured but high nosed of limb and feature neat and which added to the lustre of these external graces of a stately and majestic comportment participating more of her father than of her mother who was of an inferior ally plausible or as the french have it debonair and affable which descending as hereditary to the daughter did render her of a more sweet temper and endeared her to the love of the people she had already refused the proffered hand of her sister's widower philip the second of spain who had pressed his suit with earnestness amounting to importunity animated by the desire of regaining with another regal english bride a counterbalance to the allied powers of france and scotland it has also been asserted that the spanish monarch had conceived a passion for elizabeth during the life of her sister which rendered his suit more lively and assuredly he must have commenced his overtures before his deceased consort's obsequies were celebrated in his eagerness to gain the start of other candidates elizabeth always attributed his political hostility to his personal pique at her declining to become his wife according to camden philip addressed many eloquent letters to elizabeth during his short but eager courtship and she took infinite pleasure and pride in publishing them among her courtiers philip endeavoured also to overcome the scruples of his royal sister-in-law whom on that occasion he certainly treated as a member of the church of rome by assuring her that there would be no difficulty in obtaining a dispensation from the pope for their marriage elizabeth felt however that it would be a marriage even more objectionable than that of her father henry the eighth with catherine of aragon and that for her to become a party in matrimony contracted under such circumstances would at once by virtually invalidating her own legitimacy declare mary queen of scots the rightful heiress of the late queen her sister in succession to the throne of england and elizabeth had no inclination to risk the contingency of exchanging the regal garland of plantagenet and tudor for the crown matrimonial of spain yet she had a difficult and a delicate game to play for the friendship of spain appeared to be her only bulwark against the combined forces of france and scotland she had succeeded to an empty exchequer a realm dispirited by the loss of calais burdened with debt embarrassed with a base coinage and a starving population ready to break into a civil war under the pretext of deciding the strength of rival creeds by the sword moreover her title to the throne had already been impugned by the king of france compelling his youthful daughter-in-law the queen of scots then in her sixteenth year and entirely under his control to assume the arms and regal style of england on the sixteenth of january fifteen fifty nine the dauphin of france and the queen of scotland his wife did by the style and title of king and queen of england and ireland grant to lord fleming certain things notes sir william cecil in his diary a brief and quiet entry of a debt incurred in the name of an irresponsible child which was hereafter to be paid with heavy interest in tears and blood by that ill-fated princess whose name had in the brief season of her morning splendour filled the hearts of elizabeth and her council with alarm if elizabeth had shared the feminine propensity of leaning on others for succour in the time of danger she would have probably accepted inglorious protection with the nuptial ring of philip but she partook not of the nature of the ivy but the oak being formed and fitted to stand alone and she met the crisis bravely she was new to the cares of empire but the study of history had given her experience and knowledge in the regnal science beyond what can be acquired during years of personal attempts at governing by monarchs who have wasted their youthful energies in the pursuit of pleasure or mere finger-end accomplishments the chart by which she steered was marked with the rocks the quicksands and the shoals on which the barks of other princes had been wrecked and she knew that of all the false beacons that had allured the feeble mind to disgrace and ruin the expedient of calling in foreign aid the seasons of national distress was the most fatal she knew the english character and she had seen the evils and discontents that had sprung from her sister's spanish marriage and in her own case these would have been aggravated by the invalidation of her title to the throne she therefore firmly but courteously declined the proposal 
under the plea of scruples of conscience, which were to her insuperable. This refusal preceded her coronation, for the Spanish ambassador, Count Feria, in consequence of the slight which he conceived had been put upon his master, by the maiden monarch declining the third reversion of his hand, feigned sickness as an excuse for not assisting at that ceremonial. The next month, Philip pledged himself to the beautiful Elizabeth of France, a perilous alliance for Elizabeth of England. It rendered Philip of Spain, and the husband of Mary, Queen of Scots, the formidable rival of her title, brothers-in-law. Elizabeth's first care was to procure an act for the recognition and declaring of her own title from her parliament, which was unanimously passed, and without any allusion to her mother's marriage, or the stigma which had previously been put on her own birth. The statute declares her to be rightly, lineally, and lawfully descended from the blood royal, and pronounces all sentences and acts of parliament derogatory to this declaration to be void. The latter clause is tantamount to a repeal of all those dishonoring statutes, which had passed in the reign of Henry the Eighth against her mother and herself, and in addition, an act was passed, which, without reversing the attainer of Anne Boleyn, rendered Elizabeth inheritable to her mother, and to all her maternal ancestors. This was a prudential care for securing, malgré, all the chances and changes that might befall the crown, a share in the wealth of the citizen family of Boleyn, implying at the same time, that she was the lawful representative of the elder co-heiress of that house, and, of course, born in lawful wedlock. But in a nobler spirit would it have been, to have used the same influence, for the vindication of her mother's honor, by causing the statutes which infamed her to be swept from the records. The want of moral courage on the part of Elizabeth, in leaving this duty unperformed, was injurious to her own royal dignity, and has been always regarded as a tacit admission of Anne Boleyn's guilt. Many writers have argued that it was a point of wisdom in Elizabeth, not to hazard calling attention to the validity of her father's marriage with Anne Boleyn, or the charges against that unfortunate queen. But inasmuch as it was impossible to prevent those subjects from continuing, as they always had been, points of acrimonious discussion, her cautious evasions of questions, so closely touching her own honor, gave rise to the very evils she was anxious to avoid, and we find that a gentleman named Le Bourne was executed at Preston, who died saying, Elizabeth was no queen of England, but only Elizabeth Bullen, and that Mary of Scotland was rightful sovereign. Notwithstanding the danger of her position, from the probable coalition of the powers of Catholic Europe against her, Elizabeth stood undaunted, and, though aware of the difficulty of maintaining a war, with such resources as she possessed, she assumed as high a tone, for the honor of England, as the mightiest of her predecessors, during the conferences at Chateau Cambresses, for the arrangement of a general treaty of pacification, and, declining the offered mediation of Philip the Second, she chose to treat alone. She demanded the restoration of Calais, as the prominent article, and that, in so bold and persevering a manner, that it was guaranteed to her, at the expiration of eight years, by the King of France, under a penalty of five hundred thousand crowns. With a view to the satisfaction of her subjects, she caused Lord Wentworth, the last Lord Deputy of Calais, and others of the late commanders there, to be arraigned, for the loss of a place more dear, than profitable to England, and also to show how firmly the reins of empire could be grasped, in the hand of a maiden monarch. Wentworth was acquitted by his peers, the others were found guilty and condemned, but the sentence was never carried into execution. End of section 11. Section 12 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 4, Part 3. During the whole of Lent, the Queen had kept the fast, heard sermons regularly, and apparelled herself in black, but the happy restoration of peace caused the Easter festival to be observed with unusual rejoicings, 
on st george's day the queen went about the hall and all the knights of the garter singing in procession the same day in the afternoon were four knights elected namely the duke of norfolk the marquis of northampton the earl of rutland and the lord robert dudley master of the queen's horse the following lines from a contemporary poet may not be displeasing to the reader i saw a virgin queen attired in white leading with her a sort of goodly knights with garters and with collars of st george elizabeth on a compartment of bice in gold was writ and hung askew upon her head under a royal crown she was the sovereign of the knights she led her face methink i knew as if the same the same great empress that we now enjoy had climbed the clouds and been in person there to whom the earth the sea and elements auspicious are when elizabeth came to the throne she found herself in a novel position as regarded the order of the garter for her brother-in-law philip of spain had in consequence of his marriage with her late sister queen mary been constituted by the authority of parliament joint sovereign of the order with his royal consort elizabeth having no wish to hold any dignity in partnership with him yet desiring to do all things with proper courtesy caused his banner to be removed to the second stall on the prince's side intimating that he continued a knight companion of the order though he had by the death of the queen his wife lost the joint sovereignty philip however returned the garter by the hands of the queen's ambassador lord montague who had been sent to negotiate a peace but elizabeth did not accept his resignation and he continued a companion of the order till his death notwithstanding the hostile character of his subsequent proceedings towards england elizabeth's first chapter of the order was certainly held in st george's hall at greenwich for we find that the same afternoon she went to baynard's castle the earl of pembroke's place and supped with him and after supper she took boat and was rowed up and down on the river thames hundreds of boats and barges rowing about her and thousands of people thronging the banks of the river to look upon her majesty rejoicing to see her and partaking of the music and sights on the thames it seems there was an aquatic festival in honor of the welcome appearance of their new and comely liege lady on the river for the trumpets blew drums beat flutes played guns were discharged and fireworks played off as she moved from place to place this continued till ten o'clock at night when the queen departed home by thus showing herself so freely and condescendingly to her people she made herself dear and acceptable unto them well indeed had nature qualified elizabeth to play her part with eclat in the imposing drama of royalty by the endowments of wit eloquence penetration and self-possession joined to the advantages of commanding features and a majestic presence she had from childhood upwards studied the art of courting popularity and perfectly understood how to please the great body of the people the honest-hearted mechanical classes won by the frank manner in which she dispensed the cheap but dearly prized favors of gracious words and smiles regarded her with feelings approaching to idolatry and as for the younger nobles and gentlemen of england who attended her court they were almost to a man eager for the opportunity of risking their lives in her service and she knew how to improve the love and loyalty of all ranks of her subjects to the advancement of her power and the defence of her realm the pecuniary aids granted by her first parliament to queen elizabeth though only proportioned to the extreme necessity of the crown at that period were enormous for besides the tenths first fruits and impropriations of church property which had been declined by mary and the grant of tonnage and poundage for life they voted a subsidy of two and eight pence in the pound on all movable goods and four shillings on land to be paid in two several payments how such a property tax was ever gathered after a year of famine and pestilence must indeed appear a marvel to those who witnessed the irritation and inconvenience caused to the needy portion of the middle classes by the infliction of a comparatively trivial impost at present it is always easy to convince the wealthy of the expediency of sacrificing a part to save the whole therefore elizabeth and her acute premier cecil 
laid a heavier burden on the lords of the soil and those who derived their living from ecclesiastical property than on those whose possessions were limited to personals which at that time were chiefly the mercantile and mechanical classes the destitution of the crown having been thus relieved a series of pageants and festivities were wisely ordained by the queen as a sure means of diverting the attention of the good people of london and its neighbourhood from past troubles and present changes stowe gives a quaint account of her majesty coming in great state to st mary's spittal to hear a sermon delivered from the cross on which occasion she was attended by one thousand men in harness with shirts of mail pikes and field pieces with drums and trumpets sounding the procession was closed by morris dancers and two white bears in a cart these luckless animals were of course to furnish a cruel pageant for the recreation of the queen and her loving citizens after the sermon was ended in a letter of the fourteenth of april that eminent reformer jewel laments that the queen continued the celebration of mass in her private chapel it was not till the twelfth of may that the service was changed and the use of latin discontinued the queen observes jewel declines being styled the head of the church at which i certainly am not much displeased elizabeth assumed the title of governess of the church but she finally asserted her supremacy in a scarcely less authoritative manner than her father had done and many catholics were put to death for denying it touching the suitors of elizabeth's hand jewel tells his zurich correspondent that nothing is yet talked about the queen's marriage yet there are now courting her the king of sweden the saxon son of john frederick duke of saxony and charles the son of the emperor ferdinand to say nothing of the englishman sir william pickering i know however what i should prefer but matters of this kind as you are aware are rather mysterious and we have a common proverb that marriages are made in heaven in another letter dated may twenty second fifteen fifty nine he says that public opinion inclines towards sir william pickering a wise and religious man and highly gifted as to personal qualities jewel is the first person who mentions pickering among the aspirants for the hand of queen elizabeth he had been employed on diplomatic missions to germany and france with some credit to himself and the queen bestowed so many marks of attention upon him that the spanish ambassador as well as our good bishop and others fancied that he had as fair a chance of success as the sons of reigning princes he is also mentioned by camden as a gentleman of moderate fortune but comely person it is possible that pickering had performed some secret service for elizabeth in the season of her distress which entitled him to the delusive honour of her smiles as there is undoubtedly some mystery in the circumstance of a man scarcely of equestrian rank encouraging hopes so much above his condition be this as it may he quickly vanished from the scene and was forgotten on the twenty third of may a splendid embassy from france headed by the duc de montmorency arrived for the purpose of receiving the queen's ratification of the treaty of cambresses they landed at the tower wharf and were conducted to the bishop of london's palace where they were lodged on the following day they were brought in great state by a deputation of the principal nobles of the court through fleet street to a supper banquet with the queen at her palace at westminster where they were entertained with sumptuous cheer and music till after midnight on the following day they came gorgeously apparelled to dine with her majesty and were recreated afterwards with the baiting of bears and bulls the queen's grace herself and the ambassador stood in the gallery looking on the pastime till six in the evening on the twenty sixth another bull and bear baiting was provided for the amusement of the noble envoys at paris garden and on the twenty eighth when they departed they were presented with many mastiffs for the nobler purpose of hunting their wolves on the eleventh of june at eight o'clock at night the queen and her court embarked in their barges at whitehall and took their pleasure on the river by rowing along the bank and crossing over to the other side with drums beating and trumpets sounding and so to whitehall again the londoners were so lovingly disposed to their maiden sovereign that when she withdrew to her summer bowers at greenwich they were fain to devise all sorts of gallant shows 
to furnish excuses for following her there to enjoy from time to time the sunshine of her presence they prepared a sort of civic tournament in honor of her majesty july second each company supplying a certain number of men-at-arms fourteen hundred in all all clad in velvet and chains of gold with guns morris pikes halberds and flags and so marched they over london bridge into the duke of suffolk's park at southwark where they mustered before the lord mayor and in order to initiate themselves into the hardships of a campaign they lay abroad in st george's field all that night the next morning they set forward in a goodly array and entered greenwich park at an early hour where they reposed themselves to eight o'clock and then marched down into the lawn and mustered in their arms all the gunners being in shirts of mail it was not however till eventide that her majesty deigned to make herself visible to the doughty bands of cockaine chivalry they cannot properly be called for they had discreetly avoided exposing civic horsemanship to the mockery of the gallant equestrians of the court and trusted no other legs than their own with the weight of their valor and warlike accoutrements in addition to their velvet gabardines and chains of gold in which this midsummer bevy had bivouacked in st george's field on the preceding night at five o'clock the queen came into the gallery of greenwich park gate with the ambassadors lords and ladies a fair and numerous company then the lord marquis of northampton queen catherine parr's brother whom like edward the sixth elizabeth ever treated as an uncle her great uncle lord william howard lord admiral of england and lord robert dudley her master of the horse undertook to review the city muster and to set their battles in array to skirmish before the queen with flourish of trumpets alarum of drums and melody of flutes to encourage the counter champions to the fray three onsets were given the guns discharged on one another the moorish pikes encountered together with great alarm each ran to his weapon again and then they fell together as fast as they could in imitation of close fight while the queen and her ladies looked on after all this mr chamberlain and divers of the commons of the city and whifflers came before her grace who thanked them heartily and all the city whereupon was given the greatest shout ever heard with hurling up of caps and the queen showed herself very merry after this was a running at tilt and lastly all departed home to london as numerous if not as valiantly disposed a company poured down from the metropolis to woolwich on the morrow for on that day july third the queen went in state to witness the launch of a fine new ship of war which in her honor was called the elizabeth the gallantry of the city muster inspired the gentlemen of the court with loyal emulation and they determined to tilt on foot with spears before the queen also in greenwich park the challengers were three the earl of ormond sir john perrot and mr north and there were defendants of equal prowess with lances and swords the whole of the queen's band of pensioners were however to run with spears and preparations were made for a royal and military feat champetre such as might be imitated with admirable effect in windsor park even now it was both the policy and pleasure of the last of the tudor sovereigns to keep her loving metropolis in good humor by allowing the people to participate as far at least as looking on went in her princely recreation half the popularity of elizabeth proceeded from the care she took that the holidays of her subjects should be merry days if ever any person had either the gift or the style to win the hearts of the people says hayward it was this queen but to return to her july evening pageant in the green glades of greenwich park a goodly banqueting house was built up for her grace with fir poles and decked with birch branches and all manner of flowers both of the field and garden as roses july flowers lavender marigolds and all manner of strewing herbs and rushes there were also tents set up for providing refreshments and a space made for the tilting about five in the afternoon came the queen with the ambassadors and the lords and ladies of her train and stood over the park gate to see the exercise of arms and afterwards the combatants chasing one another 
then the queen took her horse and accompanied by three ambassadors and her retinue rode to the sylvan pavilion where a costly banquet was provided for her this was succeeded by a mask and the entertainment closed with fireworks and firing of guns about midnight but while elizabeth appeared to enter into these gay scenes of festive pageantry with all the zest of a young sprightly and handsome woman who emerging suddenly from restraint retirement and neglect finds herself the delight of every eye and the idol of all hearts her mind was intent on matters of high import and she knew that the flowers with which her path was strewn concealed many a dangerous quicksand from those who looked not below the surface within one little month of the solemn ratification of the treaty of chateau cambresses by the plenipotentiaries of france in her court her right to the crown she wore had been boldly impugned by henry the second's principal minister of state the constable de montmorency who when the duke de nemours a prince nearly allied to the throne of france informed him of his intention of seeking the queen of england in marriage exclaimed do you not know that the queen dolphin has right and title to england a public demonstration of this claim was made at the jousts in honor of the espousals of the french king's sister with the duke of savoy elizabeth's oft rejected suitor when the scotch heralds displayed the escutcheon of their royal mistress the queen of scots quartered with those of france and england which was afterwards protested against by the english ambassador throckmorton it was retorted that elizabeth had assumed the title of queen of france at her coronation a pretension too absurd as the operation of the salic law had always incapacitated females from inheriting the sceptre of that realm even when born as in the case of the daughter of louis Hutton, sole issue of a reigning monarch representing the ancient royal line of france calais the last relic of the conquests of edward the third and henry v was now in the hands of the french government and although henry the second had virtually acknowledged the right of elizabeth to that town by binding himself to restore it at the end of eight years and a chimerical proposition had also been made to settle all disputes for its possession by both claimants ceding it as a marriage portion to an imaginary first-born son of elizabeth and daughter of mary stuart by francis of valois or otherwise to the son of mary and daughter of elizabeth it was mere temporizing diplomacy the mighty plan of uniting the gallic and britannic empires beneath the sceptres of francis of valois and mary of scotland had never ceased to occupy the attention of henry the second from the death of edward the sixth till his own course was suddenly cut short by the accidental wound he had received from a splinter of his opponent's lance while tilting in honor of his daughter's nuptials that event produced an important change in the fortunes of england's elizabeth she was at once delivered from the most dangerous and insidious of her foes and the consequences of the formidable alliance between france and spain for although the rival claims of his consort to the throne of england were asserted by francis the second he was a sickly youth inheriting neither the talents nor the judgment of his father the nominal power of france and scotland both passed into the hands of mary stuart's uncles the princes of lorraine and guise but the rival factions both political and religious by which they were opposed and impeded on every side deprived them of the means of injuring elizabeth who on her part actively employed agents as numerous as the arms of briarius in sowing the seeds of discord and nursing every root of bitterness that sprang up in those unhappy realms the fulminations of john knox against female government had incited the reform party to resist the authority of the queen dowager mary of lorraine to whom the regent arran had in 1555 reluctantly resigned his office the queen regent after an ill-judged fruitless struggle to crush the progress of the reformation summoned the earl of arran who had recently accepted the french dukedom of chatel harrow to her aid as the most powerful peer in scotland and the next in succession to the throne on which in fact he had from the first cast a longing regard he was the head of the potent house of hamilton but his designs had been checked by the rival faction of the earl of lennox 
and subsequently by the more popular and able party of the young queen's illegitimate brother the earl of murray and now although he gave his lukewarm succor to the queen regent in her need he suffered himself to be deluded by the english cabinet with the idea that the crown might be transferred from the brows of his absentee sovereign to his own or rather to those of his heir the earl of arran to whom queen elizabeth had been offered in her childhood by her father henry the eighth there is every reason to believe that cecil seriously meditating uniting the island crowns by a marriage between his royal mistress and young arran if the hamilton party in scotland had succeeded in deposing queen mary and placing him on the throne the young earl who had been colonel of the scotch guards at paris had in anticipation of a more brilliant destiny embraced the reform religion and as it is supposed at the suggestion and with the aid of throckmorton elizabeth's ambassador at paris absconded from the french service and after visiting geneva to arrange his plans with the leaders of that church he came privately to england the secret and confidential conference which he held with queen elizabeth on the sixth of august must have taken place at the ancient palace of eltham where she arrived on the preceding day arran was young and handsome but weak-minded at times indeed subject to the dire malady which clouded the mental perceptions of his father and brothers just the subject for the royal coquette and her wily premier to render a ready tool in any scheme connected with hopes of aggrandizement for himself as the plan and limits of this work will not admit of launching into the broad stream of general history the events of the scotch campaign which commenced with elizabeth sending an army and a fleet to aid the insurgent lords of the congregation in defending themselves against the french forces called in by the queen regent and ended by giving her a predominant power in the councils of that distracted realm cannot be detailed here the manuscripts in the state paper office attest the fact that the lord james mary's illegitimate brother afterwards so celebrated as the regent murray and the principal leaders of the popular party were the pensioners of elizabeth the treaty of edinburgh was framed according to her interest and proved of course unsatisfactory to the queen of scots and her consort i will tell you freely said mary's uncle the cardinal of lorraine to the english ambassador throckmorton the scots do perform no part of their duties the king and queen have the names of their sovereigns and your mistress hath the effect and obedience the congregational parliament had dispatched a solemn embassy to elizabeth consisting of lethington and the earls of morton and glencairn to entreat her to join in marriage with the earl of arran the cardinal lorraine in allusion to the errand of these nobles said to throckmorton this great legation goeth for the marriage of your queen with the earl of arran what shall she have with him i think her heart too great to marry with such a one as he is and one of the queen's subjects it was not in elizabeth's nature to return an immediate or direct answer in any matter of state policy especially if involving a proposal of marriage the unexpected death of the royal husband of the queen of scots probably hastened elizabeth's decision with regard to her scottish suitor and she declined the offer in terms of courtesy thanking the nobles at the same time for their good will in offering her the choicest person they had arran immediately afterwards became as doubtless elizabeth was aware he would the suitor of his own fair sovereign the widowed mary stuart it will now be necessary to return to the chronological order of the personal history of elizabeth which we have a little antedated in putting the reader in possession of the result of the earl of arran's courtship the queen had many wooers in the interim both among foreign princes and her subjects of these henry fitz Allen, earl of arundel claims the first mention as the foremost in rank and consequence he was the premier earl of england and at that time there was but one peer of the ducal order his son-in-law thomas howard duke of norfolk as the last male of the illustrious house of fitz Allen, he boasted the blood of the plantagenets and of the ancient royal line of charlemagne and st louis and he was nearly allied in blood to the queen as a descendant of woodville earl of rivers his possessions were proportioned at his high rank and proud descent 
he had been materially instrumental in placing the crown on the head of the rightful heiress queen mary at the time of the brief usurpation of the hapless lady jane grey and though his ardent loyalty to the late queen and his zeal for the old religion had induced him at first to take part against elizabeth at the time of the wyatt rebellion we have shown how soon his manly heart revolted in her favor and that she was in all probability indebted to his powerful protection for the preservation of her life from the malignant and lawless practices of gardiner and his party it is certain that he forfeited the favor of mary by the boldness with which he afterwards stood forth in the court the council and the senate as the advocate of the captive princess and that he was employed in embassies to foreign courts to keep him from dangerous enterprises at home his only son whom he had offered to contract to elizabeth in marriage in the time of her great adversity was no more and the stout earl who had not exceeded his forty-seventh year recalling perchance some of the artful compliments to himself with which the royal maid had declined to enter into an engagement with his heir hastened home from brussels on the death of her sister and presented himself as a candidate for her hand of all the lovers of elizabeth his attachment was probably the most sincere as it commenced in the season of persecution he now as lord steward of the royal household enjoyed many opportunities of preferring his suit and albeit the maiden majesty of england had no intention of becoming the third wife of one of her subjects old enough to be her father she gave him sufficient encouragement to excite the jealousy of the other courtiers if not to afford himself reasonable hopes of success about the eighth of august fifteen fifty nine the queen honored him with a visit at nonsuch one of the royal residences of which he appears to have obtained a lease from queen mary here on the sunday night he entertained her majesty with a sumptuous banquet and a mask accompanied with military music till midnight on monday a splendid supper was provided for the royal guest who previously from a stand erected for her in the further park witnessed a course at night the children of st paul's school under the direction of their music master sebastian performed a play which was succeeded by a costly banquet with music the queen was served on richly gilded plate the entertainment lasted till the unusual late hour of three in the morning and the earl presented her majesty with a cupboard of plate which was the first of those expensive offerings elizabeth habitually accustomed herself to receive and sometimes almost extorted from her nobles by feeding the hopes of arundel elizabeth obtained his vote and influence in the council and senate whenever she had a point to carry even with regard to the peaceful establishment of the reformed church the royal weapon of coquetry was also exercised though in a playful and gracious manner towards her former cruel foe paulet marquis of winchester the lord treasurer by whom she was splendidly entertained at his house at basing soon after her accession to the throne at her departure her majesty merrily bemoaned herself that he was so old for else by my troth said she if my lord treasurer were but a young man i would find it in my heart to have him for my husband before any man in england when the announcement of the marriage of her former suitor philip the second with her fair namesake of france was made to elizabeth she pretended to feel mortified and complained to the ambassador of the inconstancy of his master who could not she said wait four short months to see if she would change her mind she always kept the portrait of this prince by her bedside it has been said as a token of regard but the probability is that she found it there when she took possession of the state apartments occupied by the late queen her sister the person however who held the most conspicuous place in her majesty's favor and through whose hands the chief performance and patronage of her government flowed was lord robert dudley at that period a married man he was born in the same auspicious hour with the queen with whom his destiny became inseparably connected from the time they were both prisoners in the tower from the first month of her accession to the throne elizabeth so remarkable for her frugal distribution of rewards and honors showered wealth and distinctions on him she conferred the office of master of horse on him in the first instance 
with the fee of one hundred marks per annum and the lucrative employment of head commissioner for compounding the fines of such as were desirous of declining the order of knighthood and he was soon after invested with the garter and made constable of windsor castle and forest and keeper of the great park during life his wife amy robsart a wealthy heiress whom he had wedded with great pomp and publicity during the reign of edward the sixth was not allowed by him to appear among the noble matronage of elizabeth's court lest she should mar the sunshine of his favour by reminding his royal mistress of the existence of so inconvenient a personage elizabeth's undisguised partiality for the handsome dudley excited the jealousy of the other members of her council and even the politic cecil could not forbear hazarding a biting jest to elizabeth on the subject when he told her of the misalliance of her cousin Frances, Duchess of Suffolk, with her equerry, Adrian Stokes. What? exclaimed her majesty. Has she married her horse-keeper? Yea, madam, replied the premier, and she says you would like to do the same with yours. Cecil's innuendo was undoubtedly meant to warn the queen that her intimacy with Dudley was likely to prove injurious to her reputation, and derogatory to the dignity of the crown sir thomas challoner her majesty's representative at the court of spain had in a private postscript to one of his dispatches addressed the following intimation to the premier on this delicate subject i assure you sir these folks are broad-minded where i spoke of one too much in favour as they esteem i think ye guess whom they named if ye do not i will upon my next letter write further to tell you what i conceive as i count the slander most false so a young princess cannot be too wary what countenance or familiar demonstration she maketh more to one than another i grudge no man's service in the realm worth the entertainment with such a tale of obloquy or occasion of speech to such men of evil will are ready to find faults Challoner goes on to express the vexation he, as an attached servant of the queen, feels at the impediment such reports are likely to cause in her majesty's marriage, to the detriment of her whole realm, ministering matter for lewd tongues to discant upon, and breeding contempt. All this, he states, is written in strict confidence to his friend Cecil, and entreats him to keep it to himself. He then alludes to an overture of marriage, which had been made to the queen by the king of Spain, in behalf of his cousin, the Archduke Charles, the Emperor Ferdinand's second son, a prince of noble qualities and stainless reputation. He was a Catholic, and Elizabeth on that account, probably, or mistrusting the quarter whence the proposal came, had returned an evasive and unsatisfactory answer. Challoner evidently considered that the indifference of the queen proceeded from her predilection in favor of the person to whom he had just alluded, and appears anxious lest the honorable alliance should be lost. Consider, says he, how ye deal now in the emperor's matter, much dependeth on it. Here they hang in expectation, as men desirous it should go forward, but as yet they have small hope in mine opinion be it said to you only the affinity is great and honourable the amity necessary to stop and cool many enterprises ye need not fear his greatness should overrule you he is not a philip but better for us than a philip the suit of this accomplished prince was afterwards preferred in due form to elizabeth by Count Elphinstone, the Emperor's ambassador, and she protested openly, that of all the illustrious marriages that had been offered to her, there was not one greater, or that she affected more than that of the Archduke Charles, and expressed a desire to see him in England. It was generally expected that the prince would come under an assumed character to visit the court of England, and obtain a first sight of his royal lady by stealth, but this chivalric project, well worthy of the poetic age which gave birth to spencer shakespeare and sir philip sidney was never carried into effect their differences as to their jarring creeds as elizabeth demanded conformity to the protestant form of worship appeared insuperable and for a time put an end to the negotiations though they were subsequently renewed as will be related in due course meantime the suit of a royal candidate of the reformed religion for her hand was renewed by the king of sweden in behalf of his heir prince eric 
the ambassador chosen to plead his cause was john duke of finland the second son of the swedish monarch a prince of singular talents and address and possessed of great personal attractions on the twenty seventh of september this distinguished envoy landed at harwich and on the fifth of october he was met and welcomed at colchester in the name of the queen by the earl of oxford and lord robert dudley by whom he was conducted to london at the corner of gracechurch street leadenhall he was received by the marquis of northampton lord ambrose dudley and a fair company of ladies as well as gentlemen in rich array with the escort of one hundred yeomen on horseback with trumpets sounding he proceeded over london bridge to the bishop of winchester's palace which was appointed for his abode it being the custom in the good old times to quarter any foreigner of distinguished rank and his train on some wealthy noble or prelate for board and entertainment seven days after the prince of sweden came by water to the court with his guard and was honorably received by many noble personages at the hall door where the guard stood in their rich coats in a line which extended to the presence chamber where the queen received him with the honors due to a royal visitor and welcomed him with great cordiality whenever he went in state to court he threw handfuls of money among the populace saying he gave silver but his brother would give gold the swede and charles the son of the emperor observes bishop jewel are courting at a most marvellous rate but the swede is most in earnest for he promises mountains of silver in case of success the lady however is probably thinking of an alliance nearer home in november there were great jousts at the queen's palace the lord robert and lord hunsdon were the challengers who wore scarves of white and black the defendants were lord ambrose dudley and others wearing scarves of red and yellow sarcenet on the last day of the merry year of fifteen fifty nine a play was acted in court before the queen but we learn that the license usually showed on such occasions being abused in this instance they acted something so distasteful to her majesty that they were commanded to break off and were superseded by a mask and dancing on the first of january prince john of sweden came gorgeously apparelled to the court to offer the new year's greeting to her majesty his retinue wore velvet jerkins and rich gold chains it was an equestrian procession and his guards carried halberts in their hands that day her majesty's silk woman mistress montague brought her for her new year's gift a pair of knit black silk stockings the queen after wearing them a few days was so much pleased with them that she sent for mistress montague and asked her from whence she had them and if she could help her to any more i made them very carefully on purpose only for your majesty said she and seeing these please you so well i will presently set more in hand do so replied the queen for indeed i like silk stockings well because they are pleasant fine and delicate and henceforth i will wear no more cloth stockings and from that time to her death the queen never more wore cloth hose but only silk stockings these knit silk stockings were imitations of some which had been previously sent from spain perhaps manufactured by the moors it may be observed that elizabeth on her accession to the throne considering it no longer expedient to mortify her inordinate love of dress by conforming to the self-denying costume of the more rigid order of reformers who then began to be known by the name of puritans passed from one extreme to the other and indulged in a greater excess of finery and elaborate decoration than was ever paralleled by any other queen of england regnant or consort horace walpole speaking of her portraits observes that there is not one that can be called beautiful the profusion of ornaments with which they are loaded are marks of her continual fondness for dress while they entirely exclude all grace and leave no more room for a painter's genius than if he had been employed to copy an indian idol completely composed of bands and necklaces a pale roman nose a head of hair loaded with crowns and powdered with diamonds a stiff ruff a vaster fardingale and a bushel of pearls are the features by which everybody knows at once the pictures of elizabeth it is observable that her majesty thought enormity of dress a royal prerogative for in fifteen seventy nine an order was made in the star chamber 
that no person should use or wear excessive long cloaks as of late be used and before two years past hath not been used in this realm no persons to wear such great ruffs about their necks to be left off such monstrous undecent attiring in her father's reign who dictated everything from religion to fashions he made an act prohibiting the use of cloth of gold silver or tinsel satin silk or cloth mixed with gold any sable fur velvet embroidery in gowns or outermost garments except for persons of distinction dukes marquises earls or gentlemen and knights that had two hundred and fifty pounds per annum this act was renewed second of elizabeth no one who had less than a hundred pounds per annum was to wear satin or damask or fur of conies none not worth twenty pounds per annum or two hundred pounds capital to wear any fur save lamb nor cloth above ten shillings the yard the record of presents made by elizabeth to the ladies of her court is scanty especially at the early part of her reign but in a curious manuscript wardrobe book of that queen in the possession of sir thomas phillips baronet appears this item delivered the thirtieth of april anno quatuor regina elizabeth to the lady wodehouse one loose gown of black velvet embroidered overwarth and cut between the borders with a lozenge cut lined with sarcenet and fustian and edged with luzarnes and one french kirtle of purple satin raised lined with purple taffeta belonging to the late queen mary End of section 12. Section 13 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 4, Part 4 before elizabeth had given any decided answer touching the swedish match the aged king gustavus died and her suitor eric succeeded to the throne of that realm and having become jealous of his brother whom he suspected not without reason perhaps of playing the wooer on his own account he recalled him and sent an ambassador to renew the matrimonial negotiations in his name the arrival of the new plenipotentiary nicholas guildenstern caused great excitement among the londoners for it was reported that he had brought two ships laden with treasure as presents for the queen eighteen large pied horses and several chests of bullion it seems were actually presented to her majesty in the name of her royal wooer with an intimation that he would quickly follow in person to lay his heart at her feet this announcement caused a little prudish perplexity to elizabeth and her council about the manner in which the king of sweden should be received on his arrival in the palace the queen's majesty being a maid as eric was the handsomest man in europe if he had come in person it is possible that with elizabeth's admiration for beauty the result might have been different but she was not to be won by proxy courtship as however it had pleased her to accept the king's presence he was naturally regarded by the nation as her bridegroom elect the desire of some of the speculative pictorial publishers of the day to be the first to gratify the loyal public with united resemblances of the illustrious couple occasioned the following grave admission to be addressed by the secretary of state to the lord mayor it may please your lordship the queen's majesty understandeth that certain bookbinders and stationers do utter certain papers wherein be printed the face of her majesty and the king of sweden and although her highness is not miscontented that either her own face or the said king's should be printed or portraited yet to be joined in the same paper with the said king or with any other prince that is known to have made any request for marriage to her majesty is not to be allowed and therefore her majesty's pleasure is that your lordship should send for the wardens of the stationers or for the wardens of any other men that have such papers to sell and to take order with them that all such papers be taken and packed up together in such sort that none be permitted to be seen in any part 
for otherwise her majesty might seem touched in honour by her own subjects that would in such papers declare an allowance to have herself joined as it were in marriage with the said king where indeed her majesty hitherto cannot be induced whereof we have cause to sorrow to allow of marriage with any manner of person one of these contraband engravings if in existence would at present be readily purchased at its weight in gold about the same period that united resemblances of elizabeth and her comely northern suitor were thus peremptorily suppressed her old preceptor roger ashcombe whom she had continued in the post of latin secretary and occasionally made her counsellor on matters of greater importance than the niceties of learned languages informs his friend sturmius that he had shown her majesty a passage in one of his letters relating to the scotch affairs and another on the interesting subject of her marriage sturmius it seems having undertaken through the medium of the latin secretary to advocate the suit of eric king of sweden to the regal spinster the queen read remarked and graciously acknowledged in both of them writes ashcombe your respectful observance of her your judgment in affairs of scotland as they then stood she highly approved and she loves you for your solicitude respecting us and our concerns the part respecting her marriage she read over thrice as i well remember and with somewhat of a gentle smile but still preserving a modest and bashful silence concerning that point indeed my dear sturmius pursues he i have nothing certain to write to you nor does any one truly know what to judge i told you rightly in one of my former letters that in the whole ordinance of her life she resembled not phaedra but hippolyta for by nature and not by the counsels of others she is thus averse and abstinent from marriage when i know anything for certain i will write it to you as soon as possible in the meantime i have no hopes to give you respecting the king of sweden after this confidential passage the preceptor secretary launches forth into more than his wonted encomiums on the learning of his royal pupil declaring that there were not four men in england either in church or the state who understood more greek than her majesty and as an instance of her proficiency and other tongues he mentions that he was once present at court when she gave answers at the same time to three ambassadors the imperial the french and the swedish in italian french and latin fluently gracefully and to the point elizabeth who was perfectly aware of the important influence of men of learning united with genius on the world at large paid sturmius the compliment of addressing to him a letter expressing her sense of the attachment he had manifested towards herself and her country promising withal that her acknowledgments shall not be confined to words alone while elizabeth was yet amusing herself with the addresses of the royal swedes for there can be little doubt that eric's jealousy of the brother who finally deprived him of his crown was well founded with regard to his attempts to supplant him in the good graces of the english queen the king of denmark sent his nephew adolphus duke of holstein to try his fortune with the illustrious spinster he was young handsome valiant and accomplished and in love with the queen but though one of the busybodies of the court wrote to her ambassador in paris that it was whispered her majesty was very fond of him he was rejected like the rest of her princely wooers she however treated him with great distinction made him a knight of the garter and pensioned him for life the duke of holstein has returned home says jewel after a magnificent reception by us with splendid presents from the queen having been elected into the order of the garter and invested with its gold and jewelled badge the swede is also reported to be always coming and even now to be on his voyage and on the eve of landing but as far as i can judge he will not stir a foot elizabeth it appears thought otherwise for it is reported by that pleasant gossip allen in a letter written from the court that her majesty was in the month of september in hourly expectation of the arrival of her royal suitor and that certain works were in hand in anticipation of his arrival at westminster at which the workmen labored day and night in order to complete the preparations for his reception after all 
Eric never came, having reasons to believe that his visit would be fruitless, and finally consoling himself for his failure in obtaining the most splendid match in Europe by marrying one of his own subjects. The death of the favorite's wife at this critical juncture, under peculiar suspicious circumstances, gave rise to dark and mysterious rumors that she had been put out of the way to enable him to accept the willing hand of a royal bride. Lever, one of the popular preachers of the day, exhorted Cecil and Knollys to investigate the matter, because, of the grievous and dangerous suspicion and muttering of the death of her that was the wife of my lord Robert Dudley. Some contradictory statements, as to the manner in which the mischance, as it was called, happened to the unfortunate lady, were offered by the sprightly widower and the persons in whose care, or rather we should say, in whose custody, the deserted wife of his youth was kept at Coomner Hall, in Berkshire, and it was declared by the authorities, to whom the depositions were made, that her death was accidental. So little satisfactory was the explanation, that even the cautious Cecil expressed his opinion, that Dudley was infamed by the death of his wife. Throckmorton, the English ambassador at Paris, was so thoroughly mortified at the light in which this affair was regarded on the continent, that he wrote to Cecil, The brutes be so brim and so maliciously reported here, touching the marriage of the Lord Robert and the death of his wife, that I know not where to turn me, nor what countenance to bear. In England it was generally believed that the queen was under promise of marriage to Dudley, and though all murmured, no one presumed to remonstrate with her majesty on the subject. Perry, the unprincipled confidant of the Lord Admiral Cecil's clandestine courtship of his royal mistress, and whom she had, on her accession to the throne, made a privy counsellor, and preferred, though a convicted defaulter, to the honourable and lucrative office of comptroller of her household, openly flattered the favourite's pretensions, who now began to be distinguished in the court by the significant title of my lord, without any reference to his name, while daily new gifts and immunities were lavished on him. Meantime the jealous rivalry of the Earl of Arundel led to open brawls in the court, and as the quarrel was warmly taken up by the servants and followers of these nobles, her majesty's name was bandied about among them, in a manner degrading, not only to the honor of royalty, but to feminine delicacy. On one occasion, Arthur Gunter, a retainer of the Earl of Arundel, was brought before the council, on the information of one of Dudley's servants, to answer for the evil wishes he had invoked on the favorite, for standing in the way of his lord's preferment in the royal marriage, to which both aspired. Gunter made the following confession. Pleaseth your honors to understand that, about three weeks since, I chanced to be hunting with divers gentlemen, when I fell in talk with a gentleman named Mr. George Cotton, who told me that the Queen's Highness being at supper one time at my Lord Robert's house, where it chanced her Highness to be benighted homeward, and as her grace was going home by torchlight, she fell in talk with them that carried the torches, and said, that she would make their lord the best that ever was of his name. Whereupon I said, that her grace must make him then a duke, and he said, that the report was, that her highness should marry him, and I answered, I pray God all be for the best, and I pray God all men may take it well, that there might rise no trouble thereof, and so I have said to divers others since that time. It must be evident to every person of common sense, that Dudley's man was playing upon the credulity of the choleric servant of Arundel, or, in vulgar phraseology, hoaxing him with this tale, since it was absolutely impossible for Her Majesty, who, on such occasions, was either in her state carriage, on horseback surrounded by her own officers of the household, or, which was most probably the case, carried in a sort of open sedan, on either side of which marched the principal nobles of her court, and her band of pensioners with their axes, to have held any such colloquy with Dudley's torch-bearers, even if she had felt disposed to make such disclosures of her royal intentions, in the public streets. In another examination, Gunter affirmed, that Cotton said it was rumored that his lord Dudley should have the queen, to which Gunter replied, that, if it pleased her highness, he thought him as meet a man as any in England, 
then cotton asked him if he had heard any of parliament towards gunter said no but of course every nobleman would give his opinion and some disputes would naturally rise on the subject cotton asked who were dudley's friends in the matter gunter replied the lord marquis of northampton earl of pembroke mr treasurer and many more adding i trust the white horse arundel will be in quiet and so shall we be out of trouble if it is well known that his blood as yet was never a taint this remark was in allusion to the ignominious deaths of the favorite's grandfather edmund dudley the extortioner his father the duke of northumberland and his brother lord guildford dudley all three of whom had perished on a scaffold it was reported that leicester's great-grandfather was a carpenter and his enemies were wont to say of him that he was the son of a duke the brother of a king the grandson of an esquire and the great-grandson of a carpenter that the carpenter was the only honest man in the family and the only one who died in his bed the person who well knew the temper of elizabeth notwithstanding the undisguised predilection she evinced for the company of her master of the horse predicted that the queen would surely never give her hand to so mean a peer as robin dudley noble only in two descents and in both of them stained with the block the event proved that this was a correct judgment touching lord robert continues gunter i have said to mr cotton that i thought him to be the cause that my lord and master arundel might not have the queen's highness wherefore i would that he had been put to death with his father or that some ruffian would have dispatched him by the way he has gone with dag or gun further i said if it chanced my lord robert to marry the queen's highness then i doubted whether he would not remember some old matter past to my lord and master's hindrance and displeasure gunter made very humble submission and suit to her majesty for pardon stating that he had been very properly punished for uttering such lewd and unbefitting words this matter was evidently brought before the council by dudley for the purpose of showing how publicly his name was implicated with that of the queen in a matrimonial point of view and with the intent of ascertaining how his colleagues stood affected towards his preferment in that way elizabeth passed the matter over with apparent nonchalance and when throckmorton annoyed past endurance at the sneers of his diplomatic brethren in paris took the bold step of sending his secretary jones to acquaint her majesty privately with the injurious reports that were circulated touching herself and dudley she received the communication without evincing any of that acute sensibility of female honor which teaches most women to regard a stain as a wound she sometimes laughed perhaps at the absurdity of these ondils and occasionally covered her face with her hands and when the secretary who had been charged with this delicate commission brought his communication to a close she informed him that he had come on an unnecessary errand for she was already acquainted with all he had told her and that she was convinced of the innocence of lord robert dudley of the death of his wife as he was in her own court at the time it happened which had so fallen out that neither his honor nor his honesty were touched therein notwithstanding the honest warning of throckmorton to his royal mistress the favorite continued in close attendance on her person it is related that one of his political rivals who is generally supposed to have been sussex gave him a blow at the council board in presence of the queen elizabeth who was well fitted to rule the stormy elements over which she presided told the pugnacious statesman that he had forfeited his hand in reference to the law which imposed that penalty on any one who presumed to violate the sanctity of the court by commission of such an outrage on which dudley rejoined that he hoped her majesty would suspend that sentence till the traitor had lost his head and the matter went no further it is shrewdly remarked by naughton that this influential noble ever kept clear from quarrels with the queen's kinsmen henry carey lord hunston and sir thomas sackville for of them he was wont to say that they were of the tribe of dan and were nole me tangere among the preparations for the easter festival in fifteen sixty queen elizabeth kept her maundy after the old catholic fashion in her great hall and in the court at westminster by washing the feet of twenty poor women 
and then gave gowns to every woman and one of them had the royal robe in which her majesty officiated on this occasion the queen drank to every woman in a new white cup and then gave her the cup the same afternoon in st james's park she gave a public alms of two pence each to upwards of two thousand poor men women and children both whole and lame the royal gift was in silver coins and the value was from six pence to eight pence of the present money nothing endeared the sovereign more to the people than the public exercise of these acts of personal charity which afforded them at once a holiday and a pageant making glad the hearts of the poor with a gift to which inestimable value would be attached abject indeed would be the recipient of the royal bounty who did not preserve the fair new coin to wear as a precious amulet about the neck and to transmit as a lucky heirloom to a favored child in memory of their gracious queen there were no sources of licensed temptation to destroy the health and virtues of the working classes in the shape of gin palaces under the glorious domestic government of england's elizabeth the queen was careful to redress all causes of disaffection among the operative classes so that royalty should be found no burden to those whom she regarded as the bones and sinews of the realm in a preceding volume of this book the extortions and robberies committed by the royal purveyors in the name of the sovereign have been mentioned and that to a certain degree they were still practiced in the early part of elizabeth's reign is evidenced by the following humorous tale which is recorded on the authority of an eye-witness one of her purveyors having been guilty of some abuses in the county of kent on her majesty's remove to greenwich a sturdy countryman watching the time when she took her morning walk with the lords and ladies of her household placed himself conveniently for catching the royal eye and ear and when he saw her attention perfectly disengaged began to cry in a loud voice which is the queen whereupon as her manner was she turned herself towards him but he continued his clamorous question she herself answered i am your queen what wouldst thou have with me you rejoined the farmer archly gazing upon her with a look of incredulity not unmixed with admiration you are one of the rarest women i ever saw and can eat no more than my daughter madge who is thought the properest lass in our parish though short of you but that queen elizabeth i look for devours so many of my hens ducks and capons that i am not able to live the queen who was exceedingly indulgent to all suits offered through the medium of a compliment took this homely admonition in good part inquired the purveyor's name and finding that he had acted with great dishonesty and injustice caused the condign punishment to be inflicted upon him indeed our author adds that she ordered him to be hanged his offence being in violation of a statute law against such abuses great hospitality was exercised in the palace which no stranger who had ostensible business there from the noble to the peasant ever visited it is said without being invited to either one table or the other according to his degree no wonder that elizabeth was a popular sovereign and her days were called golden in may fifteen sixty the new pope pius the fourth a prince of the house of medici made an attempt to win back england through her queen to the obedience of the roman see by sending parpaglia abbot of st saviour to the queen with letters written in the most conciliatory style and beginning dear daughter in christ inviting her to return into the bosom of the church and professing his readiness to do all things needful for the health of her soul and the firm establishment of her royal dignity and requesting her to give due attention to the matters which would be communicated by his dear son vincent parpaglia what the papal concessions were on which this spiritual treaty was to be based can only be matter of conjecture for elizabeth declined receiving the nuncio and the separation became final and complete in the autumn of the same year elizabeth's great and glorious measure of restoring the english currency to sterling value was carried into effect a matter indeed weighty and great says camden which neither edward the sixth could nor mary durst attempt since henry the eighth was the first king that ever caused copper to be mingled with silver to the great disgrace of the kingdom damage of his successors and people 
and a notable token of his excessive expense, since his father had left him more wealth than any other king ever left his successors, and likewise he had drawn abundance of money by the means of tribute and imposts, besides all the revenues, gifts, and goods belonging to the monasteries. This mighty and beneficial change was effected by the enlightened policy of Elizabeth, without causing the slightest inconvenience or distress to individuals. The old money was called in, and every person received the nominal value of the base coin, in new sterling money, and the government bore the loss, which was, of course, very heavy, but the people were satisfied, and their confidence in the good faith and honor of the crown, richly repaid this great sovereign for the sacrifice. She strictly forbade melting or trafficking with the coin in any way, a precaution the more necessary, inasmuch as the silver was better and purer in England during her reign than in full two hundred years before, and than any that was used in any other nation of Europe in her own time. The reformation of the currency extended to Ireland, and the joy of that distressed people was expressed in the following popular ballad, which has been preserved by Simon in his Essay on Irish Coins let bonfires shine in every place sing and ring the bells apace and pray that long may live her grace to be the good queen of ireland the gold and silver which was so base that no man could endure it scarce is now new coined with her own face and made to go current in ireland well had it been for ireland and england also if the subsequent policy of elizabeth towards that portion of her dominions had been guided by the same maternal and equitable spirit. The gold coins of Elizabeth were peculiarly beautiful. They were sovereigns, half-sovereigns, or royals, the latter word being a corruption for royals, nobles, double nobles, angels, half-angels, pieces of an angel and a half, and three angels, crowns and half-crowns. One pound of gold was coined into twenty-four sovereigns, or thirty-six nominal pounds, for the value of the sovereign was thirty shillings, the value of the royal, fifteen shillings, and that of the angel, ten. On the sovereign appeared the majestic profile portrait of Elizabeth, in armor and ruff, her hair disheveled and flowing over her breast and shoulders, and crowned with the imperial crown of England, similar in form to that, worn by all her successors, including our present fair and feminine liege lady. It is impossible, however, for the lovers of the picturesque and graceful not to regret the want of taste which induced the tudor sovereigns to abandon the elegant garland-shaped diadem of the saxon and plantagenet monarchs of england for the heavy double arched regal cap which so completely conceals the contour of a finely shaped head and the beauty of the hair the legend round elizabeth's sovereign on the side charged with her bust is elizabeth dei gratiae angliae Franchie et Hibernia Regina. Reverse, the arms of England and France. She bore the latter at the very time she signed the death doom of her cousin, Mary Stuart, for quartering the first, though entitled by her descent from Henry the Seventh, to bear them, as the Duchess of Suffolk, Francis Brandon did, without offence. The arms on the reverse of Elizabeth's sovereign are flanked by the initials E.R., and this inscription as defender of the faith. Scutum fidei protegit eum. The double rose noble, which is esteemed the finest of her coins, has on one side the queen in her regal costume, with crown, scepter, and ball, seated on her throne with a porculus at her feet, signifying her descent from the Beauforts, same legend as the sovereign. On the reverse, a large rose enclosing the royal arms, with the motto chosen by Elizabeth when her accession was announced to her. A domino factum est, estud et est mirable in oculis nostris. The Lord hath done it, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Queen Elizabeth's silver money are crowns, half crowns, shillings, sixpence, groats, three pence, two pence, pennies, half pennies, and farthings. There was no copper money coin before the reign of King James. Notwithstanding all the difficulties with which she had to contend, on her accession to the throne, Elizabeth very early assumed the proud position of protectress of the Reformed Church, not only in England, but throughout the world. She supplied the Huguenot leaders in France privately, with arms and money, 
and afterwards openly with a military force, under the command of Lord Robert Dudley's eldest brother, the Earl of Warwick. She also extended her succor, secretly, to the Flemish Protestants, and excited them to resist the oppression of their Spanish rulers. The reform party in Scotland were in her pay, and subservient to her will, although her dislike to John Knox was unconquerable, having been provoked by his abuse of the English liturgy, in the first place, and in the second by his work entitled, First Blast of the Trumpet, Against the Monstrous Regiment, Meaning Government, of Women. It is true that this fulmination was published during her sister's reign, and was more especially aimed at the Queen Regent of Scotland and her daughter, the youthful sovereign of that realm, but Elizabeth considered, that the honor of the whole sex was touched in his book, and that all female monarchs were insulted and aggrieved by it. It was in vain that he endeavored, by personal flattery to herself, to excuse his attack upon the folly and incapacity of womankind in general. He assured her that she was an exception to the sweeping rule he had laid down, that her whole life had been a miracle, which proved that she had been chosen by God, that the office which was unlawful to other women was lawful to her, and that he was ready to obey her authority. But the queen was nauseated with the insincerity of adulation from such a quarter, and notwithstanding the persuasions of Cecil and Throckmorton, refused to permit him to set a foot in England on any pretense. On the 18th of January, 1561, the first genuine English tragedy in five acts, composed on the ancient tragic model, with the interlude of assistant choruses, in lyric verse, was performed before Queen Elizabeth, whose classic tastes must have been much gratified by such a production. It was the joint composition of her poetic cousin, Sir Thomas Sackville, who shared the literary genius of the Boleyn family, and Thomas Norton, and was called Ferrex and Porrex, or Gorbaduke. Probably the quaint and impertinent representation of the whole life and reign of the royal blue beard, Henry the Eighth, which, it is said, was among the popular dramatic pageants of the reign of Edward the Sixth, would have given an unsophisticated audience more genuine delight than all the lofty declamations of the imitator of the Greek drama. Elizabeth caused a stage to be erected at Windsor Castle for the regular performance of the drama, with a wardrobe for the actors, painted scenes, and an orchestra, consisting of trumpeters, luterers, harpers, singers, minstrels, viols, sagbuts, bagpipes, dome flads, rebecks, and flutes, and very queer music they must have made. Queen Elizabeth passed much of her time at Windsor Castle, on the spacious terrace erected by her, for a summer promenade, in the north front of the castle, she generally walked for an hour before dinner, if not prevented by wind, to which she had a particular aversion. Rain, if it was not violent, was no impediment to her daily exercise, as she took pleasure in walking under an umbrella in rainy weather, upon this commanding and beautiful spot. In the neighboring park she frequently hunted, and we have the following testimony, that her feminine feelings did not prevent her from taking life with her own hand, as this letter, written by Leicester, at her command will testify. To the right honorable and my singular good lord, my lord of Canterbury's grace, give these. My lord, the queen's majesty being abroad hunting yesterday in the forest, and having had very good hap, beside great sport, she hath thought good to remember your grace, with part of her prey, and so commanded me to send you a great fat stag, killed with her own hand, which, because the weather was wet, and the deer somewhat chaffed, and dangerous to be carried so far without some help, I caused him to be parboiled, for the better preservation of him, which I doubt not, will cause him to come unto you, as I would be glad he should. So, having no other matter at this present, to trouble your grace withal, I will commit you to the Almighty, and with my most hearty commendations, take my leave in haste. Your grace is assured, R. Dudley at Windsor, this 4th of September. End of section 13. Section 14 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 4, Part 5 While Elizabeth kept court at her natal palace of Greenwich, she, on St. George's Day, celebrated the national festival with great pomp, as the sovereign of the Order of the Garter, combining, according to the custom of the good old times, a religious service with the picturesque ordinances of this chivalric institution. All Her Majesty's chapel came through the hall in copes, to the number of thirty, singing, O God the Father of Heaven, etc., the outward court to the gate being strewed with green rushes. After came Mr. Garter, and Mr. Norroy, and Master Dean of the chapel, in robes of crimson satin, with a red cross of St. George, and after eleven knights of the garter in their robes. Then came the queen, the sovereign of the order, in her robes, and all the guard following, in their rich coats, to the chapel. After service they returned through the hall to her grace's great chamber. The queen and the lords then went to dinner, where she was most nobly served, and the lords, sitting on one side, were served on gold and silver. After dinner, were two new knights elected, namely, the Earl of Shrewsbury and Lord Hunsdon. On the 10th of July, the Queen came by water to the tower, to visit her mints, where she coined certain pieces of gold with her own hand, and gave them away to those about her. Catherine Parr's brother, the Marquis of Northampton, and her own cousin, Lord Hunsdon, each received one of these memorable pieces, about five she went out at the iron gate and over tower hill in great state on horseback with trumpeters and her gentlemen pensioners heralds sergeant-at-arms gentlemen and nobles preceding her lord hunston bearing the sword of state before her majesty and the ladies riding after her in this order the maiden monarch and her train proceeded by the way of aldgate down Houndsditch and Hog Lane, places little accustomed now to behold royal equestrian processions, with gorgeous dames and courtly gallants, sweeping in jeweled pomp through those narrow, dusky streets. But Elizabeth, whose maternal progenitors had handled the mercer's yard and wielded the civic mace, was peculiarly the queen of the city of London, where she was always hailed with enthusiastic affection. As long as the tower was a royal residence, our sovereigns did not entirely confine the sunshine of their presence to the western quarter of the metropolis, but gave the city, in turn, a share of the glories of regality. Elizabeth and her train, on the above occasion, proceeded, we are told, through the fields to the Charter House, the splendid residence of the Lord North, where she reposed herself till the 14th, when Burley has noted in his diary the following entry. The queen supped at my house in Strand, the Savoy, before it was finished, and she came by the fields from Christ Church. Here her council waited on her grace, with many lords, knights, and ladies. Great cheer was made till midnight, when she rode back to the charter house, where she lay that night. The next day, Elizabeth set forth, on her summer progress, into Essex and Suffolk. All the streets of the city, through which she was to pass, were freshly sanded and graveled, and the houses hung with cloth of arras, rich carpets, and silk. But Cheapside, then proverbially called the Golden Cheap, made a display of magnificence in honor of the passage of the sovereign, which we should vainly look for in these days of flimsy luxury, being hung with cloth of gold and silver, and velvets of all colors. All the crafts of London were ranged in their liveries, from St. Michael the Quern as far as Aldgate. The aldermen, in their scarlet robes, had a distinguished place in the royal procession, nearer to Her Majesty's person than her nobles and officers of state, save my Lord Hunston, who bore the sword of state before her, and was immediately preceded by the Lord Mayor, who bore the scepter. At Whitechapel, the Lord Mayor and aldermen took their leave of Her Grace, and she proceeded on her way towards Essex, and is supposed to have lodged that night at Wainstead House in the forest. On the 19th of July, Elizabeth reached Ingatestone, the seat of Sir William Petre, one of her secretaries and privy councillors. She had had the wisdom, as well as the magnanimity, to overlook his former inimical proceedings in the time of her adversity, regarding them probably as political rather than personal offences. She remained at his house two days, and then passed on to Whitehall, one of the seats of her maternal grandfather, Sir Thomas Boleyn, 
where Henry the Eighth had oft times visited and wooed her fair, ill-fated mother during the fervor of his passion. Over the portal, the words "Viva Elizabetha" and a complimentary Italian quatrain still bear record of her visit. She visited Colchester during this progress and arrived at Harwich August second where she enjoyed the sea breezes for several days, and was so well pleased with the entertainment she received, that she inquired of the mayor and corporation if she could do anything for them. They returned humble thanks to her majesty, but said, they did not require anything at that time. When the queen departed, she looked back at Harwich with a smile, and said, a pretty town, and wants nothing. Her majesty arrived at Ipswich, August 6th, the inhabitants of which, like the other towns through which she passed, had been assessed for the expenses of her entertainment. She found great fault with the clergy for not wearing the surplice, and the general want of order observed in the celebration of divine service. The Bishop of Norwich himself came in for a share of the censure of the royal governess of the church, for his remissness, and for winking at schismatics. Above all, she expressed her dislike of the marriage of the clergy, and that in cathedrals and colleges there were so many wives and children which she said was contrary to the intention of the founders and much tending to the interruption of the studies of those who were placed there she even proceeded to issue an order on the ninth of august addressed to the archbishop of canterbury for his province and to the archbishop of york for his forbidding the resort of women to the lodgings of cathedrals or colleges on any pretense her indignation at the marriage of her bishops carried her almost beyond the bounds of delicacy, and when Archbishop Parker remonstrated with her on what he called the popish tendency of a prohibition, which was peculiarly offensive to him as a married man, she told him, she repented of having made any married bishops, and even spoke with contempt of the institution of matrimony altogether. It is well known that the first time the queen honored the archiepiscopal palace with a visit, on which occasion an enormous expense, an immense trouble and fatigue, had been incurred by the primate and his wife, instead of the gracious words of acknowledgment, which the latter naturally expected to receive at parting from the royal guest, her majesty repaid her dutiful attention with the following insult. And you, said she, madam, I may not call you, mistress, I am ashamed to call you, and so I know not what to call you, but howsoever, I thank you. Elizabeth looked as sourly on Bishop's daughters as she did on their wives, and having heard that Pilkington, Bishop of Durham, had given his daughter in marriage a fortune of ten thousand pounds, equal to the portion bequeathed by her father, Henry the Eighth, to her and to her sister, she scorched the sea of Durham of a thousand a year, and devoted the money to her garrison at Berwick. During her majesty's sojourn at Ipswich, the court was thrown into the greatest consternation by the discovery that the Lady Catherine Grey, sister to the unfortunate Lady Jane, was on the point of becoming a mother, having contracted a clandestine marriage with Edward, Earl of Hertford, the eldest son of the late protector Somerset. The matter was the more serious, because the young lady was not only of the blood royal, but as the eldest surviving daughter of Francis Brandon, to whose posterity the regal succession stood entailed by the will of Henry the Eighth, regarded by the party opposed to the hereditary claim of Mary Queen of Scots as the heiress presumptive to the throne. Lady Catherine held an office in the Queen's chamber, which kept her in constant attendance on Her Majesty's person, but having listened to the secret addresses of the man of her heart, love inspired her with ingenuity to elude the watchfulness of the court one day excusing herself under pretence of sickness from attending her royal mistress to the chase she employed the time not like her accomplished sister the unfortunate lady jane grey in reading plato but in hastening with lady jane seymour one of the maids of honour the sister of her lover to his house where lady jane seymour herself procured the priest who joined their hands in marriage. Hertford left England the next day. Lady Jane Seymour died in the following March, and thus poor Lady Catherine was left to meet the consequences of her stolen nuptials. 
the queen forgetful of her own love passages when princess with the late lord admiral uncle to this very hertford and the disgraceful disclosures which had been made in king edward's privy council scarce ten years ago treated the unfortunate couple with the greatest severity her premier cecil whose cold heart appears at all times inaccessible to the tender impulses of sympathy for beauty in distress in a letter to the earl of sussex sums up the leading circumstances as far as they had then proceeded in this piteous romance of royal history in the following laconic terms the tenth of this at ipswich was a great mishap discovered after naming the situation of the unfortunate lady catherine in the coarsest language he adds as she saith by the earl of hertford who is in france she is committed to the tower he is sent for she saith that she was married to him secretly before christmas last the reader will remember that the father of the husband of lady catherine gray was the first great patron of this climbing statesman and herself the sister of the illustrious victim whom he had acknowledged as his sovereign the queen's majesty pursues he doth well thank be god although not well quieted with the mishap of the lady catherine it was in vain that the unfortunate sister of lady jane gray in her terror and distress fled to the chamber of the brother of lord guildford dudley lord robert and implored him to use his powerful intercession with their royal mistress in her behalf the politic courtier cared not to remind the queen of his family connection with those who had endeavoured to supplant her in the royal succession and lady catherine was hurried to the tower where she brought forth a fair young son her husband on his return was also incarcerated in the tower they were in separate prison lodgings but he found means to visit his wedded love in her affliction she became the mother of another child for which offence he was fined in the star chamber twenty thousand pounds the marriage having been declared null and void as the sister of hertford lady jane the only efficient witness was no more elizabeth was obdurate in her resentment to her unfortunate cousin and disregarded all her pathetic letters for pardon and pity kept her endurance apart from her husband and children till she was released by death after seven years of doleful captivity her real crime was being the sister of lady jane gray which queen mary had overlooked but elizabeth could not yet lady catherine was a protestant after elizabeth had relentlessly dispatched her hapless cousin to the tower she proceeded on her festive progress to smallbridge house in suffolk the seat of mr waldengrave a catholic gentleman who with his lady and some others had been committed to the tower for recusancy he was at that very time a prisoner there and there died on the first of the following september from thence she passed on to helmingham hall the fair abode of sir lionel Ptolemaic, then sheriff for norfolk and suffolk and honoured him by standing godmother to his heir and left the ebony lute inlaid with ivory and gems on which she was accustomed to play as a present for the mother of the babe this relic which has the royal initials e r is carefully preserved by the family and proudly exhibited among the treasures of helmingham hall it was a customary thing for a king or queen of england to leave some trifling personal possession as a memorial of the royal visit at every mansion where majesty was entertained hence so many embroidered gloves fans books of devotion and other traditionary relics of this mighty queen are shown in different old families with whom she was a guest during her numerous progresses she returned through hertfordshire this year and revisited the abode of her childhood enfield house and on the twenty second of september came from enfield to london she was so numerously attended on her homeward route that from islington to london all the hedges and ditches were levelled to clear the way for her and such were the gladness and affection manifested by the loyal concourse of people who came to meet and welcome her that says the contemporary chronicler it was night ere she came over st giles in the fields before elizabeth left town on her late progress the widow queen of scots after the death of her consort francis the second of france sent her french minister doisel to ask her for a safe conduct to pass into scotland 
either by sea or if compelled by indisposition or danger to land in england and travel without let or hindrance to her own realm it had been considered the height of inhumanity in that brutal monarch henry the eighth when he denied a like request which had been proposed to him in behalf of the bride of his nephew james v the beautiful mary of lorraine whom he had passionately desired for his own wife but that one lady should refuse so small an accommodation to another had certainly not been anticipated elizabeth however acted like the true daughter of henry the eighth on this occasion for though doisel presented the queen of scotland's request in writing she delivered her answer to him in the negative at a crowded court with a loud voice and angry countenance observing that the queen of scots should ask no favors till she had ratified the treaty of edinburgh when this discourtesy was reported to the youthful sovereign of scotland and dowager of france then only in her nineteenth year she sent for the english ambassador throckmorton and having in the first place to mark her own attention to the conventional forms observed even by hostile princes in their personal relations towards each other waved her hand as a signal to the company to withdraw out of hearing she addressed to him a truly queenly comment on the insult that had been offered to her on the part of his royal mistress my lord ambassador said she as i know not how far i may be transported by passion i will not have so many witnesses of mine infirmity as the queen your mistress had when she talked not long since with monsieur doisel there is nothing that doth more grieve me than that i did so forget myself as to have asked of her a favor which i could well have done without i came here in defiance of the attempts made by her brother edward to prevent me and by the grace of god i will return without her leave it is well known that i have friends and allies who have power to assist me but i choose rather to be indebted to her friendship if she choose she may have me for a loving kinswoman and useful neighbor for i am not going to practice against her with her subjects as she has done with mine yet i know there be in her realm those that like not of the present state of things the queen says i am young and lack experience i confess i am younger than she is yet i know how to carry myself lovingly and justly with my friends and not to cast any word against her which may be unworthy of a queen and a kinswoman and by her permission i am as much a queen as herself and can carry my courage as high as she knows how to do she hath heretofore assisted my subjects against me and now that i am a widow it may be thought strange that she would hinder me in returning to my own country mary then in a few words stated that the late king her husband had objected to ratify the treaty of edinburgh that while he lived she was bound to act by his advice and now her uncles had referred her to her own council and the states of scotland for advice in a matter in which they as peers of france had no voice and she was too young and inexperienced to decide of herself even if it had been proper that she should do so throckmorton in reply adverted to the old offence of mary and her late husband having assumed the title and arms of england but rejoined the young queen with great naivete my late lord and father king henry and the king my late lord and husband would have it so i was then under their command as you know and since their death i have neither borne the arms nor used the style of england the attempt of elizabeth to intercept and capture the youthful widow on her voyage to scotland has been contested by some able writers of the present day but it is certain that the traitors lethington and murray counselled the english cabinet to that step an english squadron was at this critical juncture sent into the north sea under pretext of protecting the fishers from pirates and cecil in his letter to sussex after stating the fact significantly observed i think they will be sorry to see her pass the royal voyager passed the english ships in safety under the cover of the thick fog but they captured one vessel in which was the young earl of eglinton and carried him into an english port on finding their mistake they relinquished the prize and apologized for the blunder they had committed safe conduct having been peremptorily denied to mary by elizabeth 
it was impossible for her to place any other construction on the seizure of one of her convoy than the very natural one she did elizabeth however without waiting to be accused proceeded to justify herself from so unkind an imputation in a formal letter to her royal kinswoman in which she says it seemeth that report hath been made to you that we had sent out our admiral with our fleet to impede your passage your servants know how false this is we have only at the desire of the king of spain sent two or three small barks to sea in pursuit of certain scotch pirates the young queen of scotland accepted the explanation with great courtesy and though perfectly aware of the intrigues that had been and continued to be practised against her in her own court by elizabeth she pursued an amicable and conciliatory policy towards her entered into a friendly correspondence and expressed the greatest desire for a personal interview mary's youngest uncle the grand prior of france who had accompanied her to scotland a bold military ecclesiastic of the class of walter scott's brian de bois gilbert asked and obtained leave to visit the court of england on his return to france he was a victorious admiral and was commander-in-chief of the french navy and being the handsomest and the most audacious of his handsome and warlike race probably felt no alarm at the possibility of being detained by the maiden queen he was in fact the sort of paladin likely to captivate elizabeth who became animated with a livelier spirit of coquetry than usual at the sight of him and soon treated him with great familiarity i have often heard the queen of england address him thus says brantome ah mon prieur i love you much but i hate that brother geese of yours who tore from me my town of calais he danced more than once with her for she danced much all sorts of dances the testimony of an eye-witness says a modern french biographer can never be useless or devoid of interest when like the pigeon la fontaine he can truly say j'étais là tel les choses ma devant such was the testimony of the chivalrous biographer brantome who with more than a hundred other gentlemen of rank in attendance on the grand prior and constable of france were guests at the courts of england and france and saw and spoke to both the island queens when in the height of their beauty and prosperity next to female dress a frenchman is the most sedulous critic on female beauty and surely brantome bears witness that at twenty-seven elizabeth possessed a considerable share of personal charms this queen gave us all one evening says he a supper in a grand room hung round with tapestry representing the parable of the ten virgins of the evangelists when the banquet was done there came in a ballet of her maids of honor whom she had dressed and ordained to represent the same virgins some of them had their lamps burning and full of oil and some of them carried lamps which were empty but all their lamps were silver most exquisitely chased and wrought and the ladies were very pretty well behaved and very well dressed they came in the course of the ballet and prayed us french to dance with them and even prevailed on the queen to dance which she did with much grace and right royal majesty for she possessed then no little beauty and elegance she told the constable of france that of all the monarchs of the earth she had had the greatest wish to behold his late master king henry the second on account of his warlike renown he had sent me word pursued she that we should meet very soon and i had commanded my galleys to be made ready to pass to france for the express purpose of seeing him the constable replied madame i am certain you would have been well pleased with him if you had seen him for his temper and tastes would have suited yours and he would have been charmed with your pleasant manners and lively humor he would have given you an honorable welcome and very good cheer there are at present alive besides the constable continues brantome monsieur de guiche monsieur de castano languedoc and monsieur de Belois, besides myself who heard queen elizabeth speak thus and we all right well remember her as she was then it has been customary for the learned chroniclers of elizabeth's life and reign from camden downwards to diverge at this period of her annals into the affairs of scotland and for the succeeding seven years to follow the fortunes of the ill-fated mary stuart 
rather than those of our mighty tudor queen who is certainly a character of sufficient importance to occupy at all times the foreground of her own history it is however requisite to point out the first germ of the personal ill-will so long nourished by elizabeth against mary this seems to have arisen from the evil report brought by mrs sandys elizabeth's former maid of honour when she returned from france at the accession of her royal mistress the exile of this lady has already been mentioned as she was forced from elizabeth's service on account of her zeal for the protestant religion it was not very probable that she would be admitted to the confidence of mary stuart who was then queen consort of france yet mrs sandys affirmed that queen elizabeth was never mentioned by mary without scorn and contempt such was the beginning of that hatred which never diminished while the troubled existence of mary stuart continued elizabeth was too deeply skilled in the regnal science not to be aware that a country is never so sure of enjoying the blessings of peace as when prepared for war and therefore her principal care was bestowed in providing her realm with the means of defence gunpowder was first manufactured by her orders and encouragement in england which all her predecessors had contented themselves with purchasing abroad she sent for engineers furnished regular arsenals in all fortified towns along the coast and the scottish borders increased the garrison of berwick and caused a fort to be built on the banks of the medway near upnor where the ships should ride in shelter and increase the wages of the mariners and soldiers to encourage them to serve her well she not only caused ships of war to be built for the increase of her navy but she encouraged the wealthy inhabitants of seaports to emulate her example so that instead of hiring as her father and others of her predecessors had done ships from the hans towns and italian republics she was in the fourth year of her reign able to put to sea a fleet with twenty thousand men-at-arms strangers called her the queen of the sea and the north star her own subjects proudly styled her the restorer of naval glory end of section fourteen section fifteen of lives of the queens of england volume six by agnes and elizabeth strickland this LibriVox recording is in the public domain elizabeth chapter five part one the evidences of history prove that religious persecution generates faction and lends the most formidable weapons to the disaffected by dignifying treason with the name of piety thus it was in the pilgrimage of grace in the reign of henry the eighth with kett's rebellion in that of edward the sixth and the wyatt insurrection in that of mary whether under the rival names of catholic or protestant the principle was the same and the crown of martyrdom was claimed by the sufferer for conscience sake of either party the experience of the religious struggles in the last three reigns had failed to teach elizabeth the futility of monarchs attempting to make their opinions on theological matters a rule for the consciences of their subjects her first act of intolerance was levelled against the anabaptists by the publication of an edict in which they and other heretics whether foreign or native were enjoined to depart the realm within twenty days on pain of imprisonment and forfeiture of goods subsequently in a fruitless attempt to establish uniformity of worship throughout the realm she treated her dissenting subjects of all classes with great severity as well as those who adhered to the tenets of the church of rome the attempt to force persons of opposite opinions to a reluctant conformity with the newly established ritual rendered it distasteful to many who would probably if left to the exercise of their own discretion have adopted it in time as the happy medium between the two extremes of rome and geneva in ireland coercive measures were followed by disaffection and revolt and opened the door to plots and perpetual enterprises against the queen's person and government both from foreign powers and those within her own realm who were desirous of being governed by a sovereign of their own creed on the first day of fifteen sixty two the queen went in state to st paul's cathedral the dean having notice of her intention had been at some pains and great expense in ornamenting a prayer-book with beautiful prints 
illustrative of the history of the apostles and martyrs which were placed at the epistles and gospels appointed to be read by the church of england on their commemorations the book being intended as a new year's gift for her majesty was richly bound and laid on the cushion for her use a proclamation had indeed lately been set forth to please the puritan party against images pictures and romish relics but as elizabeth continued to retain a large silver crucifix over the altar of the chapel royal with candlesticks and other ornaments the use or disuse of which might be regarded rather as a matter of taste than religion the dean supposed that her majesty did not object to works of art on scriptural subjects as embellishments for her books of devotion elizabeth however thought it expedient to get up a little scene on this occasion in order to manifest her zeal against popery before a multitude when she came to her place she opened the book but seeing the pictures frowned blushed and shut it of which several took notice and calling to the verger bade him bring her the book she was accustomed to use after the service was concluded she went straight into the vestry where she asked the dean how that book came to be placed on her cushion he replied that he intended it as a new year's gift to her majesty you never could present me with a worse rejoined the queen why so asked the dean her majesty after a vehement protestation of her aversion to idolatry reminded him of her recent proclamation against superstitious pictures and images and asked if it had been read in his deanery the dean replied that it had but he meant no harm in causing the prince to be bound up in the service book she told him that he must be very ignorant indeed to do so after her prohibition the poor dean humbly suggested that if so her majesty might the better pardon him the queen prayed that god would grant him a better spirit and more wisdom for the future to which royal petition in his behalf the dean meekly cried amen then the queen asked how he came by the pictures and by whom engraved he said he bought them of a german and her majesty observed it is well it was from a stranger had it been any of our subjects we should have questioned the matter the menace implied in this speech against native artists who should venture to engrave plates with scriptural subjects naturally deterred them from copying the immortal works of the great flemish italian and spanish masters which were chiefly confined to themes from sacred history or saintly lore and may well explain the otherwise unaccountable fact that the pictorial arts in england retrograded instead of improved from the extension of elizabeth till the reign of charles i about this time margaret countess of lennox the queen's nearest relation of the royal tudor blood and who stood next to the queen of scots in the hereditary order of the regal succession was arrested and thrown into prison her ostensible offence was having corresponded secretly with her royal niece the queen of scots but having been the favorite friend of the late queen who was at one time reported to have intended to appoint her as her successor to the prejudice of elizabeth that princess had cherished great ill-will against her and she now caused her to be arraigned on the formidable charges of treason and witchcraft the countess was with four others found guilty of having consulted with pretended wizards and conjurers to learn how long the queen had to live the luckless lady being perfectly aware that the royal animosity proceeded from a deeper root addressed the following curious letter in her own justification to mr secretary cecil good master secretary i have received your answer by my man fowler upon the queen's words to you whereby the queen hath been informed and doth credit the same that i in the time of her highness's trouble in queen mary's reign should be rather a means to augment the same than diminish it in putting it then in queen mary's head that it was a quietness for the times to have her shut up master secretary none on live or alive is able to justify this false and untrue report made of me among others the like as therein i will be sworn if i were put to it that never in all my life i had or meant to have said such words touching the queen's majesty nor i for my part 
bear no such stroke to give any advice in any such weighty matter but what should i say even as my lord and i have had extremity showed upon the informations most untruly given unto the queen's majesty of us so late i for no other but the continuance thereof as long as her highness doth hear and credit the first tale without proof to be tried and as it appeareth discrediteth my answers any way made to the contrary how true soever they be but if my lord and i might find the queen's majesty so good and gracious to us as to hear our accusers and us face to face i would then be out of doubt to find shortly some part of her highness's favour again which i beseech you to be a means for and to participate the contents of this my letter to her majesty in which doing ye give me occasion to be ready to requite the same as my power shall extend and so with hearty commendations i bid you likewise farewell from shaphus the second of october your assured friend to my power margaret lennox and angus margaret had some cause of alarm when she penned this earnest letter for her life lay at the mercy of the queen and the accusation of sorcery against royal ladies had hitherto generally emanated either from the hatred or rapacity of the sovereign in the autumn of fifteen sixty two the queen was attacked with a long and dangerous illness and an astrologer named prestel who had cast her nativity predicted that she would die in the ensuing march this prophecy becoming very generally whispered abroad inspired two royally descended brothers of the name of pole the representatives of the line of clarence with the wild project of raising a body of troops and landing them in wales to proclaim mary stuart queen in the event of her majesty's death in the hope that the beautiful heiress of the crown would reward one of them with her hand and the other with a dukedom of clarence this romantic plot transpired and the brothers with their confederates were arraigned for high treason they protested their innocence of conspiring against the queen but confessed to having placed implicit reliance on the prediction of prestel and that their plot only involved the matter of the succession it appears probable that this political soothsaying was connected with the misdemeanor of lady lennox cecil labored hard to construe the visionary scheme of the deluded young men into a confederacy of the guises and mary queen of scots but the notion was too absurd they were condemned to die but elizabeth having no reason to suppose they had practised against her life revolted at that time from the thoughts of shedding kindred blood on the scaffold on a pretence so frivolous she graciously extended her pardon to arthur pole and his brother and allowed them to pass beyond sea on the last of december this year mistress smythson her majesty's launderer was presented by the royal command with a kirtle of russet satin edged with velvet and lined with russet taffeta the materials of this rich but simple dress proved that the office of laundress to the sovereign was held by a gentlewoman whose duty it was to superintend the labors of the operative naiads of the royal household the queen in her royal robes with her bishops and peers rode in great state from her palace january twelfth fifteen sixty three to open the parliament at westminster she proceeded first to the abbey and alighting at our lady of grace's chapel where she and her noble and stately retinue entered at the north door and heard a sermon preached by noel the dean of st paul's and then a psalm being sung she proceeded through the south door to the parliament chamber then evidently held in the chapter house the first step taken by this parliament after the choice of a speaker was to petition the queen to marry this indeed appeared the only means of averting the long and bloody success of wars with which according to human probability the rival claimants of the female descendants of henry the seventh threatened the nation in the event of elizabeth dying without lawful issue of her own the elements of deadly debate which henry the eighth had left as his last legacy to england by his arbitrary innovations in the regular order of succession had been augmented by elizabeth's refusal to acknowledge the rights of the queen of scots as the presumptive inheritor of the throne the cruel policy which had led her to nullify the marriage and stigmatize the offspring of the hapless representative of the suffolk line had apparently provided further perplexities and occasions of strife with this stormy perspective 
the people naturally regarded the life of the reigning sovereign as their best security against the renewal of struggles no less direful than the wars of the roses in this idea elizabeth wished them to remain and it was no part of her intention to lessen the difficulties in which the perilous question of heirship to the crown was involved oh how wretched are we writes bishop jewel to his friend at zurich who cannot tell under what sovereign we are to live elizabeth briefly replied to the remonstrance of her parliament on this subject and that of her marriage that she had not forgotten the suit of the house nor ever could forget it but it was a matter in which she would be advised elizabeth was just then too busily occupied in traversing every proposal of marriage that had been made to the queen of scots to have leisure to think much of her own since the widowhood of mary stuart all elizabeth's rejected suitors had transferred their addresses to the younger and fairer queen of the sister realm and nothing but the political expediency of maintaining the guise of friendship she had assumed towards mary prevented her from manifesting the jealousy and ill-will excited in her haughty spirit by every fresh circumstance of the kind mary very obligingly communicated all her offers to her good sister of england having promised to be guided by her advice on this important subject and all were equally objectionable in elizabeth's opinion mary in the morning freshness of youth beauty and poetic genius cared for none of these things her heart was long faithful to the memory of her buried lord and she allowed elizabeth to dictate refusals to her illustrious wooers with perfect unconcern in the hope that in return for this singular condescension her good sister would be won upon to acknowledge her right to succeed to the crown of england in the event of that queen dying without lawful issue elizabeth was inflexible in her refusal to concede this point she replied that the right of succession to her throne should never be made a subject of discussion it would cause disputes as to the validity of this or that marriage in allusion to the old dispute of henry the eighth's marriage with her mother which was in truth the source of elizabeth's jealousy of all her royal kindred mary consented to acknowledge that the right to the english crown was vested in elizabeth and her posterity if in return elizabeth would declare her claims to the succession as presumptive heiress elizabeth in reply said that she could not do so without conceiving a dislike to mary and asked how it were possible for her to love any one whose interest it was to see her dead she enlarged withal on the inconstancy of human affections and the proneness of men in general to worship the rising sun it was so in her sister's reign she said and would be so again if she were ever to declare her successor it was then proposed that the two queens should meet and settle their differences in an amicable manner mary with the confiding frankness that marked her character agreed to come to york for this purpose and a passport was even signed for her and her retinue of a thousand horse and when elizabeth for some reason postponed the meeting to an indefinite time the young sovereign of scotland in her romantic infatuation wept with passionate regret at her disappointment elizabeth had at this time much to harass and disquiet her the expedition which she had been persuaded to send out to the shores of normandy had been anything but successful much treasure and blood had been uselessly expended and the city of rouen after it had been defended with fruitless valor was taken by the royalist forces and two hundred brave english auxiliaries put to the sword on lord robert dudley the unwelcome task devolved of imparting the news of this misfortune to her majesty he had the presumption to conceal the fact that the city had actually fallen but represented it to be in great distress and artfully persuaded his royal mistress that if the worst happened her parsimony would have been the cause elizabeth was in an agony at the possibility of such a calamity and dispatched reinforcements and supplies to warwick with a letter of encouragement from her council to which she added the following affectionate postscript in her own hand my dear warwick if your honor and my desire could accord with the loss of the needfulest finger i keep god so help me in my utmost need as i would gladly lose that one joint for your safe abode with me but since i cannot that i would i will do 
that i may and will rather drink in an ashen cup than you and yours should not be succored both by sea and land and that with all possible speed and let this my scribbling hand witness to them all yours as my own e r there is an honest and generous warmth in this brief note which does elizabeth more honor than all her labored metaphorical epistolary compositions she felt what she wrote in this instance and the feeling that she would rather drink out of an ashen cup than her suffering soldiers on foreign service should want succor is worthy of being inscribed on her monument the supplies could not prevent the secret negotiation between the royalists and the huguenots by which the english allies were sacrificed the plague breaking out in the garrisons of new haven and Havre de gras caused such ravages that the earl of warwick found himself compelled to surrender hard to the french and brought the sickly remnant of his army home they brought the infection with them and twenty thousand persons died in the metropolis alone the pestilence lasted nearly a year which caused the queen to withdraw her court to windsor the approach of the maiden monarch was hailed by the youthful classics at eton with rapturous delight and in the fervor of their loyal enthusiasm they proclaimed an ovation to queen elizabeth and offered their homage in every variety of latin verses and orations which were very graciously received by her majesty elizabeth was always on the most affectionate terms with this royal nursery of scholars was much beloved and honored by them cecil in his diary proudly recalls the fact that the queen's majesty on the sixth of july fifteen sixty four stood for his infant daughter to whom she gave her own name lady lennox appears not only to have obtained her liberty at that time but to have regained her standing at court as first lady of the royal blood for we find that she assisted her majesty on that occasion as the other godmother the same summer the queen decided on visiting the university of cambridge at the request of sir william cecil who in addition to his other high offices was also chancellor of this university he was unluckily attacked with what he termed an unhappy grief in his foot no other than a painful fit of the gout just at the time when he was nervously anxious that all things should be arranged in the most perfect manner for the honor of his sovereign and alma mater the energy of his mind prevailed over the malady so far that he went with his lady in a coach on the fourth of august to overlook the preparations for her majesty's reception the next day the queen came from mr worthington's house at hastingfield where she had slept on the preceding night she was met by the duke of norfolk the earl of sussex the bishop of ely and an honorable company by whom she was conducted towards the town the mayor and corporation met the sovereign a little before Newnham, and there alighted and performed their devoir and the recorder made an oration in english then the mayor delivered the mace with a fair standing cup which cost nineteen pounds and twenty old angels in it which her majesty received gently returned the mace to the mayor and delivered the cup to one of her footmen when she came to newnham mills being requested to change her horse she alighted and went into the miller's house for a little space then she and all her ladies being remounted proceeded in fair array and as they neared the town the trumpeters by solemn blast declared her majesty's approach when they entered queen's college and her majesty was in the midst of the scholars two appointed for the purpose knelt before her and kissing their papers offered them to her grace the queen understanding that they contained congratulatory addresses in prose and verse received and delivered them to one of her footmen when they reached the doctors all the lords and ladies alighted her majesty only remained on horseback she was dressed in a gown of black velvet pinked or cut velvet and had a call upon her head set with pearls and precious stones and a hat that was spangled with gold and a bush of feathers when her majesty came to the west door of the chapel sir william cecil kneeled down and welcomed her and the beadles kneeling kissed their staves and delivered them to mr secretary who likewise kissing the same delivered them to the queen's hands who could not well hold them all and her grace gently and merrily re-delivered them willing him and the other magistrates of the university to minister justice uprightly or she would take them into her own hands and see to it adding 
that though the chancellor halted his leg being sore yet she trusted that justice did not halt all this time elizabeth was on horseback and before she alighted came master w masters of king's college or raider making his three reverences kneeling down on the first step of the west door which was with the walls outward covered with verses and made his oration in length almost half an hour in effect as follows first he praised many and singular virtues set and planted in her majesty which her highness not acknowledging bit her lips and fingers and sometimes broke into passion and interrupted with these words non est veritas but the orator praising virginity she exclaimed god's blessing on thine heart there continue when he had finished the queen much commended him and marvelled that his memory did so well serve him to repeat such divers and sundry matters saying that she would answer him again in latin but for fear she should speak false latin and then they would laugh at her but in fine in token of her contentment she called him to her offered him her hand to kiss and asked his name she was lodged in king's college the best chambers and gallery being devoted to her use the fellows of king's resigned their monastic dormitories for the accommodation of lady strange and the fair maids of honor of the virgin queen the next day was sunday and the queen went in great state to king's college chapel she entered at the litany under a canopy carried over her head by four doctors of divinity dr pern preached the sermon and when he was in the midst of it her majesty sent the lord hunsdon to will him to put on his cap which he wore to the end at which time ere he could leave the pulpit she sent him word by the lord chamberlain that it was the first sermon she had ever heard in latin and she thought she could never hear a better when the music of the choir concluded she departed by the private way into the college the four doctors bearing her canopy at evening prayer the queen was not expected at chapel therefore the singing commenced but being informed her majesty was then coming through the private passage it stopped and when she was seated in her traverse even song commenced anew which ended she departed by her usual way and went to the play this by the protestants who surrounded elizabeth must have been considered a desecration of the sabbath evening if cambridge did not at that time follow an ancient practice prevalent in some parts of europe where the sabbath was considered to commence on the saturday evening and to end on the sunday after evening prayer the customs and manners of an age and people must always be considered charitably before violent blame is incurred and it is possible from so many traces that exist of elizabeth's uproarious mode of spending our sabbath evening that some reckoning of time was in vogue in her days she went to see one of plautus's plays the alularia for the hearing and playing of which at her expense a vast platform was erected in king's college church the performance of a pagan play in a christian church on the sunday evening was no great improvement on the ancient moralities and mysteries which in retrospective review are so revolting to modern taste those who glance over the mysteries must feel displeased at finding that sacred subjects could be so absurdly dramatized yet these mysteries were listened to with a reverential awe by a demi-savage people who saw nothing ridiculous or profane in the manner of showing the creation the history of noah or of joseph the intention being to make them comprehensible to the eye when the untaught ear refused to follow the thread of sacred history but elizabeth and cambridge had more knowledge if not more wisdom and ought to have banished their pagan play from the walls of a christian temple when all things were ready in the church for this play the lord chamberlain and cecil came in with a multitude of the guard bearing staff torches no other lights being used at the play the guard stood on the ground bearing their torches on each side of the stage and a very curious pictorial effect must the glaring torchlight have thrown on the groups of spectators standing or sitting among the pillars and deep gothic arches of that church playhouse at last the queen entered with her ladies and gentlewomen lady strange carrying her train and the gentlemen pensioners preceding her with torch staves she took her seat under a canopy of state raised on the south wall of the church opposite to the stage where she heard out the play fully till twelve o'clock 
when she departed to her chamber in the order that she came. The next day the queen attended the disputations at St. Mary's Church, where an ample stage was erected for the purpose. All the scholars had been ordered previously to enclose themselves in their colleges and halls. None but those who had taken a degree were permitted to appear, and among these great inquisition was made regarding dress, for the queen's eyes had been roaming during sermon time the preceding day over the congregation and she found sharp fault with sundry ragged and soiled hoods and gowns likewise she was displeased that some of the doctor's hoods were lined with white silk and some with miniver at the ringing of the university bell the queen's majesty came to her place with royal pomp as she passed the graduates kneeled and cried modestly vivat regina and she thanked them she then questioned the chancellor her minister cecil on the degrees and differences of every person present the question whether monarchy were better than a republic was the leading subject of the disputation which was moved by the celebrated dr caius but as the voices of the three doctors who disputed were low the queen repeatedly called to them loquamini altius but finding this did no good she left her seat and came to the edge of the stage just over their heads, yet she could hear little of the disputation. Her own physician, Dr. Hikes, a doctor of the college, decided the disputation, with whom Her Majesty merrily jested when he asked license of her grace. After his oration concluded, the queen departed merrily to her lodging, about seven o'clock. At nine, she went to another play, acted in the church, called Dido. Her entertainment at King's ended next evening with another play in English, called Ezekias, and she liked her entertainment so well, that she declared if there had been greater provision of ale and beer, she would have remained till Friday. Her visit to Cambridge was however not concluded, she was entertained at various colleges, and at Christ's received a pair of gloves, in memory of her great grand dame, Lady Margaret, the foundress, mother of Henry the Seventh. As she rode through the street to her lodging, she talked much with divers scholars in Latin, and, at alighting from her horse, dismissed them in Latin. The day before she quitted Cambridge, at the conclusion of a disputation in St. Mary's Church, the Duke of Norfolk and Lord Robert, kneeling down, humbly desired Her Majesty to say somewhat in Latin, who at first refused, mark she had a set latin oration ready prepared and conned by heart for the occasion and said that if she might speak her mind in english she would not stick at the matter but understanding by mr secretary that nothing might be said openly to the university in english she required him rather to speak because he was chancellor and the chancellor is the queen's mouth whereunto he answered that he was not her chancellor, but chancellor of the university. Then the bishop of Eli kneeling, said, that three words of her mouth were enough. So being pressed on every side, she complied, and made a very sensible speech, in which, among other things, she raised the expectations of the university, with respect to some royal foundation, which, however, she never thought fit to gratify. Her speech began thus, although womanly shamefacedness most celebrated university might well determine me from delivering this my unlabored oration before so great an assembly of the learned yet the intercession of my nobles and my own good will towards the university impels me to say somewhat it contained nine other sections the conclusion was it is time then that your ears which have been so long detained by this barbarous sort of an oration should now be released from the pain of it at this speech of the queen's the auditors being all marvellously astonished break forth in open voice vivat regina but the queen's majesty responded with this shout tekeat regina and moreover wished all those who heard her had drank of the letha she departed from cambridge on the tenth of august passing from king's college by the schools Dr. Pern, with many of the university, knelt, and in Latin, wished Her Majesty a good journey, to whom she mildly answered with a distinct voice, Valete omnes, farewell all. The master of Magdalen was ready with a Latin oration of farewell, which she declined on account of the heat of the day, 
and rode forward to dinner at the bishop of eli's house at stanton all the benefaction she bestowed on this visit was twenty pounds per annum to a handsome student who had acted dido much to her satisfaction End of section 15. Section 16 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 5, Part 2. The report that her former suitor, the Archduke Charles, was in treaty for the hand of the Queen of Scots, filled Elizabeth's mind with jealous displeasure, for of all the princes of Europe, he was esteemed the most honorable and chivalric, and Elizabeth's rejection of his suit appears to have been only for the purpose of obtaining concessions, on the subject of his religion, more consistent with her own profession. She made very earnest remonstrances to the Queen of Scots, on the unsuitableness of this alliance, and Cecil, at the same time, wrote to Munt, one of the pensionaries in Germany, to move the Duke of Wurttemberg to advise the Emperor to repeat the offer of his son to the Queen of England. The Duke performed his part with all due regard to the honour of her maiden majesty, for he sent an envoy to entreat her to permit him to name a person whom he considered would make her very happy in the wedded state at the same time that he preferred his private mission to the emperor elizabeth replied with her usual prudery on the subject of marriage that although she felt no inclination towards matrimony she was willing for the good of her realm to receive the communication of which the duke had spoken unfortunately however the emperor had taken umbrage at the previous rejection of his son's addresses and declared he would not expose himself to a second insult of the kind. When Elizabeth found she could not withdraw the Archduke from Mary, she determined to compel Mary to resign him. Accordingly, she gave that queen to understand that she could not consent to her contracting such a marriage, which must prove inimical to the friendship between the two crowns, and that, unless Mary would marry as she desired, she would probably forfeit all hope of a peaceful succession to the English crown. Mary had the complacence to give up this accomplished prince, who was, perhaps, the only man in Europe worthy of becoming her husband, and professed her willingness to listen to the advice of her good sister, if she wished to propose a more suitable consort. Randolph, Elizabeth's ambassador, suggested that an English noble would be more agreeable to his royal mistress than any other person. Mary requested to be informed more clearly on this point, for it was generally supposed that the young Duke of Norfolk, being the kinsman of the Queen, and one of the richest subjects in England, was the person intended for this signal honour by his sovereign. Elizabeth electrified both courts by naming her own favourite, Lord Robert Dudley. Mary replied, that she considered it beneath her dignity to marry a subject, and told her base brother, Murray, who repeated her unlucky witticism to the English ambassador, that she looked on the offer of a person so dear to Elizabeth as a proof of good will rather than of good meaning. Elizabeth, soon after, complained that Mary had treated the proposal of Lord Robert Dudley with mockery, which Mary, in a letter to her own ambassador at Paris, affirms that she never did, and wondered, who could have borne such testimony to embroil her with that queen? If, however, Mary forbore from mockery at this offer, no one else did, for it was a theme of public mirth and satire, in England, Scotland, and France. Dudley, who had the presumption to aim at a still higher mark, and had been encouraged, by the extraordinary tokens of favour lavished upon him by his royal mistress, to conceive confident hopes of success, was surprised and offended at his own nomination to an honour, so infinitely above the rank and pretensions of any person of his name and family in fact he regarded it as a snare laid in his path by cecil who was jealous of his influence with elizabeth and would he suspected avail himself of this pretence to remove him from her court and presence elizabeth was flattered at dudley's reluctance to wed her fairer rival and redoubled her commendations of his various qualifications to the favour of a royal lady 
she even offered to acknowledge mary as her successor to the crown of england on condition of her becoming his wife the hope of obtaining this recognition was artfully held out to mary as the lure to draw her into the negotiation and so far it succeeded although the royal beauty was not sufficiently an adept in diplomatic trickery to conceal at all times the scorn with which she regarded a suitor so infinitely beneath her meantime she was secretly courted by her aunt lady lennox for the young henry lord darnley and was believed to incline towards that alliance at the very time elizabeth was recommending her handsome master of the horse to her good sister of scotland she had so little command over herself that she was constantly betraying her own partiality for him to sir james melville mary's envoy who in his lively historic memoirs gives a succession of graphic scenes between elizabeth and himself she told me says his excellency that it appeared to her as if i made but small account of lord robert seeing that i named the earl of bedford before him but ere it were long she would make him a greater earl and i should see it done before me for she esteemed him as one whom she should have married herself if she had ever been minded to take a husband but being determined to end her life in virginity she wished the queen her sister should marry him for with him she might find it in her heart to declare queen mary's second person rather than any other for being matched with him it would best remove out of her mind all fear and suspicion of usurpation before her death elizabeth would not permit sir james melville to return home till he had seen dudley created earl of leicester and baron of denby this was done with great state at westminster herself says melville helping to put on his robes he sitting on his knees before her and keeping a great gravity and discreet behavior but as for the queen she could not refrain from putting her hand on his neck to tickle him smilingly the french ambassador and i standing beside her then she asked me how i liked him i said as he was a worthy subject so he was happy in a great prince who could discern and reward good service yet replied she ye like better of yon lang lad pointing towards my lord darnley who as nearest prince of the blood that day bare the sword before her my answer again was that no woman of spirit would make choice of sick a man that was liker a woman than a man for he was lusty beardless and lady-faced i had no will that she should think i liked him though i had a secret charge to deal with his mother lady lennox to purchase leave for him to pass to scotland during the nine days i remained at court pursues melville queen elizabeth saw me every day and sometimes thrice a day to wit a forenoon afternoon and after supper and she continued to treat of queen mary's marriage with leicester and meantime i was familiarly and favorably used sometimes she would say that since she could not see the good queen her sister she should open a good part of her inward mind to me that she was not offended with queen mary's angry letter in which she seemed to disdain the marriage with leicester and she should set the best lawyers in england to search out who had the best right to the crown of england which she would wish to be her dearest sister rather than any other i replied there could be no doubt on that head but lamented that even the wisest princes did not take sufficient notice of the partialities of their familiar friends and counsellors except it were sick a notable and rare prince as henry the eighth her father who of his own head was determined to declare his sister's son james v at which time elizabeth was not born but only her sister queen mary heir apparent to the crown of england failing the heirs of his own body for the earnest desire he had to unite the whole island she said she was glad he did not i said he had but then a daughter and was in doubt to have any more children and as yet had not so many suspicions in his head and added that her majesty was out of all doubt regarding her children being determined to die a virgin she said she was never minded to marry except she were compelled by the queen her sister's hard behavior to her i said madam ye need not tell me that i know your stately stomach ye think gin ye were married ye would be but queen of england and now ye are king and queen baith ye may not suffer a commander she appeared to be so affectionate to queen mary her good sister 
that she had a great desire to see her, and because that could not be, she delighted off to look on her picture. She took me to her bedchamber, and opened a little lettrone, perhaps a desk, where there were divers little pictures wrapped in paper, their names written with her own hand. Upon the first she took up was written, My Lord's picture. This was Leicester's portrait. I held the candle, and pressed to see my Lord's picture. Albeit, she was loath to let me see it, but I became importunate for it, to carry home to my queen. She refused, saying, She had but one of his. I replied, she had the original. She was then at the further end of her bedchamber, talking with Cecil. Elizabeth then took out my queen's, of Scott's, miniature, and kissed it. Melville kissed her hand in acknowledgment of the great fondness she manifested towards Mary. She showed me, he continues, a fair ruby great like a racket ball. I desire she should either send it to my queen, or the Earl of Leicester's picture. She replied, if Queen Mary would follow her counsel, she would get them both in time, and all she had, but she would send her a diamond as a token by me. Now, as it was late, after supper she appointed me to be with her the next morning, at eight, at which time was her hour for walking in the garden. She talked with me of my travels, and invited me to eat with her dame of honor, my lady Stafford, one honorable and godly lady who had been banished to Geneva in the reign of Queen Mary of England. In the course of Melville's conferences with Queen Elizabeth, the female costume of different countries was discussed, and how they became the persons of women. She told him she had the weeds, or costume, of every civilized country, and gave proof of it by appearing in a fresh one every day, and asking the Scotch ambassador which was the most becoming. I said, the Italian weed, continues Melville, which pleased her well, for she delighted to show her golden-colored hair by wearing a call and bonnet, as they do in Italy. Her hair was redder than yellow, and curled apparently by nature. Then she inquired, what colored hair was reputed best, and whether my queen's hair or hers was the best, and which of the two was the fairest? Melville's answer was perplexing in its ambiguity. He said, the fairness of both was not their worst faults. Elizabeth was not to be baffled by an oracular compliment. She came again to the question direct, and was earnest for Melville to declare which of them both he thought the fairest. Melville answered, You are the fairest queen in England, and ours the fairest queen in Scotland. Yet, he continues, was she earnest? The poor ambassador then declared, They were both the fairest ladies in their courts. That she was the whitest, but that our queen was very lovely. She inquired, which of them was the highest stature? I answered, Our queen. Then she is over high, returned Elizabeth, for I am neither too high nor too low. Then she asked how she, Queen Mary, exercised and employed her time. I answered, When I left Scotland on my embassy, our queen was newly come from the highland hunting, but that when she had leisure, she read in good books, the histories of divers countries, and would sometimes play on the lutes and virginals. Elizabeth, continues Melville, speared or asked whether Mary played well. Reasonably well for a queen, was the very discreet answer. This conversation occasioned a droll little scene of display and vanity to be got up by Elizabeth. The same day after dinner, Lord Hunston, Elizabeth's cousin, drew Melville into a retired gallery to hear some music. He whispered as a secret that it was the queen playing on the virginals. The ambassador listened a while, and then withdrew the tapestry that hung before the doorway, boldly entered the room, and stood listening in an entranced attitude near the door, and heard her play excellently well. Her back was to the listener. At length, she turned her head, affected to see him, and left off, coming forwards as if to strike him with her hand, as pretending to be ashamed, alleging, that she was not used to play before men, but when she was solitary, to eschew melancholy, and asked, how I came there? I replied, that I was walking with my Lord Hunsdon. As we passed by the chamber door, I heard sick melody, which raised and drew me into the chamber, I wist not how, excusing my fault of homeliness, as being brought up in the court of France, and that I was now willing to endure any punishment it would please her to lay on my offense. The expert flattery had its expected effect. The royal coquette sat herself down on a cushion to imbibe another dose of it, 
and the audacious flatterer placed himself on his knee beside her she gave him with her own hand a cushion to place under his knee melville protested against such an innovation on the rules of gallantry but the queen compelled him and called in my lady stafford out of the next chamber to chaperone the conference for hitherto she had been tete-a-tete -tete with the scotch ambassador this arrangement having been happily made her majesty proceeded to display the rest of her accomplishments first she demanded whether she or the queen of scots played best in that says melville i gave her the praise she said my french was good and speared whether i could speak italian which she spake reasonably well then she spake to me in dutch but it was not good she would know what kind of books i liked best whether theology history or love matters i said i liked wheel of all the sorts i was earnest to be dispatched but she said that i tired sooner of her company than she did of mine i said albeit there was no occasion to tire yet it was time to return but two days longer was i detained that i might see her dance quilk being done she inquired at me whether she or my queen danced best i said my queen danced not so high or disposedly as she did whereby it may be gathered that mary danced like an elegant woman but surely the elaborate dancing of a vain affected person could scarcely be better defined than by melville elizabeth wished that she might see the queen of scotland at some convenient place of meeting i offered pursues melville to convey her secretly to scotland by post clothed in the disguise of a page that she might see our mistress as king james v passed in disguise to france to see the duke of vendome's sister that should have been his wife melville carried on this romantic bandage by proposing that queen elizabeth should give out that she was sick and kept her chamber and none to be privy to her absence but my lady stafford and one of the grooms of her chamber she said alas she might do it and seemed to like well of that kind of language this scene took place at hampton court where melville at last received his dismissal and departed with leicester by water to london on their voyage leicester apologized for his presumptuous proposal for the hand of the queen of scots for he assured her ambassador apparently with sincerity enough was a wily move of mr secretary cecil designed to ruin him with both queens elizabeth appears to have pressed this marriage on her royal kinswoman of scotland without any real intention of resigning her favorite to that queen but rather for the purpose it has been supposed of paving the way of her own marriage with him by proving that she esteemed him worthy of being the consort of another female sovereign if mary could have been induced to signify her consent to accept leicester for her husband then probably it was intended for him to declare the impossibility of his resigning the service of his royal mistress even to become the spouse of the queen of scots and this would have afforded elizabeth a real popular opportunity of rewarding him for the sacrifice with her own hand matters never reached this point for when mary was urged to accept the newly created english earl the queen mother of france and her kinsman of the house of guise expressed the utmost contempt at the idea of so unsuitable an alliance and assured her that elizabeth intended to marry him herself this opinion must have had some weight when united with melville's report of the indecorous manner in which the english queen had committed herself in toying with leicester during the ceremonial of his investiture unrestrained even by the presence of the foreign ambassadors meantime peace having been established with france a regal suitor was offered to elizabeth's acceptance in the person of charles the ninth the youthful monarch of that realm who had been recently declared by the states of france to have attained his majority although his mother catherine de medicis continued to govern in his name he was at this time about sixteen and elizabeth with great propriety replied to michel castelnau the ambassador by whom the proposal was submitted to her that she was greatly obliged for the signal honor that was done her by so mighty and powerful a king to whom as well as to the queen his mother she professed herself infinitely beholden but that she felt this difficulty that the most christian king her good brother was too great and too small 
too great as a monarch of such a realm to be able to quit his own dominions to cross the sea and remain in england where the people always expected their kings and queens to live too small she explained by saying that his majesty was young and she was already thirty which she called old castelno not being accustomed to elizabeth's coquettish manners far from suspecting that this depreciatory remark on her own age was a trap for a complimentary rejoinder on his part gave her credit for meaning what she said and adds with great simplicity she has said the same thing ever since her accession to the throne although there is not a lady in her court who surpasses her in her endowments of mind and body the english nobles suggested to castelnau that the young duke of anjou charles the ninth's brother would be in point of situation a more suitable consort for the queen than charles as neither france nor england could permit the absence of their respective sovereigns the french they said would not like their king to reside in england nor would the english permit their queen to live in france elizabeth gave no encouragement at that time to overtures for her union with either of the royal brothers of valois and castelnau proceeded to scotland to offer the younger prince to the other island queen mary stuart of whom he speaks in his dispatches to his own court in the most lively terms of admiration and respect a matrimonial union between the crowns of england and france was too brilliant a chimera to be hastily or lightly abandoned by that restless intrigant and shallow politician catherine de medicis and she subsequently empowered the resident french ambassador de foix to renew the proposal of a marriage between her eldest son the youthful sovereign of france and the maiden monarch of england to this second overture elizabeth replied i find myself on the one hand much honoured by the proposal of the french king on the other i am older than he and would rather die than see myself despised and neglected my subjects i am assured would oppose no obstacle if it were my wish for they have more than once prayed me to marry after my own inclination it is true they have said that it would pleasure them if my choice should fall on an englishman in england however there is no one disposable in marriage but the earl of arundel and he is further removed from the match than the east from the west and as to the earl of leicester i have always loved his virtues the ambassador was too finished a courtier it seems to interrupt her majesty by asking her to point these out a question which certainly would embarrass the most partial apologist of the crimes of this bold but not brave bad man but pursues elizabeth the aspirations towards honour and greatness which are in me cannot suffer him as a companion and a husband after this confidential explanation of her feelings towards the two rival earls her subjects her majesty in allusion to the extreme youthfulness of her regal wooer added laughing my neighbour mary stuart is younger than i am she will perhaps better please the king this has never been spoken of replied de foix she having been the wife of his brother several persons rejoined elizabeth and among others lethington have tried to persuade me that such a plan was in agitation but i did not believe it a few days after elizabeth sent for de foix again and repeated her objections to the marriage with his boy king de foix endeavoured to convince her they were of no weight but after a little courtly flattery had been expended the negotiation was broken off this summer elizabeth honoured leicester with her first visit to his new manor of kenilworth in the course of her progress through the midland counties when she entered the city of coventry the mayor and corporation who had met and welcomed her presented her with a purse supposed to be worth twenty marks containing a hundred pounds in gold angels the queen on receiving it said to her lords it is a good gift i have but few such for it is a hundred pounds in gold the mayor boldly rejoined if it like your grace it is a great deal more what is that asked the queen the mayor answered it is the faithful hearts of all your true loving subjects we thank you mr mayor said the queen that it is a great deal more indeed she invited the mayor and corporation to visit her at kenilworth on the following tuesday which they did and were admitted to kiss her hand she gave them thirty bucks and knighted the recorder 
if elizabeth at this period were not in love with leicester the proverb which affirms that of the fullness of the heart the mouth speaketh must go for naught for she was always talking of him and not only to those sympathizing listeners her ladies of the bedchamber but to such unsuitable confidants as the ambassadors ergo accredited spies of foreign potentates well might the wily son of burleigh observe of this queen that if to-day she were more than man to-morrow she would be less than woman de flaw's reports appear to have convinced his own court that it was elizabeth's positive intention to give her hand to leicester for catherine de medicis enjoined him to cultivate the good will of this favoured peer and entitle the royal family of france to his gratitude by advocating the match with the queen of england i told queen elizabeth writes de foix in reply to the queen mother that she could do nothing better for the welfare repose and content of her kingdom than to espouse one of the great peers of england and that she would put an affront upon the king and your majesty if she were to wed any other foreign prince after having finally grounded her rejection of the king on the plea that a stranger would be unwelcome to the english elizabeth replied that she was not yet decided whom to marry observing that even if she espoused a person without extensive possessions his marriage with her would give him the means of engaging in pernicious schemes and intrigues for this reason continued she i will never concede to a husband any share in my power and added that but for the sake of posterity and the good of her realm she would not marry at all if she did however she did not mean to follow his advice by wedding a subject she had it in her power to wed a king if she pleased or a powerful prince so as to overawe france this was in allusion to the archduke charles who having been decisively rejected by mary of scotland was renewing his suit to her while she complained that charles the ninth took part with the queen of scots while darnley was writing her submissive letters and seeking her protection this reproachful observation proves that elizabeth and darnley were already secretly reconciled she had vehemently opposed his marriage with mary stuart and yet had permitted him to visit the court of that queen the hitherto impregnable heart of the beautiful widow had surrendered itself at first sight of the beardless lady-faced boy and darnley paid no heed to the peremptory mandates of his sometime english sovereign to return at peril of outlawry and forfeiture of his english inheritance he kept the field of his new fortunes and was a thriving wooer de foix as soon as he heard the queen of scots had resolved on the marriage with her cousin darnley went to elizabeth with the intention of defending mary he found the queen at chess and said profiting by the opportunity of introducing the subject this game is an image of the words and deeds of men if for example we lose a pawn it seems but a small matter nevertheless the loss often draws after it that of the whole game the queen replied i understand you darnley is but a pawn but may well checkmate me if he is promoted after these words she left off playing complained much of the disloyalty of darnley and his father and made evident her intentions of dealing if it were possible hostily by them the only means she had however of testifying her anger effectively was by sending margaret countess of lennox to her old quarters in the tower two out of the four royal ladies who stood in immediate proximity to the throne were now incarcerated on frivolous charges and on the twenty first of august a third of this luckless quartet lady mary gray was added to the list of fair state prisoners for no greater crime than stealing a love match like her sister lady catherine cecil in a letter to sir thomas smith relates the circumstance in the following words here is an unhappy chance and monstrous the sergeant porter being the biggest gentleman in his court hath married secretly the lady mary gray the least of all the court they are committed to several prisons the offence is very great both the meek inoffensive sisters of lady jane gray were thus torn from their husbands and doomed to lifelong imprisonment by the inexorable queen their piteous appeals to her compassion may be seen in ellis's royal letters can any one suppose that she would have scrupled to shed the blood of either or both of these broken-hearted victims if their names had been used to excite an insurrection in her metropolis in a foregoing passage of the letter 
wherein cecil relates the disgrace of lady mary gray he favors his absent colleague with the following important piece of secret information which is partly written in cipher you may perchance by some private letter hereafter hear of a strange accident here and therefore i will in a few words give you some light the queen's majesty is fallen into some misliking with my lord of leicester and he therewith much dismayed you know how busy men in court will be to descant hereupon the queen's majesty letteth appear in many overt speeches that she is sorry for her loss of time and so is every good subject in what other way can this sentence be explained than that elizabeth having quarrelled with her presumptuous favourite repented of the impediment which her flirtations with him had opposed in her matrimonial treaties with foreign princes what shall follow of this pursues her anxious premier god knoweth for my part i will do that becometh an honest man not to procure harm to him though i know he hath not lacked procurers for my harm but god forgive them for i fear none of them having so good a conscience of my well-meaning both to her majesty and her realm if i were as evil disposed as others i could make a flame of this sparkle but fiat voluntas dei the queen's majesty thanked be god is well disposed towards marriage the emperor's ambassador is departed with an honourable answer and himself well satisfied and common opinion is that the archduke charles will come which if he do and will accord with us in religion and shall be allowable for his person to see her majesty then except god shall continue his displeasure against us we shall see some success in another letter to smith cecil declares that the queen's majesty will marry with none without sight of his person nor with any that shall dissent in religion that the articles of marriage are to be much the same as in the treaty between philip and mary and expresses his opinion that the archduke will come he considers that the nobility approve of the match and notices that my lord of leicester hath behaved himself very wisely to allow of it the very day on which this letter is dated august thirtieth the premier inscribed the following sentence in his private diary the queen seemed to be very much offended with the earl of leicester and so she wrote an obscure sentence in a book at windsor this oracular sentence was probably her latin epigram on the presumption of a bear presuming to cherish hopes of mating with the lion. End of section 16